Prologue of Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces by Thomas W. Hanshu. Prologue. THE AFFAIR OF THE MAN WHO CALLED HIMSELF HAMILTON CLEEK The thing wouldn't have happened if any other constable than Collins had been on point duty at Blackfriars Bridge that morning, for Collins was young, good-looking, and knew it. Nature had gifted him with a susceptible heart and a fond eye for the beauties of femininity. So when he looked round and saw the woman threading her way through the maze of vehicles at Dead Man's Corner, with her skirt held up just enough to show two twinkling little feet in French shoes, and over them a graceful, willowy figure, and over that an enchanting, if rather too highly tinted, face, with almond eyes and a fluff of shining hair under the screen of a big Parisian hat, that did for him on the spot. He saw at a glance that she was French, exceedingly French. And he preferred English beauty as a rule. But French or English, beauty is beauty. And here, undeniably, was a perfect type. So he unhesitatingly sprang to her assistance, and piloted her safely to the curb, revelling in her voluble thanks, and tingling as she clung timidly, but rather firmly, to him. "'Sir, I have to give you much gratitude,' she said, in a pretty, wistful sort of way, as they stepped onto the pavement. Then she dropped her hand from his sleeve, looked up at him, and shyly drooped her head, as if overcome with confusion and surprise at the youth and good looks of him. It is nowhere in the world but Londres one finds this delicate attention, this splendid sergent de ville, she added with a sort of sigh. You are wonderful, you are most wonderful, you anglais police. Sir, I am a stranger, I know not the ways of this city of amazement. And if monsieur would so kindly direct me where to find the abbey of the Westminster. Before P. C. Collins could tell her that, if that were her destination, she was a good deal out of her latitude, indeed, even before she concluded what she was saying, over the rumble of the traffic there rose a thin, shrill piping sound, which to ears trained to the call of it possessed a startling significance. It was the shrilling of a police whistle, far off down the embankment. "'Hello! That's a call to the man on point!' exclaimed Collins, all alert at once. "'Excuse me, Mum. See you presently. Something's up. One of my mates is a-signalling me.' "'Mates, Monsieur? Mates? Signalling? I shall not understand the words.' "'But, yes, what shall that mean, eh?' "'Good Lord, don't bother me now. I, I mean, wait a bit. That's the call to head off someone, and, by George, there he is now, coming head on, the hound, and running like the wind.' For, of a sudden, through a break in the traffic, a scudding figure had sprung into sight. The figure of a man in a grey frock-coat and a shining topper. A well-groomed, well-set-up man, with a small turned-up moustache, and hair of that peculiar purplish-red one sees only on the shell of a roasted chestnut. As he swung into sight, the distant whistle shrilled again. <whistles> Far off in the distance, voices sent up cries of, "'Head him off! Stop that man!' etc. Then those on the pavement near to the fugitive took up the cry, joined in pursuit, and in a twinkling, what with cabmen, trammen, draymen, and pedestrians shouting, there was hubbub enough for Hades. "'A swell pickpocket I'll lay my life,' commented Collins, as he squared himself for an encounter, and made ready to leap on the man when he came within gripping distance. "'Here, get out of the way, mademoiselle,' 
business before pleasure, and besides you'll like to get bowled over in the rush. Here, chauffeur! This to the driver of a big black motor-car, which swept round the angle of the bridge at that moment, and made as though to scud down the embankment into the thick of the chase. Pull that thing up sharp! Stop where you are, dead still! At once, at once, do you hear? We don't want you getting in the way. Now then, nodding his head in the direction of the running man. Come on, you bounder, I'm ready for you. And, as if he really heard that invitation, and really was eager to accept it, the red-headed man did come on with a vengeance. And all the time, Mademoiselle, unheeding Colin's advice, stood calmly and silently waiting. Onward came the runner, with the whole roaring pack in his wake, dodging in and out among the vehicles, flooring people who got in his way, scudding, dodging, leaping, like a fox hard-pressed by the hounds, until, all of a moment, he spied a break in the traffic, leapt through it, and then there was mischief, for Colin sprang at him like a cat, gripped two big, strong-as-iron hands on his shoulders, and had him tight and fast. "'Got you, you ass!' snapped he, with a short, crisp, self-satisfied laugh. "'None of your blessed squirming now. Keep still. You'll get out of your coffin, you bounder, as soon as out of my grip. Got you! Got you! Do you understand?' The response to this fairly took the wind out of him. "'Of course I do,' said the captive gaily. "'It's part of the programme that you should get me. Only, for heaven's sake, don't spoil the film by remaining inactive, you goat. Struggle with me. Handle me roughly. Throw me about. Make it look real. Make it look as though I actually did get away from you, not as though you let me. You chaps behind there don't get in the way of the camera. It's in one of those cabs.' "'Now then, Bobby, don't be wooden. Struggle, struggle, you goat, and save the film!' "'Save the what?' gasped Collins. "'Here, good Lord, do you mean to say—' "'Struggle, struggle, struggle!' cut in the man impatiently. "'Can't you grasp the situation? It's a put-up thing. The taking of a kinematograph film, a living picture, for the Alhambra tonight. Heavens above, Marguerite, didn't you tell him?' "'No, no, there was not the time. You come so quick. I could not. And they, ah, le bon Dieu, he gave me no chance. Officer, I beg, I entreat of you, make it real, struggle, fight, keep on the constant move. There!' Something tinkled on the pavement with the unmistakable sound of gold. "'There, monsieur, there is the half-sovereign to pay you for the trouble.' Only, for the love of goodness, do not pick it up while the instrument, the camera, he is going. It is the kinematograph, and you would spoil everything. The chop-fallen cry that Collins gave was lost in a roar of laughter from the pursuing crowd. Struggle! Struggle! Don't you hear, you idiot? broke in the red-headed man irritably. You are being devilishly well paid for it, so for goodness sake make it look real. "'That's it. Bully boy. Now, once more to the right, then loosen your grip so that I can push you away and make a feint of punching you off. All ready there, Marguerite? Keep a clear space about her, gentlemen. Ready with the motor, chauffeur? All right. Now then, Bobby, fall back and mind your eye when I hit out, old chap. One, two, three, here goes!' With that, he pushed the chop-fallen Collins from him made a feint of punching his head as he reeled back, then sprang toward the spot where the Frenchwoman stood, and gave a finish to the adventure that was highly dramatic and decidedly theatrical. For Mademoiselle, seeing him approach her, struck a pose, threw out her arms, gathered him into them, to the exceeding enjoyment of the laughing throng, then both looked back, and behaved as people do on the stage when pursued gesticulated extravagantly, and, rushing to the waiting motor, jumped into it. "'Many thanks, Bobby, many thanks, everybody,' sang out the red-headed man. "'Let her go, chauffeur. The cameramen will pick us up again at Whitehall in a few minutes' time.' "'Right you are, sir,' responded the chauffeur gaily. Then toot-toot went the motor-horn, as the gentleman in grey closed the door upon himself and his companion, and the vehicle, darting forward, 
sped down the embankment in the exact direction whence the man himself had originally come, and, passing directly through that belated portion of the hurrying crowd to whom the end of the adventure was not yet known, flew on and vanished. And Collins, stooping to pick up the half-sovereign that had been thrown him, felt that after all it was a poor price to receive for all the jeers and jibes of the assembled onlookers. "'Smart capture, Bobby, wasn't it?' sang out a deriding voice that set the crowd jeering anew. "'You'll get promoted, you will. See it in all the evening papers. Oh, yes. Horrible hand-to-hand -hand struggle with a desperado. Brave constable has half a quid's worth out of an infuriated ruffin. My hat! Won't your missus be proud when you take her to see that blooming film? Move on now, move on, said Collins, recovering his dignity and asserting it with a vim. Look here, cabby, I don't take it kind of you to laugh like that. They had you just as bad as they had me. Blow that Frenchie! She might have ticked me off before I made such an ass of myself. I don't say that I'd have done it so natural if I'd known, but— Hello! What's that? Blowed if it ain't that blessed whistle again, and another crowd are pelting this way. And no! Yes, by Jupiter! A couple of Scotland Yard chaps with them. My hat! What do you suppose that means? He knew in the next moment, panting and puffing, a crowd at their heels, and people from all sides stringing out from the pavement and trooping after them, the two plain-clothes men came racing through the grinning gathering and bore down on P.C. Collins. "'Hello, Smathers. You in this, too?' began he, his feelings softened by the knowledge that other arms of the law would figure on that film with him at the Alhambra tonight. "'Now, what are you after, you goat? That French lady or the red-headed party in the grey suit?' "'Yes, yes, of course I am.' "'You heard me signal you to head him off, didn't you?' replied Smathers, looking round and growing suddenly excited when he realised that Collins was empty-handed and that the red-headed man was not there. "'Heavens! You never let him get away, did you? You grabbed him, didn't you, Hey? "'Of course I grabbed him. Come out of it. What are you giving me, you josser?' said Collins with a wink and a grin. "'Ain't you found out even yet, you silly? "'Why, it was only a faked-up thing, "'the taking of a kinematograph picture for the Alhambra. "'You and Petrie ought to have been here sooner "'and got your wages, you goats. "'I got half a quid for my share when I let him go.' "'Smathers and Petrie lifted up their voices "'in one despairing howl. "'When you what?' fairly yelled Smathers. "'You fool!' "'You don't mean to tell me that you let them take you in like that, those two? "'You don't mean to tell me that you had him, had him in your hands, and then let him go? "'You did? "'Oh, you seventy-seven kinds of double-barrelled ass! "'Had him, think of it, had him, and let him go! "'Did yourself out of a share and a reward of two hundred quid!' "'when you'd only to shut your hands and hold on to it. Two hundred quid? Two hu— What—what—what what, what are you talking about? "'Wasn't it true? Wasn't it a kinematograph picture, after all?' "'No, you fool, no!' howled Smathers, fairly dancing with despair. "'Oh, you blithering idiot!' "'You ninety-seven varieties of a fool! "'Do you know who you had in your hands? "'Do you know who you let go? "'It was that devil forty faces, "'the vanishing cracksman, "'the man who calls himself Hamilton Cleek. "'And the woman was his pal, his confederate, "'his blessed stool-pigeon, "'Margot, the queen of the Apache. "'and she came over from Paris to help him in that clean scoop of Lady Dresma's jewels last week. "'Heavens!' gulped Collins, too far gone to say anything else. 
too deeply dejected to think of anything but that he had had the man for whom Scotland Yard had been groping for a year, the man over whom all England, all France, all Germany wondered, close shut in the grip of his hands, and then had let him go. The biggest and boldest criminal the police had ever had to cope with, the almost supernatural genius of crime, who defied all systems, laughed at all laws, mocked at all the Vidocs and Dupins and Sherlock Holmeses, whether amateur or professional, French or English, German or American, that ever had been or ever could be pitted against him, and who, for sheer devilry, for diabolical ingenuity and for colossal impudence, as well as for a nature-bestowed power that was simply amazing, had not his match in all the universe. Who or what he really was, whence he came, whether he was English, Irish, French, German, Yankee, Canadian, Italian or Dutchman, no man knew, and no man might ever hope to know unless he himself chose to reveal it. In his many encounters with the police, he had assumed the speech, the characteristics, and indeed the facial attributes of each in turn, and assumed them with an ease and a perfection that were simply marvellous, and had gained for him the sobriquet of forty faces among the police, and of the vanishing cracksman among the scribes and reporters of newspaperdom. That he came in time to possess another name than these was due to his own whim and caprice, his own bald, unblushing impudence. For, of a sudden, whilst London was in a fever of excitement and all the newspapers up in arms over one of the most daring and successful coup, he chose to write boldly to both editors and police, complaining that the title given him by each was both vulgar and cheap. "'You would not think of calling Paganini a fiddler,' he wrote. "'Why, then, should you degrade me with the coarse term of cracksman? "'I claim to be as much an artist in my profession as Paganini was in his, "'and I claim also a like courtesy from you. "'So, then, if in the future it becomes necessary to allude to me, "'and I fear it often will,' I shall be obliged if you do so as the man who calls himself Hamilton Cleek. In return for that courtesy, gentlemen, I promise to alter my mode of procedure, to turn over a new leaf, as it were, to give you at all times hereafter distinct information in advance of such places as I elect for the field of my operations and of the time when I shall pay my respects to them, and on the morning after each such visit to bestow some small portion of the loot upon Scotland Yard as a souvenir of the event. And to that remarkable programme he rigidly adhered from that time forth, always giving the police twelve hours' notice, always evading their traps and snares always carrying out his plans in spite of them, and always, on the morning after, sending some trinket or trifle to Superintendent Narkom of Scotland Yard, in a little pink cardboard box tied up with rose-coloured ribbon, and marked with the compliments of the man who calls himself Hamilton Cleek. The detectives of the United Kingdom, the detectives of the continent, the detectives of America, each and all had measured swords with him, tried wits with him, spread snares and laid traps for him, and each and all had retired from the field vanquished. And this was the man that he, Police Constable Samuel James Collins, had actually had in his hands nay, in his very arms, and then had given up for half a sovereign, and let go. Oh, so help me! You make my head swim, Smathers, that you do, 
he managed to say at last. "'I had him. I had the vanishing cracksman in my blessed paws, and then went and let that French hussy. "'But look here, I say, how do you know it was him? Nobody can go by his look, so how do you know?' "'No, you footler,' growled Smathers disgustedly. "'Why shouldn't I know when I've been after him ever since he left Scotland Yard half an hour ago?' "'Left what? My hat! You ain't a-going to tell me that he's been there. When? Why? What for?' "'To leave one of his blessed notices, the daredevil. What a detective he'd a made, wouldn't he, if he'd only a-turned his attention that way, and been on the side of the law instead of against it. He walked in bold as brass, sat down, and talked with the superintendent over some cock-and-bull yarn about a black hand letter that he said had been sent to him, and asked if he couldn't have police protection whilst he was in town. It wasn't until after he left that the super he sees a note on the chair where the blighter had been sitting, and when he opened it, there it was in black and white, something like this. The list of presents that have been sent for the wedding to-morrow of Sir Horace Wyvern's eldest daughter make interesting reading, particularly that part which describes the jewels sent, no doubt as a tribute to her father's position as the greatest brain specialist in the world, from the Austrian court and the continental principalities. The care of such gems is too great a responsibility for the bride. I propose, therefore, to relieve her of it to-night, and to send you the customary souvenir of the event to-morrow morning. Yours faithfully, the man who calls himself Hamilton Cleek. That's how I know, dash you. Superintendent sent me out after him, hot foot, and after a bit I picked him up in the strand, toddling along with that French hussy as cool as you please. But blow him! He must have eyes all round his head, for he saw me just as soon as I saw him, and he and Frenchy separated like a shot. She hopped into a taxi and flew off in one direction. He dived into a crowd and bolted in another, and before you could say Jack Robinson, he was doubling and twisting, jumping into cabs and jumping out again, all to gain time, of course, for the woman to do what he'd put her up to doing and leading me the devil's own chase through the devil's own tangle till he was ready to bunk for the embankment. And you let him go, you blooming footler! Had him and let him go! And chucked away a third of two hundred pounds for the price of half a quid! And long after Smathers and Petrie had left him, and the wandering crowd had dispersed, and point duty at Dead Man's Corner was just point duty again, and nothing more, P.C. Collins stood there, chewing the cud of bitter reflection over those words, and trying to reckon up just how many pounds and how much glory had been lost to him. End of the first part of the prologue The second part of the prologue of Cleek the Man of the Forty Faces. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces by Thomas W. Hanshu. Prologue, Part Two. But damn me, sir, the thing's an outrage. I don't mince my words, Mr. Narkom. I say plump and plain the thing's an outrage. A disgrace to the police an indignity upon the community at large, and for Scotland Yard to permit itself to be defied, bamboozled, mocked at in this appalling fashion by a paltry burglar. Uncle dear, pray don't excite yourself in this manner. I'm quite sure that if Mr. Narkom could prevent the things— Hold your tongue, Ailsa. I will not be interfered with. It's time that somebody spoke out plainly, and let this establishment know what the public has a right to expect of it. What do I pay my rates and taxes for, and devilish high ones they are, too, begad, 
if it's not to maintain law and order and the proper protection of property and to have the whole blessed country terrorised the police defied and people's houses invaded with impunity by a gutter-bred brute of a cracksman is nothing short of a scandal and a shame call this sort of tomfoolery being protected by the police god bless my soul one might as well be in charge of a parcel of doddering old women and be done with it it was an hour and a half after that exciting affair at dead man's corner the scene was superintendent narkom's private room at headquarters the dramatist personae mr maverick narkom himself sir horace wyvern and miss ailsa lorne his niece a slight fair-haired extremely attractive girl of twenty the only and orphaned daughter of a much-loved sister who up till a year ago had known nothing more exciting in the way of life than that which is to be found in a small village in suffolk and falls to the lot of an underpaid vicar's only child a railway accident had suddenly deprived her of both parents throwing her wholly upon her own resources without a penny in the world sir horace had gracefully come to the rescue and given her a home and a refuge being doubly repaid for it by the affection and care she gave him and the manner in which she assumed control of a household which hitherto had been left wholly to the attention of servants lady wyvern having long been dead and her two daughters of that type which devotes itself entirely to the pleasures of society and the demands of the world a regular pepper-box of a man testy short-tempered exacting sir horace had flown headlong to superintendent narkom's office as soon as that gentleman's note telling him of the vanishing cracksman's latest threat had been delivered and on miss lorne's advice had withheld all news of it from the members of his household and brought her with him i tell you that scotland yard must do something must 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 stormed he as narkom resenting that stigma upon the institution puckered up his lips and looked savage that fellow has always kept his word always in spite of your precious band of muffs and if you let him keep it this time when there's upwards of forty thousand pounds worth of jewels in the house it will be nothing less than a national disgrace and you and your wretched collection of bunglers will be covered with deserved ridicule narkom swung round smarting under these continued taunts these flings at the efficiency of his prided department his nostrils dilated his temper strained to the breaking point well he won't keep it this time i promise you that he rapped out sharply sooner or later every criminal no matter how clever meets his waterloo and this shall be his i'll take this affair in hand myself sir horace i'll not only send the pick of my men to guard the jewels but i'll go with them and if that fellow crosses the threshold of wyvern house to-night by the lord i'll have him he will have to be the devil himself to get away from me miss lorne recollecting himself and bowing apologetically i ask your pardon for this strong language my temper got the better of my manners it does not matter mr narkom so that you preserve my cousin's wedding gifts from that appalling man she answered with a gentle inclination of the head and with a smile that made the superintendent think she must certainly be the most beautiful creature in all the world it so irradiated her face and added to the magic of her glorious eyes it does not matter what you say what you do so long as you accomplish that and i will accomplish it as i'm a living man i will you may go home feeling assured of that look for my men some time before dusk sir horace i will arrive later they will come in one at a time see that they are admitted by the area door and that once in not one of them leaves the house again before i put in an appearance i'll look them over when i arrive to be sure that there's no wolf in sheep's clothing amongst them 
with a fellow like that, a diabolical rascal with a diabolical gift for impersonation, one can't be too careful. Meantime, it is just as well not to have confided this news to your daughters, who naturally would be nervous and upset. But I assume that you have taken some one of the servants into your confidence, in order that nobody may pass them and enter the house under any pretext whatsoever. No, I have not. Miss Lorne advised against it, and as I am always guided by her, I said nothing of the matter to anybody. Was that wrong, do you think, Mr. Narkom? queried Elsa anxiously. I feared that if they knew they might lose their heads, and that my cousins, who are intensely nervous and highly emotional, might hear of it and add to our difficulties by becoming hysterical and demanding our attention at a time when we ought to be giving every moment to watching for the possible arrival of that man. And as he has always lived up to the strict letter of his dreadful promises heretofore, I knew that he was not to be expected before nightfall. Besides, the jewels are locked up in the safe in Sir Horace's consulting room, and his assistant, Mr. Murfroy, has promised not to leave it for one instant before we return. Oh, uh, well, that's all right, then. I dare say there is very little likelihood of our man getting in whilst you and Sir Horace are here and taking such a risk as stopping in the house until nightfall to begin his operations. Still, it was hardly wise, and I should advise hurrying back as fast as possible and taking at least one servant, the one you feel least likely to lose his head, into your confidence, Sir Horace, and putting him on the watch for my men. Otherwise, keep the matter as quiet as you have done, and look for me about nine o'clock and rely upon this as a certainty. The vanishing cracksman will never get away with even one of those jewels if he enters that house to-night, and never get out of it unshackled. With that, he suavely bowed his visitors out, and rang up the pick of his men without an instant's delay. Promptly at nine o'clock he arrived, as he had promised, at Wyvern House, and was shown into Sir Horace's consulting-room, where Sir Horace himself and Miss Lorne were awaiting him, and keeping close watch before the locked door of a communicating apartment, in which sat the six men who had preceded him. He went in, and put them all and severally through a rigid examination, pulling their hair and beards, rubbing their faces with a clean handkerchief in quest of any trace of make-up or disguise of any sort, examining their badges and the marks on the handcuffs they carried with them to make sure that they bore the sign which he himself had scratched upon them in the privacy of his own room a couple of hours ago. "'No mistake about this lot,' he announced with a smile. "'Has anybody else entered or attempted to enter the house?' "'Not a soul,' replied Miss Lorne. "'I didn't trust anybody to do the watching, Mr. Narkom. I watched myself.' "'Good. Where are the jewels? In that safe?' "'No,' replied Sir Horace. "'They are to be exhibited in the picture-gallery for the benefit of the guests at the wedding-breakfast to-morrow, and as Miss Wyvern wished to superintend the arrangement of them herself, and there would be no time for that in the morning, she and her sister are in there laying them out at this moment. "'As I could not prevent that without telling them what we have to dread,' I did not protest against it, but if you think it will be safer to return them to the safe after my daughters have gone to bed, Mr. Narkom? Not at all necessary. If our man gets in, their lying there in full view like that will prove a tempting bait, and, well, he'll find there's a hook behind it. I shall be there waiting for him. Now go and join the ladies, you and Miss Lorne, and act as though nothing out of the common was in the wind. "'My men and I will stop here, and you had better put out the light and lock us in, "'so that there may be no danger of anybody finding out that we are here. "'No doubt Miss Wyvern and her sister will go to bed earlier than usual on this particular occasion. "'Let them do so. Send the servants to bed, too. "'You and Miss Lorne go to your beds at the same time as the others, "'or at least let them think that you have done so. "'Then come down and let us out.' 
To this Sir Horace assented, and, taking Miss Lorne with him, went at once to the picture-gallery and joined his daughters, with whom they remained until eleven o'clock. Promptly at that hour, however, the house was locked up, the bride-elect and her sister went to bed, the servants having already gone to theirs, and stillness settled down over the darkened house. At the end of a dozen minutes, however, it was faintly disturbed by the sound of slippered feet coming along the passage outside the consulting-room, then a key slipped into the lock, the door was opened, the light switched on, and Sir Horace and Miss Lorne appeared before the eager watchers. "'Now then, lively, my men, look sharp,' whispered Narkom. "'A man to each window and each staircase, so that nobody may go up or down or in or out without dropping into the arms of one of you. Confine your attention to this particular floor, and if you hear anybody coming, lay low until he's within reach, and you can drop on him before he bolts. Is this the door of the picture-gallery, Sir Horace?' "'Yes.' "'answered Sir Horace, as he fitted a key to the lock. "'But surely you'll need more men than you have brought, Mr. Narkom, "'if it is your intention to guard every window individually, "'for there are four to this room, see?' "'With that he swung open the door, switched on the electric light, "'and Narkom fairly blinked at the dazzling sight that confronted him. Three long tables, laden with crystal and silver, "'cut glass and jewels, and running the full length of the room, flashed and scintillated under the glare of the electric bulbs which encircled the cornice of the gallery, and clustered in luminous splendour in the crystal and frosted silver of a huge central chandelier, and spread out on the middle one of these, a dazzle of splintered rainbows, a very plain of living light, lay caskets and cases, boxes and trays, containing those royal gifts, of which the newspapers had made so much, and the vanishing cracksmen had sworn to make so few. Mr. Narkom went over and stood beside the glittering mass, resting his hand against the table, and feasting his eyes upon all that opulent splendour. "'God bless my soul! It's superb! It's amazing!' he commented. "'No wonder the fellow is willing to take risks for a prize like this. "'You are a splendid temptation, a gorgeous bait, you beauties. "'But the fish that snaps at you will find that there's a nasty hook underneath "'in the shape of Maverick Narkom. "'Never mind the many windows, Sir Horace. "'Let him come in by them, if that's his plan. "'I'll never leave these things for one instant between now and the morning.' "'Good night, Miss Lorne. Go to bed and to sleep. You do the same, Sir Horace. My lay is here.' With that he stooped, and, lifting the long drapery which covered the table and swept down in heavy folds to the floor, crept out of sight under it, and let it drop back into place again. "'Switch off the light and go,' he called to them in a low-sunk voice. "'Don't worry yourselves, either of you.' "'Go to bed and to sleep if you can.' "'As if we could,' answered Miss Lorne agitatedly. "'I shan't be able to close an eyelid. "'I'll try, of course, but I know I shall not succeed. "'Come, Uncle, come. "'Oh, do be careful, Mr. Narkom. "'And if that horrible man does come—' "'I'll have him. "'So help me God,' he vowed. "'Switch off the light and shut the door as you go out.' "'This is Forty Faces, Waterloo, at last.' And in another moment the light snicked out, the door closed, and he was alone in the silent room. For ten or a dozen minutes not even the bare suggestion of a noise disturbed the absolute stillness. Then, of a sudden, his trained ear caught a faint sound that made him suck in his breath and rise on his elbow the better to listen a sound which came not without the house but from within, from the dark hall where he had stationed his men, to be exact. As he listened, he was conscious that some living creature had approached the door, touched the handle, and by the swift, low rustle and the sound of hard breathing, 
that it had been pounced upon and seized. He scrambled out from beneath the table, snipped on the light, whirled open the door, and was in time to hear the irritable voice of Sir Horace say testily, "'Don't make an ass of yourself by your overzealousness. I've only come down to have a word with Mr. Narkom.' And to see him standing on the threshold, grotesque in a baggy suit of striped pyjamas, with one wrist enclosed as in a steel band by the gripped fingers of Petrick. "'Why didn't you say it was you, sir?' exclaimed that crestfallen individual, as the flashing light made manifest his mistake. "'When I heard you first and see you come up out of that back passage, I made sure it was him. And if you'd a struggled, I'd have bashed your head as sure as eggs.' "'Thank you for nothing,' he responded testily. "'You might have remembered, however, that the man's first got to get into the place before he can come downstairs. Mr. Narkom,' turning to the superintendent, "'I was just getting into bed when I thought of something I'd neglected to tell you, and as my niece is sitting in her room with the door open, and I wasn't anxious to parade myself before her in my night-clothes, I came down by the back staircase. I don't know how in the world I came to overlook it, but I think you ought to know that there's a way of getting into the picture gallery without using either the windows or the stairs, and that way ought to be both searched and guarded. Where is it? What is it? Why in the world didn't you tell me in the first place? exclaimed Narkom irritably as he glanced round the place searchingly. Is it a panel, a secret door, or what? This is an old house, and old houses are sometimes a very nest of such things. Happily, this one isn't. It's a modern innovation, not an ancient relic that offers the means of entrance in this case. A Yankee occupied this house before I bought it from him. One of those blessed shivery individuals his country breeds, who can't stand a breath of cold air indoors after the passing of the autumn. The wretched man put one of those wretched American inflictions, a hot-air furnace, in the cellar, with huge pipes running to every room in the house, great tin monstrosities bigger round than a man's body, ending in openings in the wall with what they call registers to let the heat in, or shut it out as they please. I didn't have the wretched contrivance removed, or those blessed registers plastered up. I simply had them papered over when the rooms were done up. There's one over there near that settee. And if a man got into this house, he could get into that furnace thing and hide in one of those flues until he got ready to crawl up it as easily as not. It struck me that perhaps it would be as well for you to examine that furnace and those flues before matters go any further. Of course it would. Great Scott! "'Sir Horace, why didn't you think to tell me of this thing before?' said Narkom excitedly. "'The fellow may be in it at this minute. Come, show me the wretched thing.' "'It's below, in the cellar. We shall have to go down the kitchen stairs, and I haven't a light.' "'Here's one,' said Petrie, unhitching a bull's-eye from his belt, and putting it into Narkom's hand. "'Better go with Sir Horace at once, sir. Leave the door of the gallery open and the light on.' Fish and me will stand guard over the stuff till you come back, so in case the man is in one of them flues and tries to bolt out at this end, we can nab him before he can get to the windows. A good idea, commented Narkom. Come on, Sir Horace, is this the way? Yes, but you'll have to tread carefully and mind you don't fall over anything. A good deal of my paraphernalia, bottles, retorts and the like, is stored in the little recess at the foot of the staircase, and my assistant is careless and leaves things lying about. Evidently the caution was necessary, for a minute or so after they had passed on and disappeared behind the door leading to the kitchen stairway, Petrie and his colleagues heard a sound as of something being overturned and smashed, and laughed softly to themselves. Evidently, too, the danger of the furnace had been grossly exaggerated by Sir Horace, for when, a few minutes later, the door opened and closed, and Narkom's men, glancing toward it, saw the figure of their chief reappear, it was plain that he was in no good temper, since his features were knotted up into a scowl, and he swore audibly as he snapped the shutter over the bull's-eye and handed it back to Petrie. "'Nothing worth looking into, Superintendent?' 
"'No, not a thing,' he replied. "'The silly old josser! "'Pulling me down there amongst the coals and rubbish "'for an insane idea like that! "'Why, the flues wouldn't admit the passage of a child! "'And even then there's a bend, an abrupt elbow "'that nothing but a cat could crawl up. "'And that's a man who's an authority on the human brain. "'I sent the old silly back to bed by the way he came, and if—' "'There he stopped, stopped short, "'and sucked in his breath with a sharp, wheezing sound. "'For, of a sudden, a swift, pattering footfall "'and a glimmer of moving light had sprung into being "'and drawn his eyes upward. "'And there, overhead, was Miss Lorne "'coming down the stairs from the upper floor "'in a state of nervous excitement, "'and with a bedroom candle in her shaking hand. "'A loose gown flung on over her nightdress, "'and her hair streaming over her shoulders in glorious disarray. He stood and looked at her with ever-quickening breath, with ever-widening eyes, as though the beauty of her had wakened some dormant sense, whose existence he had never suspected. As though, until now, he had never known how fair it was possible for a woman to be, how fair, how lovable, how much to be desired. And whilst he was so looking, she reached the foot of the staircase, and came pantingly toward him. "'Oh, Mr. Narkom, what was it, that noise I heard?' she said, in a tone of deepest agitation. "'It sounded like a struggle, like the noise of something breaking, and I dressed as hastily as I could and came down. Did he come? Has he been here? Have you caught him? Oh, why don't you answer me instead of staring at me like this? Can't you see how nervous, how frightened I am? Dear heaven!' "'Will no one tell me what has happened?' "'Nothing has happened, miss,' answered Petrie, catching her eye as she flashed round on him. "'You'd better go back to bed. Nobody's been here but Sir Horace. The noise you heard was me a-grabbing of him, and he and Mr. Narkom a-tumbling over something as they went down to look at the furnace.' "'Furnace? What furnace? What are you talking about?' she cried agitatedly. "'What do you mean by saying that Sir Horace came down?' "'Only what the superintendent himself will tell you, miss, if you ask him. "'Sir Horace came downstairs in his pyjamas a few minutes ago "'to say as he'd recollected about the flues of the furnace in the cellar "'being big enough to hold a man. "'And then him and Mr. Narkom went below to have a look at it.' "'She gave a sharp and sudden cry, "'and her face went as pale as a dead face. "'Sir Horace came down,' she repeated, moving back a step. "'and leaning heavily against the banister. "'Sir Horace came down to look at the furnace. "'We have no furnace.' "'What?' "'We have no furnace, I tell you. "'And Sir Horace did not come down. "'He is up there still. "'I know, I know, I tell you, "'because I feared for his safety, "'and when he went to his room, I locked him in. "'Superintendent!' The word was voiced by every man present, and six pairs of eyes turned toward Narkom with a look of despairing comprehension. "'Get to the cellar! Head the man off! It's he, the cracksman!' he shouted out. "'Find him! Get him! Nab him if you have to turn the house upside down!' They needed Moose's second bidding, for each man grasped the situation instantly, and in a twinkling there was a veritable pandemonium. Shouting and scrambling like a band of madmen, they lurched to the door, whirled it open, and went flying down the staircase to the kitchen, and so to a discovery which none might have foreseen. For almost as they entered, they saw lying on the floor a suit of striped pyjamas, and close to it, gagged, bound, helpless, trussed up like a goose that was ready for the oven, jives on his wrists, jives on his ankles, their chief, their superintendent, Mr. Maverick Narkom, in a state of collapse, and with all his outer clothing gone. After him, after that devil, and a thousand pounds to the man that gets him, he managed to gasp as they rushed to him and ripped loose the gag. He was here when we came. He has been in the house for hours. Get him! Get him! Get him! 
they surged from the room and up the stairs like a pack of stampeded animals. They raced through the hall and bore down on the picture gallery in a body, and, whirling open the now-closed door, went tumbling headlong in. The light was still burning. At the far end of the room a window was wide open, and the curtains of it fluttered in the wind. A collection of empty cases and caskets lay on the middle table, but man and jewels were alike gone. Once again, the vanishing cracksman had lived up to his promise, up to his reputation, up to the very letter of his name. And for all Mr. Maverick Narkom's care and shrewdness, forty faces had turned the trick, and Scotland Yard was done. End of the second part of the prologue The third part of the prologue of Gleek, the Man of the Forty Faces. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. Gleek, the Man of the Forty Faces by Thomas W. Hanshew. Prologue, Part Three. Through all the night its best men sought him, its dragnets fished for him. Its tentacles groped into every hole and corner of London in quest of him, but sought and fished and groped in vain. They might as well have hoped to find last summer's partridges or last winter's snow as any trace of him. He had vanished as mysteriously as he had appeared, and no royal jewels graced the display of Miss Wyvern's wedding gifts on the morrow. But it was fruitful of other gifts, fruitful of an even greater surprise, that morrow. For the first time since the day he had given his promise, no souvenir from the man who called himself Hamilton Cleek, no part of last night's loot came to Scotland Yard. And it was while the evening papers were making screaming copy and glaring headlines out of this, that the surprise in question came to pass. Miss Wyvern's wedding was over, the day and the bride had gone, and it was half-past ten at night when Sir Horace, answering a hurry call from headquarters, drove post-haste to Superintendent Narkom's private room, and passing in under a red and green lamp which burned over the doorway, entered and met that surprise. Maverick Narkom was there alone, standing beside his desk, with the curtains of his window drawn and pinned together, and at his elbow an unlighted lamp of violet-coloured glass, standing and looking thoughtfully down at something which lay before him. He turned as his visitor entered, and made an open-handed gesture towards it. "'Look here,' he said laconically. "'What do you think of this?' Sir Horace moved forward and looked, then stopped and gave a sort of wondering cry. The electric bulbs overhead struck a glare of light down on the surface of the desk, and there, spread out on the shining oak, lay a part of the royal jewels that had been stolen from Wyvern House last night. Narkom! You got him, then! Got him after all! No, I did not get him. "'I doubt if any man could if he chose not to be found,' said Narkom bitterly. "'I did not recover these jewels by any act of my own. "'He sent them to me, gave them up voluntarily.' "'Gave them up? After he had risked so much to get them? "'God bless my soul! What a man!' "'Why, there must be quite half here of what he took.' "'There is half, an even half. "'He sent them to-night, and with them this letter. "'Look at it, and you will understand why I sent for you "'and asked for you to come alone.' "'There's some good in even the devil, I suppose, "'if one but knows how to reach it and stir it up.' "'Sir Horace read, "'I have lived a life of crime from my very boyhood, because I couldn't help it. 
because it appealed to me, because I glory in risks and revel in dangers. I never knew where it would lead me, I never thought, never cared, but I looked into the gateway of heaven last night, and I can't go down the path to hell any longer. Here is an even half of Miss Wyvern's jewels. If you and her father would have me hand over the other half to you, and would have the vanishing cracksman disappear for ever, and a useless life converted into a useful one, you have only to say so to make it an accomplished thing. All I ask in return is your word of honour, to be given to me by signal, that you will send for Sir Horace Wyvern to be at your office at eleven o'clock to-night, and that you and he will grant me a private interview unknown to any other living being. A red and green lantern hung over the doorway leading to your office will be the signal that you agree, and a violet light in your window will be the pledge of Sir Horace Wyvern. When these two signals, these two pledges, are given, I shall come in and hand over the remainder of the jewels, and you will have looked for the first time in your life upon the real face of the man who calls himself Hamilton Cleek. "'God bless my soul! What an amazing creature! What an astounding request!' exclaimed Sir Horace as he laid the letter down. "'Willing to give up twenty thousand pounds' worth of jewels for the mere sake of a private interview? What on earth can be his object? And why should he include me?' "'I don't know,' said Narkom in reply. "'It's worth something, at all events, to be rid of the vanishing cracksman for good and all, and he says that it rests with us to do that. It's close to eleven now.' "'Shall we give him the pledge he asks, Sir Horace? "'My signal is already hung out. "'Shall we agree to the conditions and give him yours?' "'Yes, yes, by all means,' Sir Horace made answer. "'And lighting the violet lamp, "'Narkom flicked open the pinned curtains and set it in the window. "'For ten minutes nothing came of it, "'and the two men, talking in whispers while they waited, began to grow nervous. Then, somewhere in the distance, a clock started striking eleven, and without so much as a warning sound, the door flashed open, flashed shut again. A voice that was undeniably the voice of breeding and refinement said quietly, "'Gentlemen, my compliments. Here are the diamonds, and here am I.' And the figure of a man, faultlessly dressed, faultlessly mannered, with the slim-loined form, the slim-walled nose, and the clear-cut features of the born aristocrat, stood in the room. His age might lie anywhere between twenty-five and thirty-five, his eyes were straight-looking and clear, his fresh, clean-shaven face was undeniably handsome, and whatever his origin, whatever his history, there was something about him in look in speech, in bearing, that mutely stood sponsor for the thing called birth. "'God bless my soul!' exclaimed Sir Horace, amazed and appalled to find the reality so widely different from the image he had drawn. "'What monstrous juggle is this? Why, man alive, you're a gentleman! Who are you? What's driven you to a dog's life like this?' "'A natural bent, perhaps, a supernatural gift, certainly, Sir Horace,' he made reply. "'Look here. Could any man resist the temptation to use it when he was endowed by nature with the power to do this?' His features seemed to rise and not, and assume in as many moments a dozen different aspects. "'I've had the knack of doing that since the hour I could breathe.' Could any man go straight with a fateful gift like that if the laws of nature said that he should not? And do they say that? That's what I want you to tell me. That's why I have requested this interview. I want you to examine me, Sir Horace. 
to put me through those tests you use to determine the state of mind of the mentally fit and mentally unfit. I want to know if it is my fault that I am what I am, and if it is myself I have to fight in future, or the devil that lives within me. I'm tired of wallowing in the mire. A woman's eyes have lit the way to heaven for me. I want to climb up to her, to win her, to be worthy of her, and to stand beside her in the light. Her? What her? That's my business, Mr. Narkom, and I'll take no man into my confidence regarding that. Yes, my friend, but Margot, how about her? I'm done with her. We broke last night when I returned, and she learned— Never mind what she learned. I'm done with her, done with the lot of them. My life is changed for ever. In the name of heaven, man, who and what are you? Cleek, just Cleek. Let it go at that, he made reply. Whether it's my name or not is no man's business. Who I am, what I am, whence I came, is no man's business either. Cleek will do. Cleek of the forty faces. Never mind the past. My fight is with the future. And so examine me, Sir Horace, and let me know if I or fate's to blame for what I am. Sir Horace did. Absolutely fate, he said, when, after a long examination, the man put the question to him again. It is the criminal brain fully developed. "'horribly pronounced. "'God help you, my poor fellow, "'but a man simply could not be other than a thief and a criminal "'with an organ like that. "'There's no hope for you to escape your natural bent except by death. "'You can't be honest. "'You can't rise. "'You never will rise. "'It's useless to fight against it. "'I will fight against it. "'I will rise. "'I will, I will, I will!' "'He cried out vehemently. "'There is a way to put such craft and cunning to account, "'a way to fight the devil with his own weapons "'and crush him under the weight of his own gifts, "'and that way I'll take. "'Mr. Narkom,' he whirled and walked toward the superintendent, "'his hand outstretched, his eager face aglow. "'Mr. Narkom, help me. Take me under your wing. Give me a start, give me a chance, give me a lift on the way up.' "'Good heaven, man! You, you don't mean—' "'I do, I do. So help me, heaven, I do. All my life I fought against the law. Now let me switch over and fight with it.' I'm tired of being Cleek the thief, Cleek the burglar. Make me Cleek the detective, and let us work together, hand in hand, for a common cause and for the public good. Will you, Mr. Narkom? Will you? Will I? Won't I? said Narkom, springing forward and gripping his hand. Jove, what a detective! Detective, you will make bully boy, bully boy. It's a compact, then? It's a compact, Cleek. Thank you, he said in a choked voice. You've given me my chance. Now watch me live up to it. The vanishing cracksman has vanished for ever, Mr. Narkom, and it's Cleek the detective. Cleek of the forty faces from this time on. Now, give me your riddles. I'll solve them one by one. End of the prologue. Chapter One of Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces, by Thomas W. Hanshew. Chapter One The sound came again, so unmistakably this time the sound of a footstep in the soft, squashy ooze on the heath, 
there could be no question regarding the nature of it. Miss Lorne came to an instant standstill, and clutched her belongings closer to her with a shake and a quiver, and a swift prickle of goose-flesh ran round her shoulders and up and down the backs of her hands. There was good, brave blood in her, it is true, but good, brave blood isn't much to fall back upon if you happen to be a girl without escort, carrying a handbag containing twenty-odd pounds in money, several bits of valuable jewellery, your whole earthly possessions, in fact, and have lost your way on Hampstead Heath at half-past eight o'clock at night, with a spring fog shutting you in like a wall, and shutting out everything else but a mackerel collection of clouds that looked like grey smudges on the greasy silver of a twilit sky. She looked round, but she could see nothing and nobody. The heath was a white waste that might have been part of the scenery in Lapland, for all there was to tell that it lay within reach of the heart and pulse of the sluggish leviathan London. Over it the vapours of night crowded, an almost palpable wall of thick, wet mist, stirred now and again by some atmospheric movement which could scarcely be called a wind, although at times it drew long lacy filaments above the level of the denser mass of fog, and melted away with them into the calm, still upper air. Miss Lorne hesitated between two very natural impulses, to gather up her skirts and run, or to stand her ground, and demand an explanation from the person who was undoubtedly following her. She chose the latter. "'Who is there? Why are you following me? What do you want?' she flung out, keeping her voice as steady as the hard, sharp hammering of her heart would permit. The question was answered at once, rather startlingly, since the footsteps which caused her alarm had all the while proceeded from behind and slightly to the left of her. Now there came a hurried rush and scramble on the right. There was the sound of a match being scratched, a blob of light in the grey of the mist, and she saw standing in front of her a ragged, weedy, red-headed youth, with the blazing match in his scooped hands. He was thin to the point of ghastliness, Hunger was in his pinched face, his high cheekbones, his gouged jaws, staring like a starved wolf through the unnatural brightness of his pale eyes from every gaunt feature of him. Hello, he said with a strong cockney accent as he came up out of the fog, and the flare of the match gave him a full view of her, standing there with her lips shut hard and the handbag clutched up close to her with both hands. "'You what called, was it? What price me for answering of you, eh?' "'Yes, it was I that called,' she replied, making a brave front of it. "'But I do not think it was you that I called, too. Keep away, please. Don't come any nearer. What do you want?' "'Well, I'll take that blessed handbag to go on with. And if there aren't no money in it, tumble it out. Let's see. Lively now.' I'll feed for the rest of this week. Gord, yes! She made no reply, no attempt to obey him, no movement of any sort. Fear had absolutely stricken every atom of strength from her. She could do nothing but look at him with big frightened eyes and shake. Look here, aren't you a-gonna do it quiet, or are you a-gonna make me take the blessed thing from you? he asked. "'I'll do it if you put me to it, my hat, yus. "'It aren't my game. "'I'm what you might call a hammer-chewer at it. "'But when there's something inside you "'what tears and tears and tears "'any game's worth trying "'that pulls out the claws of it.' "'She did not move even yet. "'He flung the spent match from him "'and made a sharp step toward her and he had just reached out his hand to lay hold of her, when another hand, strong, sinewy, hard shutting as an iron clamp, reached out from the mist and laid hold of him, plucking him by the neckband and intruding a bunch of knuckles and shut fingers between that and his up-slanted chin. "'Now then, 
drop that little game at once, you young monkey, struck in the sharp staccato of a semi-excited voice. Interfering with young ladies, eh? Let's have a look at you. Don't be afraid, Miss Lorne. Nobody's going to hurt you. Then a pocket torch spat out a sudden ray of light, and by it both the half-throttled boy and the wholly frightened girl could see the man who had thus intruded himself upon their notice. "'Oh, it is you! It is you again, Mr. Cleek!' said Ailsa, with something between a laugh and a sigh of relief as she recognised him. "'Yes, it is I. I have been behind you ever since you left the house in Barden Road. It was rash of you to cross the heath at this time and in this weather. I rather fancied that something of this kind would be likely to happen, and so took the liberty of following you. "'Then it was you I heard behind me.' "'It was I, yes. I shouldn't have intruded myself upon your notice if you hadn't called out. A moment, please. Let's have a look at this young highwayman who so freely advertises himself as an amateur.' The light spat full into the gaunt, starved face of the young man, and made it stare forth doubly ghastly. He had made no effort to get away from the very first. Perhaps he understood the uselessness of it, with that strong hand gripped on his ragged neckband. Perhaps he was, in his way, something of a fatalist. London breeds so many among such as he. Starved things that find every boat chained, every effort thrust back upon them unrewarded. At any rate, from the moment he had heard the girl give to this man a name which every soul in England had heard at one time or another— during the past two years, he had gone into a sort of mild collapse, as though realising the utter uselessness of battling against fate, and had given himself up to what was to be. Hello, said Cleek, as he looked the youth over. "'Yours is a face I don't remember running foul of before, my young beauty. Where did you come from?' "'Where I seem like to be going now you got your currant pickers on me. "'Hell,' answered the boy, with something like a sigh of despair. "'Leastways I've been in hell ever since I can remember anything, "'so I reckon I must have come from there. "'What's your name?' "'Dollops. "'Spose I must have had another sometime, but I never heard of it. "'What's that?' "'Yes, most nineteen. "'What? "'Oh, go throw something at yourself. "'I aren't too young to be hungry, am I? "'And where's a cove going to find this here honest work you're a-talking of? "'I'm fair sick of the game o' looking for it. "'Besides, you don't see parties as goes in for the other thing, "'walking round with ribs on em like bed-slacks. "'Not even the price of a cup of coffee in their pockets, do you? "'No fear. "'I wouldn't have hurt a young lady, "'but I tell you straight, "'I'd have took every blessed farthing she had on her "'if you hadn't have dropped on me like this. "'Got down to the last ditch, "'down to the point of desperation, eh? "'Yes. "'So would you if you had a thing inside you "'tearing and tearing like I have.' "'Aunt it a blooming crumb since the day before yesterday at four in the morning, "'when a gent in an handsome, drunk as a lord he was, "'treated me and a parcel of others to a bun and a cup of coffee "'at a coffee stall over our gateway. "'Stood out agin being a crook as long as ever I could, "'as long as ever I'm going to, I reckon, now you've got your maulers on me. "'I'll be on a list after this. "'The cops all know me. "'And when you got the name, well, what's the odds? "'You might as well have the gime as well, and get over going empty. "'All right, run me in, sir. "'Anyhow, I'll have a bit to eat and a bed to sleep in tonight, and that's one comfort.' "'Cleek had been watching the boy closely, narrowly, with an ever-deepening interest. "'Now he loosened the grip of his fingers and let his hand drop to his side.' "'Suppose I don't run you in, as you put it. "'Suppose I'd take a chance and lend you five shillings. "'Will you do some work and pay it back to me in time?' 
he asked. The boy looked up at him and laughed in his face. "'Look here, governor. He's playing it low down to lark with a chap just before you're going to hang him,' he said. "'You come off your blessed perch.' "'Right,' said Cleek. "'And now you get up on yours, and let us see what you're made of.' Then he put his hand into his trousers' pocket. There was a chink of coins, and two half-crowns lay on his outstretched palm. "'There you are. Off with you now. And if you are any good, turn up some time to-night at number 204 Clarges Street, and ask for Captain Horatio Burbage. He'll see that there's work for you. Toddle along now, and get a meal and a bed, and mind you keep a close mouth about this.' The boy neither moved, nor spoke, nor made any sound. For a moment or two he stood looking from the man to the coins, and from the coins back to the man. Then, gradually, the truth of the thing seemed to trickle into his mind, and, as a hungry fox might pounce upon a stray fowl, he grabbed the money and bolted. "'Remember the name, and remember the street,' Cleek called after him. "'You take your bloomin' oath, I will,' came back through the enfolding mist. "'Gord, yes!' Just that, and the youth was gone. "'I wonder what you will think of me, Miss Lorne,' said Cleek, turning to her. "'Taking a chance like this, and above all with a fellow who would have stripped you of every jewel and every penny you have with you, if things hadn't happened as they have.' "'And I can very ill afford to lose anything now, as I suppose you know, Mr. Cleek. "'Things have changed sadly for me since that day Mr. Narkom introduced us at Ascot,' she said, with just a shadow of seriousness in her eyes. "'But as to what I think regarding your action toward that dreadful boy, "'oh, of course, if there is a chance of saving him from a career of crime, I think one owes him that as a duty.' In the circumstances the temptation was very great. It must be a horrible thing to be so hungry that one is driven to robbery to satisfy the longing for food. Yes, very horrible. Very, very indeed. I once knew a boy who stood as that boy stands at the parting of the ways, when the good that was in him fought the last great fight with the devil of circumstances. If a hand had been stretched forth to help that boy at that time, ah, oh well, it wasn't. The devil took the reins, and the game went his way. If five shillings will put the reins into that boy's hand tonight and steer him back to the right path, so much the better for him, and for me. I'll know if he's worth the chance I took tomorrow. Now, let us talk about something else. "'Will you allow me to escort you across the heath "'and see you safely on your way home? "'Or would you prefer that I should remain in the background as before?' "'How ungrateful you must think me to suggest such a thing as that,' "'she said, with a reproachful smile. "'Walk with me, if you will be so kind. "'I hope you know that this is the third time you have rendered me a service "'since I had the pleasure of meeting you. "'It is very nice of you. "'and I am extremely grateful. "'I wonder you find the time, or, well, take the trouble, "'rather archly, a great man like you. "'Shall I take off my hat and say, "'Thank you, ma'am, or just the hackneyed, "'Praise from Sir Hubert is praise indeed,' "'he said with a laugh, as he fell into step with her "'and they faced the mist and the distance together. "'I suppose you're alluding to my success in the famous Stanhope case. "'The newspapers made a great fuss over that, Mr. Narkom tells me. "'But, please, one big success doesn't make a great man, "'any more than one rosebush makes a garden. "'Are you fishing for a compliment, or is that really natural modesty? "'I had heard of your exploits and seen your name in the papers old dozens of times before I first had the pleasure of meeting you. And since then—no, 
I shan't flatter you by saying how many successes I have seen recorded to your credit in the past two years. Do you know that I have a natural predilection for such things? It may be morbid of me, is it? I have the strongest kind of a leaning towards the tales of Gaborio, and I have always wanted to know a really great detective, like Lecoq or Dupin. And that day at Ascot, when Mr. Narkom told me that he would introduce me to the famous man of the forty faces, Mr. Cleek, why do they call you the man of the forty faces? You always look the same to me. Perhaps I shan't when we come to the end of the heath and get into the public street where there are lights and people, he said. That I always look the same in your eyes, Miss Lorne, is because I have but one face for you, and that is my real one. Not many people see it, even among the men of the yard whom I occasionally work with. You do, however. So does Mr. Narkom occasionally. So did that boy, unfortunately. I had to show it when I came to your assistance, if only to assure you that you were in friendly hands, and to prevent you taking fright and running off into the mist in a panic, and losing yourself where even I might not be able to find you. That is why I told the boy to apply for work to Captain Burbage of Clarges Street. I am Captain Burbage, Miss Lorne. Nobody knows that but my good friend Mr. Narkom— and now you. I shall respect it, of course, she said. I hope I need not assure you of that, Mr. Cleek. You need assure me of nothing, Miss Lorne, he made reply. I owe so much more to you than you are aware that— Oh, well, it doesn't matter. You asked me a question a moment ago. If you want the answer to it, look here. He stopped short as he spoke. The pocket-torch clicked faintly, and from the shelter of a curved hand the glow of it struck upward to his face. It was not the same face for ten seconds at a time. What Sir Horace Wyvern had seen in Mr. Narkom's private office at Scotland Yard on that night of nights more than two years ago, Sir Horace Wyvern's niece saw now. <gasps> oh! she said with a sharp intaking of breath as she saw the writhing features knot and twist and blend. "'Oh, don't! It is uncanny! It is amazing! It is awful!' And after a moment, when the light had been shut off, and the man beside her was only a shape in the mist, "'I hope I may never see you do it again,' she merely more than whispered. "'It is the most appalling thing!' I can't think how you do it. How you came by the power to do such a thing. Perhaps by inheritance, said Cleek, as they walked on again. Once upon a time, Miss Lorne, there was a, a lady of extremely high position who, at a time when she should have been giving her thoughts to, well, more serious things, used to play with one of those curious little rubber faces which you can pinch up into all sorts of distorted countenances. You have seen the things, no doubt. She would sit for hours, screaming with laughter over the droll shapes into which she squeezed the thing. Afterward, when her little son was born, he inherited the trick of that rubber face as a birthright. It may have been the same case with me. Let us say it was, and drop the subject, since you have not found the sight a pleasing one. Now, tell me something, please, that I want to know about you. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces by Thomas W. Hanshu. Chapter 2. About me, Mr. Cleek? Yes. You spoke about there being a change in your circumstances. Spoke as though you thought I knew. I do not, but I should like to, if I may. 
"'It will, perhaps, explain why you are out alone and in this neighbourhood at this time of night.' "'It will,' she said, with just a shadow of deeper colour coming into her cheeks. "'The house you saw me coming out of is the residence of a friend and former schoolmate. I went there to inquire if she could help me in any way to secure a position, and stopped later than I realised. "'Procure you a position, Miss Lorne?' "'A position as what?' "'Companion, amanuensis, governess, anything that,' with a laugh and a blush, "'respectable young females may do to earn a living when they come down in the world. "'You may possibly have heard that my uncle, Sir Horace, has married again. "'I think you must have done so, for the papers were full of it at the time. "'But I forget,' quizzically, "'you don't read newspapers, do you?' even when they contain accounts of your own greatness. "'I wonder if I deserve that. At any rate, I got it,' said Cleek, with a laugh. "'Yes, I heard all about Sir Horace's wedding. Some four or five months ago, wasn't it?' "'No, three. Three last Thursday, the fourteenth. A woman doesn't forget the date of her enforced abdication.' The new Lady Wyvern soon let me know that I was a superfluous person in the household. Today I came to the conclusion to leave it, and have taken the first actual step toward doing so. A lucky step, too, I fancy, or at least it promises to be. As how? My friend knows of two people who would be likely to need me. One, a titled lady here in England, who might be... "'Very glad to have me. I am quoting that, please, as governess to her little boy. "'The other, a young French girl, who is returning shortly to Paris, "'who also might be glad to have me as companion. "'Of course, I would sooner remain in England, but, well, "'it is nicer to be a companion than a governess, "'and the young lady is very nearly my own age.' "'Indeed, we were actually at the same school together when we were very little girls.' "'I see,' said Cleek, a trifle gloomily. "'So then it is possible that it will eventually be the young French lady and Paris in future. "'When, do you fancy? Soon?' "'Oh, I don't know about that. "'I haven't quite made up my mind as yet which of the two it will be.' "'and then there's the application to be sent afterwards.' "'Still, it will be one of the two, certainly.' "'Oh, yes. I shall have to earn my living in future, you know. "'So naturally, of course.' "'She gave her shoulder an eloquent upward movement "'and let the rest go by default. "'Cleek did not speak for a moment, "'merely walked on beside her, a ridge between his eyebrows and his lower lip sucked in, as if he were mentally debating upon something and was afraid he might speak incautiously. But of a sudden, "'Miss Lorne,' he said in a curiously tense voice, "'may I ask you something? Let us say that you had set your heart upon obtaining one or the other of these two positions— "'Set it so entirely that life wouldn't be worth a straw to you if you didn't get it. "'Let us say, too, that there was something you had done, "'something in your past which, if known, "'might utterly preclude the possibility of your obtaining what you wanted. "'It is an absurd hypothesis, of course, "'but let us use it for the sake of argument. "'We will say that you had done your best to live down that offensive something done, and were still doing all that lay in your power to atone for it. That nobody but one person shared the knowledge of that something with you, and upon his silence you could rely. Now, tell me, would you feel justified in accepting the position upon which you had set your heart, without confessing the thing? or would you feel in duty bound to speak, well knowing that it would in all human probability be the end of all your hopes? I should like to have your opinion upon that point, please. I can't see that I or anybody else could have other than the one, she replied. 
"'It is an age-old maxim, is it not, Mr. Cleek, "'that two wrongs cannot by any possibility constitute a right? "'I should feel in duty bound, in honour bound, to speak, of course. "'To do the other would be to obtain the position by fraud, "'to steal it as a thief steals things that he wants. "'No sort of atonement is possible, is even worth the name.' "'if it is backed up by deceit, Mr. Cleek.' "'Even though that deceit is the only thing "'that could give you your heart's desire, "'the only thing that could open the gates of heaven for you?' "'The gates of heaven, as you put it, "'can never be opened with a lie, Mr. Cleek. "'They might be opened by the very thing of which you speak, "'confession. "'I think I should take my chances upon that.' "'At any rate, if I failed, I should at least have preserved my self-respect, "'and done more to merit what I wanted than if I had secured it by treachery. "'Think of the boy you helped a little while ago. "'How much respect will you have for him if he never lives up to his promise, "'never goes to Clarges Street at all? "'Yet, if he does live up to it, will he not be doubly worth the saving? "'But please—' "'with a sudden change from seriousness to gaiety. "'If I am to be led into sermonising, "'might I not know what it is all about? "'I shall be right, shall I not, "'in supposing that all this is merely the preface to something else?' "'Either the preface or the finest,' said Cleek, "'with a deeply drawn breath. "'Still, as you say, "'No atonement is worth calling an atonement if it is based upon fraud. "'And so, Miss Lorne, I am going to ask you to indulge in yet another little flight of fancy. "'Carry your mind back, will you, to the night when your cousin—to the night two years ago when Sir Horace Wyvern's daughter had her wedding present stolen, and you, I believe, had rather a trying moment with that fellow who was known as the Vanishing Cracksman.' "'You can remember it, can you not?' "'Remember it? I shall never forget it. "'I thought, when the police ran downstairs and left me with him, "'that I was talking to Mr. Narkom. "'I think I nearly went daft with terror when I found out that it was he.' "'And you found it out only through his telling you, did you not? "'Afterward, I am told, the police found you lying fainting at the foot of the stairs.' The man had touched you, spoken to you, even caught up your hand and put it to his lips. Can you remember what he said when he did that? Can you? Yes, she answered with a little shudder of recollection. For weeks afterward I used to wake up in the middle of the night thinking of it and going cold all over. He said, You have come down into hell and lifted me out. "'Under God you shall lift me into heaven as well.' "'And perhaps you shall,' said Cleek, stopping short and uncovering his head. "'At any rate I'll not attempt to win it by fraud. "'Miss Lorne, I am that man. "'I am the vanishing cracksman of those other days. "'I've walked the straight path since the moment I kissed your hand.' She said nothing, made no faintest sound. She couldn't. All the strength, all the power to do anything but simply stand and look at him had gone out of her. But even so, she was conscious, dimly but yet conscious, of a feeling of relief that they had come at last close to the end of the heath, that there was the faint glow of lights dimly observable through the enfolding mist and that there was the rumble of wheels, the pulse of life, the law-guarded paths of the city's streets beyond. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces, by Thomas W. Hanshew. Chapter 3 
she could not herself have been more conscious of that feeling of relief than he was of its coming. It spoke to him in the swift glance she gave towards those distant fog-blurred lights, in the white, drained face of her, in the shrinking backward movement of her body when he spoke again, and something within him voiced the exceeding bitter cry. I am not sure that I even hoped you would take the revelation in any other way than this, he said. A hawk, even a tamed one, must be a thing of terror in the eyes of a dove. Still, I am not sorry that I have made the confession, Miss Lorne. When the worst has been told, a burden rolls away. Yes, she acquiesced faintly, finding her voice but finding it only to lose it again. But that you, that you... And was faint and very still again. Shall we go on? It isn't more than fifty paces to the road, and you may rely upon finding a taxicab there. Would you like me to show you the way? Yes, please. I... Oh, don't think me unsympathetic, unkind, severe... It is such a shock. It is all so horrible. I mean, that is... Let me get used to it. I shall never tell, of course. No, never. Now, please, may we not walk faster? I am very, very late as it is, and they will be worrying at home. They did walk faster, and in a minute more were at the common's end. Cleek stopped and again lifted his hat. "'We will part here, Miss Lorne,' he said. "'I won't force my company on you any further. "'From here you are quite beyond all danger, "'and I am sure you would rather I left you to find a taxi for yourself. "'Good night.' "'He did not even offer to put out his hand. "'May I say again that I am not sorry I told you, "'nor did I ever expect you would take it other than like this. "'It is only natural.' try to forgive me, or at the least believe that I have not tried to keep your friendship by a lie, or to atone in seeming only. Good night. He gave her no chance to reply, no time to say one single word. Deep wounds require time in which to heal. He knew that he had wounded the white soul of her so that it was sick with uncertainty faint with dread, and putting on his hat, stepped sharply back and let the mist take him and hide him from her sight. But though she did not see, he was near her even then. He knew when she walked out into the light-filled street, he knew when she found a taxicab, and he did not make an effort to go his way until he was sure that she was safely started upon hers. Then he screwed round on his heel, and went back into the mist and loneliness of the heath, and walked, and walked, and walked. Afterward, long afterward, when the night was getting old and the town was going to sleep, he too fared forth in quest of a taxi, and finding one went his way as she had gone hers. In the neighbourhood of Bond Street, now a place of darkness and slow-tramping policemen, he dismissed the taxi and continued the journey along Piccadilly afoot. It was close to one o'clock when he came at length to Clarges Street and swung into it from the Piccadilly end, and moved on in the direction of the house which sheltered him and his secrets together. But though he walked with apparent indifference, his eye was ever on the lookout for some chance watcher in the windows of the other houses, for Captain Horatio Burbage was supposed in the neighbourhood to be a superannuated seaman who maintained a bachelor establishment with the aid of an elderly housekeeper and a deaf and dumb maid of all work. But no one was on the watch to-night, and it was only when he came at last to the pillared portico of his own residence that he found any sign of life from one end of the street to the other. He did find it then, however, 
for the boy, Dollops, was sitting huddled up on the top step with the thick shadow of the portico making a safe screen for him. He had made good use of the two half-crowns, for he had not only feasted, and was feasting still, on a bag of winkles and a saveloy, but was washed and brushed, and had gone to the length of a shoe-shine and a collar. "'Been waiting since eleven o'clock, sir,' he said, getting up and pulling his forelock as Cleek appeared. "'Didn't knock and ask for no one, though, not me. Twigged as it would be you, sir, on account of your saying to-night. I've read something of the ways of Tex. What oh? You would seem a sharp little customer, at all events, said Cleek, with a curious one sided smile, a smile that was peculiar to him. I somehow fancy that I've made a good investment, Dollops. Filled up, eh? No, sir, never filled. Born hungry, I reckon. But filled as much as you could fill me, bless your heart. I aren't never going to forget that, Governor. No fear. An eater and a scrapper I am, sir, and I'll scrap for you, sir, while there's a blooming breath left in my blessed body. Give me the tip what kind of work I can do for you, Governor, will you? I want to get them two half-crowns off my conscience as quick as I can. Cleek looked at him and smiled again. Yes, I'm sure I made a good bargain, Dollops, he said. Come in. And in this way, the attachment which existed between them ever afterward had its beginning. He took the boy in and up to the little room on the second floor which he called his den, and, turning on the light, motioned him to a chair, laid aside his hat and gloves, and was just about to pull up a chair for himself when he caught sight of an unstamped letter lying upon his writing-table. "'Sit down there and wait a moment until I read this, my lad,' he said, and forthwith tore the letter open. It was from Superintendent Narkom. He had known that from the first, however. No one but Narkom ever wrote him letters. This one was exceedingly brief. It simply contained these two lines. "'My dear Cleek, the three jolly fishermen Richmond, tea-time to-morrow.' An astonishing affair. Yours, M. N. Dollops, my lad, I think I'm going to make a man of you, he said, as he tore the letter into a dozen pieces and tossed the fragments into a waste basket. At any rate, I'm going to have a try. Know anything about Richmond? Yes, sir. Good. Well, we'll have a half hour's talk, and then I'll find a temporary bed for you for the night. "'and to-morrow we'll take a pull on the river at Richmond "'and see what we shall see.' "'The half-hour, however, developed into a full one, "'for it was after two o'clock when the talk was finished "'and a bed improvised for the boy. "'But Cleek, saying good-night to him at last "'and going to his own bedroom, "'felt that it was a long, long way from being time wasted. What Dollops thought is perhaps best told by the fact that he burst out crying when Cleek came in in the morning to ask how he had slept. "'Slept, Governor,' he said. "'Why, well, bless your heart, sir. I couldn't have slept better on a bed of roses, nor had half such comfort. Feel like I needed someone to lend me a biff on the cocoa, sir, to make sure as I aren't a-dreaming. It's so what a cove fancies heaven to be like, sir.' And afterward, when the day was older, and they had gone to Richmond, and Cleek, in his boating flannels, was pulling him up the shining river, and talking to him again as he had talked last night, he felt that it was even more like heaven than ever. It was after four, long after, when they finally separated, and Cleek, leaving the boy in charge of the boat, stepped ashore in the neighbourhood of the inn of the Three Jolly Fishermen and went to keep his appointment with Narkom. He found him enjoying tea at a little round table in the niche of a big bay window, in the small private parlour which lay immediately behind the bar-room. "'My dear chap, do forgive me for not waiting,' said the superintendent contritely, as Cleek came in, looking like a college-bred athlete in his boating flannels and his brim-tilted Panama. 
but the fact is you are a little later than i anticipated and i was simply famishing share the blame of my lateness with me mr narkom said cleek as he tossed aside his hat and threw the fag end of his cigarette through the open window you merely said tea-time not any particular hour and i improved the opportunity to take another spin up the river and to talk like a dutch uncle to a certain young man whom i shall introduce to your notice in due time it isn't often that duty calls me to a little eden like this the air is like balm to-day and the river oh the river is a sheer delight narkom rang for a fresh pot of tea and a further supply of buttered toast and when these were served cleek sat down and joined him i dare say said the superintendent opening fire at once that you wonder what in the world induced me to bring you out here to meet me my dear fellow instead of following the usual course and calling at clarges street well the fact is cleek that the gentleman with whom i am now about to put you in touch lives in this vicinity and is so placed that he cannot get away without running the risk of having the step he is taking discovered ah he is closely spied upon then commented cleek the trouble arises from some one or something in his own household no in his father's the trouble so far as i can gather seems to emanate from his stepmother a young and very beautiful woman who was born on the island of java where the father of our client met and married her some two years ago whither he had gone to probe into the truth of the amazing statement that a runic stone had been unearthed in that part of the globe ah then you need not tell me the gentleman's name mr narkom interposed cleek i remember perfectly well the stir which that ridiculous and unfounded statement created at the time despite the fact that scholars of all nations scoffed at the thing and pointed out that the very term rune is of teutonic origin one enthusiastic old gentleman mr michael bawdrey a retired brewer thirsting for something more enduring than malt to carry his name down the ages became fired with enthusiasm upon the subject and set forth for java hot foot as one might say i remember that the papers made great game of him but i heard i fancy that in spite of all he was a dear lovable old chap and not at all like the creature the cartoonists portrayed him what a memory you have my dear cleek yes that is the party and he is a dear lovable old chap at bottom collects old china old weapons old armour curiosities of all sorts lots of em bogus no doubt catch the charlatans among the dealers letting a chance like that slip them and is never so happy as when showing his collection to his friends and being mistaken by the ignorant for a man of deep learning a very human trait mr narkom we all are anxious that the world should set the highest possible valuation upon us it is only when we are underrated that we object so this dear deluded old gentleman having failed to secure a rune in java brought back something equally cryptic a woman was the lady of his choice a native or merely an inhabitant of the island merely an inhabitant my dear fellow as a matter of fact she is english her father a doctor long since deceased took her out there in her childhood she was none too well off i believe but that did not prevent her having many suitors among whom was mr bawdrey's own son the gentleman who is anxious to have you take up this case oh ho said cleek with a strong rising inflection so the lady was of the careful and calculating kind she didn't care for use and all the rest of it when she could have papa and the money-chest without waiting a common enough occurrence 
still this does not make up an affair and especially an affair which requires the assistance of a detective and you spoke of a case what is the case mr narkom i will leave mr philip bawdrey himself to tell you that said narkom as the door opened to admit a young man of about eight-and-twenty clothed in tennis flannels and looking very much perturbed a handsome fair-haired fair-moustached young fellow with frank boyish eyes and that unmistakable something which stamps the products of the varsities come in mr bawdrey you said we were not to wait tea and you see that we haven't let me have the pleasure of introducing mr headland put in cleek adroitly and with a look at narkom as much as to say don't give me away i may not care to take the case when i hear it so what's the use of letting everybody know who i am then he switched round in his chair rose and held out his hand mr george headland of the yard mr bawdrey i don't trust mr narkom's proverbially tricky memory for names he introduced me as jones once and i lost the opportunity of handling the case because the party in question couldn't believe that anybody named jones would be likely to ferret it out a funny idea that commented young bawdrey smiling and accepting the proffered hand rum lot of people you must run across in your line mr headland shouldn't take you for a detective myself shouldn't even in a room full of them college man aren't you thought so oxen or cantab cantab emmanuel oh lord never thought i'd ever live to appeal to an emmanuel man to do anything brilliant i'm an oxen chap brasenose is my alma mater i say mr narkom do give me a cup of tea will you i had to slip off while the others were at theirs and i've run all the way thanks very much don't mind if i sit in that corner and draw the curtain a little do you his frank boyish face suddenly clouding i don't want to be seen by anybody passing it's a horrible thing to feel that you are being spied upon at every turn mr headland and that want of caution may mean the death of the person you love best in all the world oh it's that kind of case is it queried cleek making room for him to pass round the table and sit in the corner with his back to the window and the loosened folds of the chintz curtain keeping him in the shadow yes answered young bawdrey with a half repressed shudder and a deeper clouding of his rather pale face sometimes i try to make myself believe that it isn't that it's all fancy that she never could be so inhuman and yet how else is it to be explained you can't go behind the evidence you can't make things different simply by saying that you will not believe he stirred his tea nervously gulped down a couple of mouthfuls of it and then set the cup aside i can't enjoy anything it takes the savour out of everything when i think of it he added with a note of pathos in his voice my dad my dear bully old dad the best and dearest old boy in all the world i suppose mr headland that mr narkom has told you something about the case a little a very little indeed i know that your father went to java and married a second wife there and i know too that you yourself were rather taken with the lady at one time and that she threw you over as soon as mr bawdrey senior became a possibility that's a mistake he replied she never threw me over mr headland she never had the chance i found her out long before my father became anything like what you might call a rival found her out as a mercenary designing woman and broke from her voluntarily i only wish that i had known that he had one serious thought regarding her i could have warned him i could have spoken then but i never did find out until it was too late trust her for that she waited until i had gone up country to look after some fine old porcelains and enamels that the governor had heard about then she hurried him off and tricked him into a hasty marriage of course after that i couldn't speak i wouldn't speak she was my father's wife and he was so proud of her 
so happy, dear old boy, that I'd have been little better than a brute to say anything against her. What could you have said if you had spoken? Oh, lots of things. The things that made me break away from her in the beginning. She'd had more love affairs than one, her late father's masquerading as a doctor for another. They had only used that as a cloak. They had run a gambling house on the sly. He is the card sharper, she is the decoy. They had drained one poor fellow dry, and she had thrown him over after leading him on to think that she cared for him and was going to marry him. He blew out his brains in front of her, poor wretch. They say she never turned a hair. You wouldn't believe it possible if you saw her. She is so sweet and caressing and so young and beautiful. You'd almost believe her an angel. But there's Travers in the background. Always Travers. Travers? Who is he? Oh, one of her old flames. The only one she ever really cared for, they say. She was supposed to have broken with him out there in Java because they were too poor to marry. And now he's come over to England, and he's there in the house with the dear old dad and me, and they are as thick as thieves together. I've caught them whispering and prowling about together, in the grounds and along the lanes, after she has said good night and gone to her room, and is supposed to be in bed. There's a house full of her old friends three parts of the time. They come and they go, but Travers never goes. I know why. Waxing suddenly excited, suddenly vehement. Yes, I know why. He's in the game with her. Game? What game, Mr. Baudry? What is it that she is doing? She's killing my old dad, he answered, with a sort of sob in his excited voice. She's murdering him by inches. That's what she's doing. And I want you to help me bring it home to her. God knows what it is she's using or how she uses it. But you know what demons they are for secret poisons, those Javanese. What means they have of killing people without a trace. And she was out there for years and years. So, too, was Travers, the brute. They know all the secrets of those beastly barbarians, and between them they're doing something to my old dad. How do you know that? I don't know it. That's the worst of it. But I couldn't be surer of it if they took me into their secrets. But there's the evidence of his condition. There's the fact that it didn't begin until after Travers came. Look here, Mr. Headland. You don't know my dad. He's got the queerest notions sometimes. One of his fads is that it's unlucky to make a will. Well, if he dies without one, who will inherit his money, as I am an only child? Undoubtedly you and his widow. Exactly. And if I die at pretty nearly the same time, and they'll see to that, never fear. It will be my turn the moment they are sure of him. She will inherit everything. Now, let me tell you what's happening. From being a strong, healthy man, my father has, since Travers's arrival, begun to be attacked by a mysterious malady. He has periodical fainting fits, sometimes convulsions. He'll be feeling better for a day or so, then, without a word of warning, whilst you're talking to him, he'll drop like a shot bird and go into the most horrible convulsions. The doctors can't stop it. They don't even know what it is. They only know that he's fading away, turning from a strong, virile old man into a thin, nervous, shivering wreck. But I know. I know. They're dosing him somehow with some diabolical Javanese thing, those two. And yesterday, God help me, yesterday I too dropped like a shot bird. I too had the convulsions and the weakness and the fainting fit. My time has begun also. Bless my soul, what a diabolical thing, put in Narkom agitatedly. No wonder you appealed to me. No wonder, Baudry replied. I felt that it had gone as far as I dared to let it, that it was time to call in the police and to have help before it was too late. 
"'That's the case, Mr. Headland. "'I want you to find some way of getting at the truth, "'of looking into Travis's luggage, into my stepmother's effects, "'and unearthing the horrible stuff with which they are doing this thing. "'And perhaps, when that is known, "'some antidote may be found to save the dear old dad "'and restore him to what he was. "'Can't you do this? "'For God's sake, say that you can.' "'At all events I can try, Mr. Baudry,' responded Cleek. "'Oh, thank you, thank you,' said Baudry gratefully. "'I don't care a hang what it costs, what your fees are, Mr. Headland. "'So long as you run those two to earth, and get hold of the horrible stuff, whatever it is that they are using, "'I'll pay any price in the world, and count it cheap, as compared with the life of my dear old dad. "'When can you take hold of the case? Now?' "'I'm afraid not. Mysterious things like this require a little thinking over. Suppose we say to-morrow noon. Will that do?' "'I suppose it must. Although I should have liked to take you back with me. Every moment's precious at a time like this. But if it must be delayed until to-morrow, well, it must, I suppose. But I'll take jolly good care that nobody gets a chance to come within touching distance of the pater, bless him.' "'until you do come, if I have to sit on the mat before his door until morning. "'Here's the address on this card, Mr. Headland. "'When and how shall I expect to see you again? "'You'll use an alias, of course.' "'Oh, certainly. "'Had you any old friend in your college days "'whom your father only knew by name, "'and who is now too far off for the imposture to be discovered?' "'Yes, Jim Rickaby. "'We were as inseparable as the Siamese twins in our undergrad days. "'He's in Borneo now. "'Haven't heard from him in a dog's age.' "'Couldn't be better,' said Cleek. "'Then Jim Rickaby let it be. "'You'll get a letter from him first thing in the morning, "'saying that he's back in England "'and about to run down and spend the weekend with you. "'At noon he will arrive, "'accompanied by his Borneo's servant, "'named, er. Uh, dollops you can put the blackie up in some quarter of the house where he can move about at will without disturbing any of your own servants and can get in and out at all hours he will be useful you know in prowling about the grounds at night and ascertaining if the lady really does go to bed when she retires to her room as for jim rickaby himself "'Well, you can pave the way for his operations "'by informing your father, when you get the letter, "'that he has gone daft on the subject of old China "'and curios and things of that sort, don't you know?' "'What a ripping idea,' commented young Baudry. "'I twig. "'He'll get chummy with you, of course, "'and you can lead him on and adroitly pump him regarding her "'and where she keeps her keys and things like that. "'That's the idea, isn't it?' "'Something of that sort. I'll find out all about her, never fear,' said Cleek in reply. Then they shook hands and parted, and it was not until after young Baudry had gone that either he or Narkom recollected that Cleek had overlooked telling the young man that Headland was not his name. "'Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Time enough to tell him that when it comes to making out the cheque, said Cleek, as the superintendent remarked upon the circumstance. Then he pushed back his chair and walked over to the window, and stood looking silently out upon the flowing river. Narkom did not disturb his reflections. He knew from past experience, as well as from the manner in which he took his lower lip between his teeth and drummed with his fingertips upon the window ledge, that some idea relative to the working out of the case had taken shape within his mind, and so, with the utmost discretion, went on with his tea, and refrained from speaking. Suddenly Cleek turned. "'Mr. Narkom, do me a favour, will you? Look me up a copy of Holman's Diseases of the Kidneys when you go back to town. I'll send Dollops round to the yard tonight to get it. "'Right you are,' said Narkom, taking out his pocket-book and making a note of it. "'But I say, look here, my dear fellow, you can't possibly believe that it's anything of that sort, anything natural, I mean, 
in the face of what we've heard. No, I don't. I think it's something confoundedly unnatural, and that that poor old chap is being secretly and barbarously murdered. I think that, and I think, too. His voice trailed off. He stood silent and preoccupied for a moment, and then putting his thoughts into words without addressing them to anybody. I yuppie, he said reflectively. Poon upus, antia, galangaroot, ginger and black pepper. That's the Javanese method of procedure, I believe. Iopi, yes, assuredly, Iopi. What the dickens are you talking about, Cleek? And what does all that gibberish and that word Iopi mean? Nothing, nothing. At least, just yet. I say, put on your hat and let's go for a pull on the river, Mr. Narkom. I've had enough of mysteries for today and am spoiling for another hour in a boat. Then he screwed round on his heel and walked out into the brilliant summer sunshine. End of chapter 3《ャプター・フォー・オフ・クリック・ザ・マン・オフ・ザ・フォーティ・フェイセス》。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding.《クリック・ザ・マン・オフ・ザ・フォーティ・フェイセス》by Thomas W. Hanshu。Chapter 4 Promptly at the hour appointed, Mr. Jim Rickaby and his black servant arrived at Laburnum Villa and certainly the former had no cause to complain of the welcome he received at the hands of his beautiful young hostess. He found her not only an extremely lovely woman to the eye, but one whose gentle, caressing ways, whose soft voice and simple girlish charm were altogether fascinating, and judging from outward appearances, from the tender solicitude for her elderly husband's comfort and well-being, from the look in her eyes when she spoke to him, the gentleness of her hand when she touched him, one would have said that she really and truly loved him, and that it needed no lure of gold to draw this particular May to the arms of this one December. He found Captain Travers a laughing, rollicking, fun-loving type of man, at least to all outward appearances, who seemed to delight in sports and games, and to have an almost childish love of card tricks and that species of entertainment which is known as parlour magic. He found the three other members of the little house party, to wit, Mrs. Summerby Miles, Lieutenant Forchet, and Mr. Robert Murdoch, respectively a silly, flirtatious little gadfly of a widow, a callow, love-struck, lap-dog young army officer, with a budding moustache and a full-blown idea of his own importance, and a dour Scotchman of middle age, with a passion for chess, a glowering scorn of frivolities, and a deep and abiding conviction that Scotland was the only country in the world for a self-respecting human being to dwell in, and that everything outside of the established church was foredoomed to flames and sulphur, and the perpetual prodding of red-hot pitchforks and last, but not least by any means, he found Mr. Michael Baudry just what he had been told he would find him, namely a dear, lovable, sunny-tempered old man, who fairly idolised his young wife, and absolutely adored his frank-faced, affectionate, big boy of a son, and who ought not, in the common course of things, to have an enemy or an evil-wisher in all the world. The news, which of course had preceded Cleek's arrival, that this whilom college chum of his son's was as great an enthusiast as he himself on the subject of old china, old porcelain, bric-a-brac and curios of every sort, filled him with the utmost delight, and he could scarcely refrain from rushing him off at once to view his famous collection. "'Michael, dear, you mustn't overdo yourself.' "'just because you happen to have been a little stronger these past two days,' said his wife, laying a gentle hand on his arm. 
"'Besides, we must give Mr. Rickaby time to breathe. "'He has had a long journey, and I am sure he will want to rest. "'You can take him in to see that wonderful collection after dinner, dear.' "'Hm, full of fakes, as I supposed, and she knows it,' "'was Cleek's mental comment upon this. "'And he was not surprised when, finding herself alone with him a few minutes later, "'she said in her pretty, pleading way, "'Mr. Rickaby, if you are an expert, don't undeceive him. "'I could not let you go to see the collection without first telling you. "'It is full of bogus things, full of frauds and shams "'that unscrupulous dealers have palmed off on him. "'But don't let him know. "'He takes such pride in them, and—and and he's breaking down. "'God pity me, his health is breaking down every day, Mr. Rickaby, "'and I want to spare him every pang if I can.' "'even so little a pang as the discovery that the things he prizes are not real. "'Set your mind at rest, Mrs. Baudry,' promised Cleek. "'He will not find it out from me. "'He will not find anything out from me. "'He is just the kind of man to break his heart, "'to crumple up like a burnt glove, "'and come to the end of all things, even life, "'if he were to discover that any of his treasures— "'Anything that he loved and trusted in is a sham and a fraud.' His eyes looked straight into hers as he spoke. His hand rested lightly on her sleeve. She sucked in her breath suddenly. A brief pallor chased the roses from her cheeks. A brief confusion sat momentarily upon her. She appeared to hesitate, then looked away and laughed uneasily. "'I don't think I quite grasp what you mean, Mr. Rickaby,' she said. "'Don't you?' he made answer. "'Then I will tell you, some time, to-morrow, perhaps. "'But if I were you, Mrs. Baudry, well, no matter. "'This I promise you, that dear old man shall have no ideal shattered by me.' "'And living up to that promise, he enthused over everything the old man had in his collection when, after dinner that night, they went, in company with Philip, to view it. But bogus things were on every hand—spurious porcelains, fraudulent armour, faked china were everywhere. The loaded cabinets and the glazed cases were one long procession of faked Dresden and bogus faience of Egyptian enamels that had been manufactured in Birmingham, and of sixth-century treasures, whose makers were still plying their trade and fastening upon the ignorance of such collectors as he. "'Now, here's a thing I'm particularly proud of,' said the gulled old man, reaching into one of the cases and holding out for Cleek's admiration an irregular disc of dull hammered gold that had an iridescent beetle embedded in the flat face of it. "'This scarab, Mr. Rickaby, has helped to make history, as one might say. It was once the property of Cleopatra. I was obliged to make two trips to Egypt before I could persuade the owner to part with it. I am always conscious of a certain sense of awe, Mr. Rickaby, when I touch this wonderful thing. To think, sir, to think that this bauble once rested on the bosom of that marvellous woman, that Mark Antony must have seen it, may have touched it, that Ptolemy Orletes knew all about it, and that it is older, sir, than the Christian religion itself. He held it out upon the flat of his palm, the better for Cleek to see and to admire it, and signed to his son to hand the visitor a magnifying glass. "'Wonderful! Most wonderful!' observed Cleek, bending over the spurious gem, and focusing the glass upon it. Not, however, for the purpose of studying the fraud, but to examine something just noticed— something round and red and angry-looking, which marked the palm itself, at the base of the middle finger. "'No wonder you are proud of such a prize. I think I should go off my head with rapture if I owned an antique like that. But, pardon me, 
"'Have you met with an accident, Mr. Bawdrey? "'That's an ugly place you have on your palm.' "'That? Oh, that's nothing,' he answered gaily. "'It itches a great deal at times, but otherwise it isn't troublesome. "'I can't think how in the world I got it, to tell the truth. "'It came out as a sort of red blister in the beginning, "'and since it broke it has been spreading a great deal.' "'but really it doesn't amount to anything at all.' "'Oh, that's just like you, Dad,' put in Philip, "'always making light of the wretched thing. "'I notice one thing, however, Rickaby. "'It seems to grow worse instead of better, "'and Dad knows as well as I do when it began. "'It came out suddenly about a fortnight ago, "'after he had been holding some green worsted "'for my stepmother to wind into balls.' "'Just look at it, will you, old chap?' "'Nonsense, nonsense,' chimed in the old man laughingly. "'Don't mind the silly boy, Mr. Rickaby. "'He will have it that that green worsted is to blame, "'just because he happened to spy the thing the morning after.' "'Let's have a look at it,' said Cleek, moving nearer the light. "'Then, after a close examination,' "'I don't think it amounts to anything after all,' he added, as he laid aside the glass. "'I shouldn't worry myself about it if I were you, Phil. It's just an ordinary blister, nothing more. Let's go on with the collection, Mr. Baudry. I'm deeply interested in it, I assure you. Never saw such a marvellous lot. Got any more amazing things? Gems, I mean, like that wonderful scarab? I say!' "'halting suddenly before a long narrow case with a glass front, "'which stood on end in a far corner, "'and being lined with black velvet, "'brought into ghastly prominence "'the suspended shape of a human skeleton contained within. "'I say, what the dickens is this? "'Looks like a doctor's specimen, begad. "'You haven't let anybody—I mean, "'you haven't been buying any prehistoric bones, "'have you, Mr. Baudry? "'Oh, that!' laughed the old man, turning round and seeing to what he was alluding. "'Oh, that's a curiosity of quite a different sort, Mr. Rickaby. "'You are right in saying it looks like a doctor's specimen. "'It is, or rather it was. "'Mrs. Baudry's father was a doctor, and it once belonged to him.' "'Properly, it ought to have no place in a collection of this sort. "'But, well, it's such an amazing thing, "'I couldn't quite refuse it a place, sir. "'It's a freak of nature, the skeleton of a nine-fingered man. "'Of a what? "'A nine-fingered man. "'Well, I can't say that I see anything remarkable in that.' "'I've got nine fingers myself, nine and one over, when it comes to that.' "'No, you haven't, you duffer,' put in young Baudry with a laugh. "'You've got eight fingers, eight fingers and two thumbs. "'This bony Johnny has nine fingers and two thumbs. "'That's what makes him a freak. "'I say, Dad, open the beggar's box and let Rickaby see.' "'His father obeyed the request.' Lifting the tiny brass latch which alone secured it, he swung open the glazed door of the case, and, reaching in, drew forward the flexible left arm of the skeleton. "'There you are,' he said, supporting the bony hand upon his palm, so that all its fingers were spread out, and Cleek might get a clear view of the monstrosity. "'What a trial he must have been to the glove! trade, mustn't he? <laughs> Laughing gaily. Fancy the confusion and dismay, Mr. Rickaby, if a fellow like this walked into a Bond Street shop in a hurry and asked for a pair of gloves. Cleek bent over and examined the thing with interest. At first glance, the hand was no different from any other skeleton hand one might see any day in any place where they sold anatomical specimens for the use of members of the medical profession. But as Mr. Baudry, holding it on the palm of his right hand, flattened it out with the fingers of his left, the abnormality at once became apparent. 
springing from the base of the fourth finger, a perfectly developed fifth appeared, curling inward toward what had once been the palm of the hand, as though in life it had been the owner's habit of screening it from observation by holding it in that position. It was, however, perfectly flexible, and Mr. Baudry had no difficulty in making it lie out flat after the manner of its mates. The sight was not inspiring. The freaks of Mother Nature rarely are. No one but a doctor would have cared to accept the thing as a gift, and no one but a man as mad on the subject of curiosities and with as little sense of discrimination as Mr. Baudry would have dreamt for a moment of adding it to a collection. "'It's rather uncanny,' said Cleek, who had no palate for the abnormal in nature. "'For myself I may frankly admit that I don't like things of that sort about me.' "'You are very much like my wife in that,' responded the old man. She was of the opinion that the skeleton ought to have been destroyed or else handed over to some anatomical museum. But, well, it is a curiosity, you know, Mr. Rickaby. Besides, as I have said, it was once the property of her late father, a most learned man, sir, most learned, and as it was of sufficient interest for him to retain it, "'Oh, well, we collectors are faddists, you know, "'so I easily persuaded Mrs. Baudry "'to allow me to bring it over to England with me "'when we took our leave of Java. "'And now that you have seen it, "'suppose we have a look at more artistic things. "'I have some very fine specimens of Neolithic implements and weapons "'which I am most anxious to show you. "'Just step this way, please.' He let the skeleton's hand slip from his own, swing back into the case, and forthwith closed the glass door upon it. Then, leading the way to the cabinet containing the specimens referred to, he unlocked it, and invited Cleek's opinion of the flint arrowheads, stone hatchets, and granite utensils within. For a minute they lingered thus, the old man talking, laughing, exulting in his possessions the detective examining and pretending to be deeply impressed. Then, of a sudden, without hint or warning to lessen the shock of it, the uplifted lid of the cabinet fell with a crash from the hand that upheld it, shivering the glass into fifty pieces, and Cleek, screwing round on his heel with a jump of all his nerves, was in time to see the figure of his host crumple up, collapse, drop like a thing shot dead, and lie foaming and writhing on the polished floor. "'Dad! Oh, heavens, Dad!' The cry was young Baudry's. He seemed fairly to throw himself across the intervening space, and to reach his father in the instant he fell. "'Now you know! Now you know!' he went on wildly, as Cleek dropped down beside him and began to loosen the old man's collar. "'It's like this always. Not a hint, not a sign.' but just this utter collapse. My God, what are they doing it with? How are they managing it, those two? They're coming, Headland. Listen, don't you hear them? The crash of the broken glass and the jar of the old man's fall had swept through all the house, and a moment later, headed by Mrs. Baudry herself, all the members of the little house-party came piling excitedly into the room. The fright and suffering of the young wife seemed very real as she threw herself down beside her husband and caught him to her with a little shuddering cry. Then her voice, uplifting in a panic, shrilled out a wild appeal for doctor, servants, help of any kind, and almost as she spoke Travers was beside her, Travers and Fauchet and Robert Murdoch, yes, and silly little Mrs. Summerby Miles, too, forgetting in the face of such a time as this to be anything but helpful and womanly, and all of these gave such assistance as was in their power. "'Help me get him up to his own room, somebody, and send a servant post-haste for the doctor,' said Captain Travers, taking the lead after the fashion of a man who is used to command. "'Calm yourself as much as possible, Mrs. Baudry. Here, Murdoch, lend a hand and help him.' "'Amon!' 
There is no help but heavens in sick a case as this, dolefully responded Murdoch, as he came forward and solemnly stooped to obey. The poor old laddie! The laird giveth and the laird taketh awa, and the wheel o' mon is as naething. Oh, stow your croaking, you blundering old fool! snapped Travers, as Mrs. Baudry gave a heart wrung cry and hid her face in her hands. "'You and your eternal doldrums! Here, Baudry, lend a hand, old chap. We can get him upstairs without the assistance of this human trombone, I know.' But this human trombone was not minded that they should, and so it fell out that when Lieutenant Forshay led Mrs. Summerby Miles from the room, and young Baudry and Captain Travers carried the stricken man up the stairs to his own bedchamber, his wife flying in advance to see that everything was prepared for him, Cleek, standing all alone beside the shattered cabinet, could hear Mr. Robert Murdoch's dismal croakings rumbling steadily out as he mounted the staircase with the others. For a moment after the closing door of a room overhead had shut them from his ears, he stood there with puckered brows and pursed-up lips, drumming with his fingertips a faint tattoo upon the framework of the shattered lid. Then he walked over to the skeleton case, and silently regarded the gruesome thing within. Nine fingers, he muttered sententiously, and the ninth curves inward to the palm. He stepped round and viewed the case from all points, both sides, the front, and even the narrow space made at the back by the angle of the corner where it stood. And after this he walked to the other end of the room, took the key from the lock, slipped it in his pocket, and went out, closing the door behind him, that none might remember it had not been locked when the master of the place was carried above. It was perhaps twenty minutes later that young Baudry came down and found him all alone in the smoking-room, bending over the table whereon the butler had set the salver containing the whisky decanter, the soda siphon, and the glasses that were always laid out there, that the gentlemen might help themselves to the regulation nightcap before going to bed. "'I've slipped away to have a word in private with you, Headland,' he said in an agitated voice as he came in. "'Oh, what consummate actors they are, those two! You'd think her heart was breaking, wouldn't you? You'd think—hello, I say, what on earth are you doing?' For as he came nearer he could see that Cleek had removed the glass stopper of the decanter, and was tapping with his fingertips a little funnel of white paper, the narrow end of which he had thrust into the neck of the bottle. "'Just adding a harmless little sleeping draught to the nightly beverage,' said Cleek in reply, as he screwed up the paper funnel and put it in his pocket. "'A good sound sleep is an excellent thing, my dear fellow, and I mean to make sure that the gentlemen of this house-party have it. One gentleman in particular, Captain Travers.' "'Yes, but, I say, what about me, old chap? I don't want to be drugged, and you know I have to show them the courtesy of taking a nightcap with them.' "'Precisely. That's where you can help me out. If any of them remark anything about the whisky having a peculiar taste, you must stoutly assert that you don't notice, and as they've seen you drinking from the same decanter, why, there you are. Don't worry over it. It's a very, very harmless draught. You won't even have a headache from it. Listen here, Baudry. Somebody is poisoning your father.' "'I know it. I told you so from the beginning, Headland,' he answered with a sort of wail. "'But what's that got to do with drugging the whisky? "'Everything. I'm going to find out tonight whether Captain Travers is that somebody or not. Shh! Don't get excited. Yes, that's my game. I want to get into his rooms whilst he is sleeping and be free to search his effects.' I want to get into every man's room here, and wherever I find poison—well, you understand?' "'Yes,' he replied, 
brightening as he grasped the import of the matter. "'What a ripping idea! And so simple!' "'I think so. Once let me find the poison and I'll know my man. Now, one other thing. The housekeeper must have a master key that opens all the bedrooms in the place. Get it for me. It will be easier and swifter than picking the locks.' "'Right you are, old chap. I'll slip up to Mrs. Jarrett's room and fetch it to you at once. No, tuck it under the mat just outside my door. As it won't do for me to be drugged as well as the rest of you, I shan't put in an appearance when the rest come down. Say I've got a headache and have gone to bed. As for my own nightcap, well, I can send Dollops down to get the butler to pour me one out of another decanter, so that will be all right.' "'Now toddle off and get the key, there's a good chap. "'And I say, Baudry, as I shan't see you again until morning, "'good night.' "'Good night, old chap,' he answered in his impulsive, boyish way. "'You are a friend, Headland, and you'll save my dad, God bless you. "'A true, true friend, that's what you are. "'Thank God I ran across you.' Cleek smiled and nodded to him as he passed out and hurried away. Then, hearing the other gentleman coming down the stairs, he too made haste to get out of the room and to creep up to his own after they had assembled and the cigar cabinet and the whisky were being passed round, and the doctor was busy above with the man who was somebody's victim. The big old grandfather clock at the top of the stairs pointed ten minutes past two, and the house was hushed of every sound save that which is the evidence of deep sleep, when the door of Cleek's room swung quietly open, and Cleek himself, in dressing-gown and wadded bedroom slippers, stepped out into the dark hall, and, leaving Dollops on guard, passed like a shadow over the thick, unsounding carpet. The rooms of all the male occupants of the house, including that of Philip Baudry himself, opened upon this. He went to each in turn, unlocked it, stepped in, closed it after him, and lit the bedroom candle. The sleeping draught had accomplished all that was required of it, and in each and every room he entered, Captain Travers's, Lieutenant Fourchet's, Mr. Robert Murdoch's, there lay the occupant thereof stretched out at full length, in the grip of that deep and heavy sleep which comes of drugs. Cleek made the round of the rooms as quietly as any shadow, even stopping as he passed young Baudry's on his way back to his own to peep in there. Yes, he too had got his share of the effective draught, for there he lay, snarled up in the bedclothes, with his arms over his head, and his knees drawn up, until they were on a level with his waist, and his handsome, boyish face a little paler than usual. Cleek didn't go into the room, simply looked at him from the threshold, then shut the door, and went back to Dollops. "'All serene, Governor?' questioned that young man, in an eager whisper. "'Yes, quite,' his master replied, as he turned to a writing-table, whereon there lay a sealed note, and, pulling out the chair, sat down before it and took up a pen. "'Wait a bit, and then you can go to bed. I'll give you still another note to deliver. While I'm writing it, you may lay out my clothes.' "'Slipping off, sir?' "'Yes. You will stop here, however.' "'Now then, hold your tongue. I'm busy.' Then he pulled a sheet of paper to him, and wrote rapidly, "'Dear Mr. Baudry, I've got my man, and am off to consult with Mr. Narkom, and to have what I've found analysed. I don't know when I shall be back, probably not until the day after tomorrow. You are right. It is murder, and Java is at the bottom of it. Dollops will hand you this. Say nothing.' "'Just wait till I get back.' "'This he slipped, unsigned in his haste, into an envelope, "'handed it to Dollops, and then fairly jumped into his clothes. Ten minutes later he was out of the house, "'and the end of the riddle was in sight.'
End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces by Thomas W. Hanshu. Chapter Five. On the morrow, Mrs. Bawdrey made known the rather surprising piece of news that Mr. Rickaby had written her a note to say that he had received a communication of such vital importance that he had been obliged to leave the house that morning before anybody was up, and might not be able to return to it for several days. "'No very great hardship in that, my dear,' commented Mrs. Summerby Miles, "'for a more stupid and uninteresting person I never encountered. Fancy! He never even offered to assist the gentleman to get poor Mr. Bawdrey upstairs last night. How is the poor old dear this morning, darling?' "'Better?' "'Yes, much,' said Mrs. Bawdrey in reply. "'Dr. Philipson came to the house before four o'clock, and brought some wonderful new medicine that has simply worked wonders. Of course, he will have to stop in bed and be perfectly quiet for three or four days. But, although the attack was by far the worst he has ever had, the doctor feels quite confident that he will pull him safely through.' Now, although in the light of her apparent affection for her aged husband she ought, one would have thought, to be exceedingly happy over this, it was distinctly noticeable that she was nervous and ill at ease, that there was a hunted look in her eyes, and that, as the day wore on, these things seemed to be accentuated. More than that, there seemed added proof of the truth of young Baudry's assertion that she and Captain Travers were in league with each other, for that day they were constantly together, constantly getting off into out-of-the-way places, and constantly talking in an undertone of something that seemed to worry them. Even when dinner was over and the whole party adjourned to the drawing-room for coffee, and the lady ought, in all conscience, to have given herself wholly up to the entertainment of her guests, it was observable that she devoted most of her time to whispered confidences with Captain Travers, that they kept going to the window and looking up at the sky, as if worried and annoyed that the twilight should be so long in fading, and the night in coming on. But worse than this, at ten o'clock Captain Travers made an excuse of having letters to write, and left the room, and it was scarcely six minutes later that she followed suit. But the captain had not gone to write letters as it had happened. Instead, he had gone straight to the morning-room, an apartment immediately behind that in which the elder Mr. Baudry's collection was housed, and from which a broad French window opened out upon the grounds, and it might have caused a scandal had it been known that Mrs. Baudry joined him there one minute after leaving the drawing-room. "'It is the time, Walter, it is the time,' she said, in a breathless sort of way, as she closed the door and moved across the room to where he stood, a dimly seen figure in the dim light. "'God help and pity me, but I am so nervous, I hardly know how to contain myself. The note said at ten to-night in the morning-room, and it is ten now. The hour is here, Walter. The hour is here. So is the man, Mrs. Baudry, answered a low voice from the outer darkness. Then a figure lifted itself above the screening shrubs just beyond the ledge of the open window, and Cleek stepped into the room. She gave a little hysterical cry and reached out her hands to him. Oh! I am so glad to see you, even though you hint at such awful things. I am so glad, so glad, she said. I almost died when I read your note. To think that it is murder, murder! And but for you he might be dead even now. You will like to know that the doctor brought the stuff you sent by him, brought it at once, and my darling is better, better. Before Cleek could venture any reply to this, Captain Travers stalked across the room and gripped his hand. "'And so you are that great man Cleek, are you?' he said. 
bully boy, bully boy, and to think that all the time it wasn't some mysterious natural affliction, to think that it was crime, murder, poison. What poison, man? What poison? What? I appeal, or as it is variously called in the several islands of the eastern archipelago, Poon Upus, Antia, and Ipo, said Cleek in reply. The deadly venom which the Malays use in poisoning the heads of their arrows. What? That awful stuff? said Mrs. Baudry, with a little shuddering cry. And someone in this house? Her voice broke. She plucked at Cleek's sleeve and looked up at him in an agony of entreaty. Who? she implored. Who in this house could? You said you would tell tonight. You said you would. Oh, who could have the heart? How? Oh, who? It is true, if you have not heard it, that once upon a time there was bad blood between Mr. Murdoch and him, that Mr. Murdoch is a family connection. But even he, oh, even he, tell me, tell me, Mr. Cleek, "'Mrs. Baudry, I can't just yet,' he made reply. "'In my heart I am as certain of it as though the criminal had confessed. "'But I am waiting for a sign, and until that comes absolute proof is not possible. "'That it will come, and may indeed come at any moment now that it is quite dark, I am very certain. "'When it does—' He stopped and threw up a warning hand. As he spoke, a queer thudding sound struck one dull note through the stillness of the house. He stood, bent forward, listening, absolutely breathless. Then, on the other side of the wall, there rippled and rolled a something that was like the sound of a struggle between two voiceless animals, and the sign that he had awaited had come. Follow me. "'Quickly, as noiselessly as you can. "'Let no one hear, let no one see,' he said in a breath of excitement. "'Then he sprang cat-like to the door, whirled it open, "'scudded round the angle of the passage "'to the entrance of the room where the fraudulent collection was kept, "'and went in with the silent fleetness of a panther. "'And a moment later, when Captain Travers and Mrs. Baudry "'swung in through the door and joined him, they came upon a horrifying sight. For there, leaning against the open door of the case where the skeleton of the nine-fingered man hung, was Dollops, bleeding and faint, and with a score of tooth-marks on his neck and throat. And on the floor at his feet, Cleek was kneeling on the writhing figure of a man who bit and tore and snarled like a cornered wolf, and fought with teeth and feet and hands alike, in the wild effort to get free from the grip of destiny. A locked handcuff clamped one wrist, and from it swung at the end of the connecting chain its unlocked mate. The marks of Dollop's fists were on his lips and cheeks, and at the foot of the case where the hanging skeleton doddered and shook to the vibration of the floor lay a shattered file of deep blue glass. "'Got you, you hound!' said Cleek through his teeth, as he wrenched the man's two wrists together and snapped the other handcuff in place. "'You beast of ingratitude! You Judas! Kissing and betraying like any other Iscariot! And a dear old man like that! Look here, Mrs. Baudry! Look here, Captain Travers! What do you think of a little rat like this?' They came forward at his word, and, looking down, saw that the figure he was bending over was the figure of Philip Baudry. "'Oh!' gulped Mrs. Baudry, and then shut her two hands over her eyes, and fell away, weak and shivering. "'Oh, Mr. Cleek! It can't be! It can't! To do a thing like that!' "'Oh, he'd have done worse, the little reptile, if he hadn't been pulled up short,' said Cleek in reply. "'He'd have hanged you for it if it had gone the way he planned. "'You look in your boxes. You too, Captain Travers. 
I'll wager each of you finds a phial of Iope hidden among them somewhere. Came in to put more of the cursed stuff on the ninth finger of the skeleton, so that it would be ready for the next time, didn't he, Dollops? Yes, Governor. I waited for him behind the case, just as you told me to, sir. And when he ups and slips the finger of the skilligan into the neck of the bottle, I nips out and wax the bracelet on him. But he was too quick for me, sir, so I only got one on. And then the hound, he turns on me like a blessed hyena, sir, and begins a chawing of me windpipe. I say, Governor, take off his silver wristlets, will you, sir? And let me have just ten minutes with him on me own. Five for me, sir, and five for his poor old dad. Not I, said Cleek. I wouldn't let you soil those honest hands of yours on his vile little body, Dollops. Thought you had a noodle to deal with, didn't you, Mr. Philip Baudry? Thought you could lead me by the nose and push me into finding those files just where you wanted them found, didn't you? Well, you've got a few more thoughts coming. Look here, Captain Travers. What do you think of this fellow's little game? Tried to take me in about you and Mrs. Baudry being lovers, and trying to do away with him and his father to get the old man's money. Why, the contemptible little hound! Bless my soul, man, I'm engaged to Mrs. Baudry's cousin. And as for his stepmother, why, she threw the little worm over as soon as he began making love to her, and tried to make her take up with him by telling her how much he'd be worth when his father died. I guessed as much. I didn't fancy him from the first moment, and he was so blessed eager to have me begin by suspecting you two that I smelt a rat at once. Ah, but he's been crafty enough in other things. Putting that devilish stuff on the ninth finger of the skeleton, and never losing an opportunity to get his poor old father to handle it and show it to people. It's a strong, irritant poison. Sap of the upas tree is the base of it, producing first an irritation of the skin, then a blister, and when that broke, communicating the poison directly to the blood every time the skeleton hand touched it. A weak solution at first, so that the decline would be natural, the growth of the malady gradual. But if I had found that file in your room last night, as he hoped and believed I had done, "'Well, look for yourself. "'The finger of the skeleton is thick with the beastly gummy stuff tonight. "'Double strength, of course. "'The next time his father touched it, he'd have died before morning. "'And the old chap fairly worshipping him. "'I suspected him, and suspected what the stuff that was being used really was from the beginning. "'Last night I drugged him, and then I knew.' "'Knew, Mr. Cleek. Why, how could you? "'The most virulent poisons have their remedial uses, Captain,' he made reply. "'You can kill a man with strychnine. "'You can put him in his grave with arsenic. "'You can also use both these powerful agents to cure and to save "'in their proper proportions and in the proper way. "'The same rule applies to Iope. Properly diluted and properly used, it is one of the most powerful agents for the relief, and in some cases the cure, of Bright's disease of the kidneys. But the government guards this unholy drug most carefully. You can't get a drop of it in Java for love or money, unless on the order of a recognised physician. And you can't bring it into the ports of England, unless backed by that physician's sworn statement and the official stamp of the Javanese authorities. A man undeniably afflicted with Bright's disease could get these things. No other could. Well, I wanted to know who had succeeded in getting Iope into this country and into this house. Last night I drugged every man in it, and I found out. But how? by finding the one who could not sleep stretched out at full length. One of the strongest symptoms of Bright's disease is a tendency to draw the knees up close to the body in sleep, Captain, and to twist the arms above the head. 
Of all the men under this roof, this man here was the only one who slept like that last night. He paused and looked down at the scowling, sullen creature on the floor. "'You wretched little cur!' he said, with a gesture of unspeakable contempt. "'And all for the sake of an old man's money. "'If I did my duty, I'd jail you. "'But if I did, it would be punishing the innocent for the crimes of the guilty. "'It would kill that dear old man to learn this, "'and so he's not going to learn it, "'and the law's not going to get its own.' "'He twitched out his hand, and something tinkled on the floor. "'Get up!' he said sharply. "'There's the key of the handcuffs. Take it, and set yourself free. Do you know what's going to happen to you? Tomorrow morning Dr. Philipson is going to examine you, and to report that you'll be a dead man in a year's time if you stop another week in this country. You are going out of it, and you are going to stop out of it. Do you understand?' "'Stop out of it to the end of your days. "'For if ever you put your foot in it again, "'I'll handle you as a terrier handles a rat. "'Dollops?' "'Yes, Governor. "'My things packed and ready? "'Yes, sir, and all waiting in the arbour, sir, "'as you told me to have them. "'Good lad. "'Get them, and we'll catch the first train back. "'Mrs. Baudry, my best respects.' "'Captain, all good luck to you,' said Cleek, and swung out into the darkness and the moist, warm fragrance of the night, his mental poise a bit unsteady, his nerves raw. It was not in him to have stopped longer, to have remained under the same roof with a monster like young Baudry, and keep his temper in check. End of chapter 5 Chapter Six of Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces by Thomas W. Hanshu. Chapter Six. The stillness, the balm, the soothing influences of the night worked their own spell and after a time rubbed out the mental wrinkles, and brought a sense of restfulness and peace. It could not well do otherwise with such a nature as his. The night was all a musk with mignonette and roses, the sky all a glitter with stars. A gunshot distant, the river ran, a silver thing ribboning along between the dark of bending trees. Somewhere in the darkness a nightingale shook out the scale of nature's anthem to the listening night, and farther afield others took up the chorus of it, and sang and sang with the sheer joy of living. What a world! God, what a world for parricides to exist in, and for the sons of men to forget the fifth commandment! He walked on faster, and made his way to the arbour where Dollops waited. The boy rose to meet him. "'Everything all ready, Circe?' he said, holding up a kit-bag. "'What's it now, Governor? The railway station? Good enough. Shall I nip off ahead, or keep with you till we get there?' "'Suit yourself, my lad.' "'Thank you, sir. Then I'll walk at your heels, if you don't mind. I'd like to walk at your heels all the rest of my blessed life. Did I carry it off all right, Governor?' Did I do it just as you wanted of it done? Do a tea, my lad, said Cleek, smiling and patting him on the shoulder. You'll do, Dollops, you'll do finely. I think I did a good job for the pair of us, my boy, when I gave you those two half-crowns. Advanced, Governor, advanced, corrected Dollops, with a look of sheer affection. Let me work em off, sir, like you said I might. I don't want nothing but what I earns, Governor, nothing but what I've got a right to have. For when I sees what wanting money as don't belong to you leads to, when I thinks what that young Baudry chap was willing to do for the love of having it, don't, 
struck in Cleek, a trifle roughly. "'Drop the man's name. I can't trust myself to think of it. That the one world, the one self-same world, could hold two such widely dissimilar creations of God as that monster and— No matter. Thank God I've been able to do something tonight for a good woman. I owe so much to another of her kind. No, don't speak. Just walk quietly and— jerking his thumb in the direction of the fluting nightingales. Listen to that. God, the man who could think evil things when a nightingale sings isn't fit to stand even in the devil's presence. Dollops looked at him, half puzzled, half awed. He could not understand the character of the man. There were so many sides to it, and they came and went so oddly. One minute a very brute beast in his ferocity, the next a woman in his tenderness, and a poet in his thoughts. But if the boy was puzzled, he was at least discreet. He put nothing into words, merely walked on in silence, and left the man to his thoughts, and the nightingales to their melody and Cleek was unusually thoughtful from that period onward, speaking hardly a word through all the journey home. For now that the events which had occupied his mind for the past two or three days were over and done with, his memory harked back to those things which had to do with his own affairs, and he caught himself wondering how matters had gone with Ailsa Lorne, which of the two positions, the English one or the French, she had finally elected to apply for, and if time had as yet softened the shock of that disclosure made in the mist and darkness at Hampstead Heath. He had, of course, heard nothing of her since that time, and the days he had spent at Richmond had utterly precluded the possibility of giving himself that small pleasure, so often indulged in, of adopting a safe disguise prowling about the neighbourhood where she lived, until she should come forth upon one errand or another, and then following her unsuspected. That she could have taken the knowledge of what he once had been in no other way than she had done, that to such a woman such a man must, at the first blush, be an object of abhorrence, a thing to be put out of her life as completely and as expeditiously as possible, he fully realised. Yet, at bottom, he was conscious of a hope that time, even so little as had passed, might lend a softening influence that should lead eventually to pity, and from that to a day when the word forgiveness might be spoken. He wanted that forgiveness. The soul of the man needed it, as parched plants need water. He had not climbed up out of himself without some struggle, some moments when he wavered between what he had become and what nature had written that he was meant to be. For no soul is purged all in a moment. No man may conquer himself with just one solitary fight. He needed her forgiveness, the thought of her, the hope of her, to rivet his armour for the long, brave fight. He needed her friendship. If he might never have her love, he needed that. And if she were to pass like this from his life, if the light were to go out, and all the long, dark way of the future still to be faced, something within him seemed to writhe. He took his lower lip between his thumb and forefinger and squeezed it hard. That he had hoped for some token, some word, forwarded through Mr. Narkom, he did not quite realise until he got back to Clarges Street, and found that there was none. Followed a sense of despair, a moment of deep dejection, that passed in turn and gave place to a feeling of personal injury of savage resentment, and of the ferocity which comes when the half-tamed wolf wakes to the realisation that there is nothing before it evermore but the bars of the cage, 
and the goad of the keeper, and that far and away in the world there are still the free woods, the naked body of nature, and the savage company of its kind. Under the stress of that gust of passion, he sent Dollops flying from the room. He wrenched open the drawer of his writing-table, and scooped up in his hands some trifles of faded ribbon and trinkets of gold, things that he treasured, none knew why or for what, and holding them thus, looked down on them and laughed, bitterly and savagely, as though a devil were within him. "'Me! She scorns me!' he said, and laughed again, and flung them all back, and shut the drawer upon them. And presently he knew that he held her all the higher because she did scorn him, because her life was such that she could scorn him. And the bitterness dropped out of him, his eyes softened, and though he still laughed, it was for an utterly different reason, and in a wholly different way. Some pots of tulips and mignonette stood on the ledge of his window. He walked over to see that they were watered before he went to bed, and between the time when he got down on his knees to fish out his bath slippers from beneath the bedstead, and the creak of the springs when he lay down for the night, he was so long and so still that one might have believed he was doing something else. He slept long and rose in the morning soothed and subdued in spirit, better and brighter in every way, for now no affair for the yard hampered his movements and claimed his time. He was free, he was back in the town, beautiful because it contained her, and he might hark back to the old trick of watching and following, and being close to her without her knowledge. It was a vain hope that, however, for, although he dressed and went out and haunted the neighbourhood of Sir Horace Wyvern's house for hours on end, he saw nothing of her that day. Nor did he see her the next, nor the next, nor yet the next again. At first he began to think that she must come out and return during the times when he was obliged to go off guard and get his meal, for he could not bring himself to play the part of the spy or the common policeman and filch news from the servants. But when a week had gone by in this manner, he set all question upon that point at rest by remaining at his post from sunrise to ten o'clock at night. She did not appear. He wondered what that meant, whether it indicated that she had already accepted one of the two positions, or had gone to stop with her friend on the other side of Hampstead Heath. The result of that wondering was that, for the next five days, the gentleman who was known in Clarges Street as Captain Horatio Burbage became a regular visitor to the neighbourhood of the house in Barden Road. The issue was exactly the same. Miss Lorne did not appear. He could no longer doubt that she had accepted one or other of the two positions but steadfastly refrained from making any personal inquiry. She would hear of it if anybody called to inquire her whereabouts, and she would guess who had done it. He would not have her feel that he was thrusting himself upon her, inquiring about her, as one might inquire about a common servant. If it was her will that he should know, then that knowledge should come from her not be picked up as one picks up clues to missing people of the criminal class. So then it was good-bye to Barden Road, just as it had been good-bye to Mayfair. He turned his back upon it in the very moment he came to that conclusion, and had just set his face in the direction of the heath when he was brought to a standstill by the sound of someone calling out sharply, "'Burbage! I say, Captain Burbage! Stop a moment, please!' and screwing round instantly, he saw a red limousine pelting toward him, and an excited chauffeur waving a gloved hand. He knew that red limousine, and he knew that chauffeur. Both belonged to Mr. Maverick Narkom. He stood waiting until the motor was abreast of him, had, in fact, come to a standstill, then spoke in a guarded tone. "'What is it, Leonard?' he asked. "'The yard?' 
"'Yes, sir. Young Dollops told us where to look for you. Hop in quickly, sir. Superintendent inside.' Cleek opened the door of the vehicle at once, stepped in, shut it after him, and sat down beside Mr. Narkom with the utmost composure. "'My dear fellow, I have had a chase,' said the superintendent, with a long, deep breath of relief, as the limousine swung out into the roadway and pelted off westward at a pace that brushed the very fringes of the speed limit. "'I made certain I should find you at home.' fairly floored when I discovered that you weren't. If it hadn't been for that boy Dollops, bright young button, that Dollops, Cleek, exceedingly bright, begad. Yes, agreed Cleek quietly. Bright, faithful, and inventive. Really? What has the young beggar invented, then? An original appliance which may possibly be of a good deal of service one of these days. "'But never mind that at present. "'It is fair to suppose from your rushing out here in quest of me "'that you've got something on hand, isn't it?' "'Yes, rather. An amazing something, old chap. "'It's a letter. Arrived at headquarters about an hour and a half ago. "'Not an affair for the yard this time, Cleek, "'but a thing you must take up on your own, if you take it up at all. "'And I tell you frankly, I don't like it. Why? "'For one thing, it's from Paris, and, well, you know what dangers Paris would have for you. "'There's that she-devil you broke with, that woman Margot. "'You know what she swore, what she wrote when you sent her that letter "'telling her that you were done with her and her lot, "'and warning her never to set foot on English soil again. "'If you were to run foul of her, "'if she were ever to get any hint of your real identity,' "'She can't. She knows no more of my real history than you do. "'No more than I actually know of hers. "'Our knowledge of each other began when we started to howl together. "'It ended when we split eighteen months ago. "'But about that letter, what is it? "'Why do you say that you don't like it?' "'Well, to begin with, I'm afraid it is some trap of hers to decoy you over there, "'get you into some unknown place.' "'There are no unknown places in Paris, so far as I'm concerned. "'I know every hole and corner of it from the sewers on. "'I know it as well as I know London, "'as well as I know Berlin, New York, Vienna, Edinburgh, Rome. "'You couldn't lose me or trap me in any one of them. "'Is that the letter in your hand? "'Good, then read it, please. "'To the Superintendent of Police, Scotland Yard.' read narkom obeying the request distinguished monsieur of your grace and pity i implore you to listen to the prayer of an unhappy man whose honour whose reason whose very life are in deadly peril not alone of the red crawl but of things he may not even name dare not commit to writing lest this letter should go astray it shall happen, monsieur, that the whole world shall hear with amazement of that most marvellous clique, that great reader of riddles and unmasker of evildoers, who in the past year has made the police department of England the envy of all nations. And it shall happen also that I, who dare not appeal to the police of France, appeal to the mercy the humanity of this great man, as it is my only hope. Monsieur, you have his ear, you have his confidence, you have the means at your command. Ah, ask him, pray him, implore him, for the love of God, and for the sake of a fellow man, to come alone to the top floor of the house number seven of the Rue Toison d'Or, Paris at nine hours of the night of Friday the 26th inst, to enter into the darkness and say but the one word, Cleek, as a signal it is he, and I may come forward and throw myself upon his mercy. Oh, save me, Monsieur Cleek, save me, save me. There, that's the lot, and there's no signature. 
said Narkom, laying down the letter. What do you make of it, Cleek? End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces by Thomas W. Hanshu Chapter 7 A very real, a very moving thing, Mr. Narkom he replied. The cry of a human heart in deep distress. The agonised appeal of a man so wrought up by the horrors of his position that he forgets to offer a temptation in the way of reward, and speaks of outlandish things as though they must be understood of all, as witness his allusion to something which he calls the Red Crawl, without attempting to explain the meaningless phrase. Whatever it is, it is so real to him that it seems as if everybody must understand. You think, then, that the thing is genuine? So genuine that I shall answer its call, Mr. Narkom, and be alone in the dark on the top floor of number 7, Rue Toison d'Or, tomorrow night, as surely as the clock strikes nine. And that was how the few persons who happened to be in the quiet upper reaches of the Rue Bienfaisance at half-past eight o'clock the next evening came to see a fat, fussing, red-faced Englishman in a grey frock-coat, white spats, and a shining topper, followed by a liveried servant with a hat-box in one hand and a portmanteau in the other, so conspicuous the pair of them that they couldn't have any desire to conceal themselves cross over the square before the church of St. Augustine, fare forth into the darker side-passages, and move in the direction of the street of the Golden Fleece. They were, of course, Cleek and the boy Dollops. "'Lummy, Governor!' whispered he, as they turned at last into the utter darkness and desertion of the narrow Rue Toison d'Or. "'If this is what you calls gay Paris, this precious black slip between two rows of houses, I'll take a slice of the old Kent road with thanks. Not even so much as a winkle stall in sight, and me that empty my shirt bosoms are chafing my blessed shoulder blades. You'll see plenty of life before the game's over, I warrant you, Dollops. Now then, my lad, here's a safe spot. Sit down on the hat box and wait. That's number seven that empty house with the open door just across the way. Keep your eye on it. I don't know how long I'll be, but if anybody comes out before I do, mind you don't let him get away. No fear, said Dollops sententiously. I'll be after him as if he was a ham sandwich, sir. Look out for my patent tickle tootsies when you come out, Governor. I'll sneak over and put em round the door as soon as you've gone in. For Dollops, who was of an inventive turn of mind, had an especial man-trap of his own, which consisted of heavy brown paper cut into squares, and thickly smeared over with a viscid, varnish-like substance that would adhere to the feet of anybody incautiously stepping upon it, and so interfere with flight that it was an absolute necessity to stop and tear the papers away before running with any sort of ease and swiftness was possible. This was the invention to which Cleek had alluded. Dollops, who was rather proud of the achievement, carried with him a full supply of ready-cut papers and a big collapsible tube of the viscid, ropey, varnish-like glue. Meantime, Cleek, having left the boy sitting on the hat-box in the darkness, crossed the narrow street to the open doorway of number 7, and without hesitation stepped in. The place was as black as a pocket, and had that peculiar smell which belongs to houses that have long stood vacant. The house nevertheless was a respectable one, and like all the others, fronted on another street, this dark toison d'or being merely a back passage, used principally by the tradespeople for the delivery of supplies. Feeling his way to the first of the three flights of stairs which led upward into the stillness and gloom above, Cleek mounted steadily until he found himself at length in a sort of attic, quite windowless, 
and lit only by a skylight through which shone the ineffectual light of the stars. It was the top at last. Bracing his back against the wall, so that nobody could get behind him, and holding himself ready for any emergency, he called out in a clear, calm voice, Cleek! Almost simultaneously there was a sharp, metallic snick, an electric bulb hanging from the ceiling flamed out luminously, a cupboard door flashed open, a voice cried out in joyous, perfect English, "'Thank God for a man!' and switching round with a cry of amazement, he found himself looking into the face and eyes of a woman, and of all women in the world, Elsa Lorne. He sucked in his breath, and his heart began to hammer. "'Miss Lorne!' he exclaimed, so carried out of himself that he scarcely knew what he did. "'It was the French position that you chose, then. It is you, you, that calls upon me?' "'No, it is not,' she made reply, a rush of colour reddening her cheeks, a feeling of embarrassment and of a natural restraint making her shake visibly. "'I am merely the envoy of another. I should not know you, disguised as you are, but for that. Yes, I chose the French position, as you see, Mr. Cleek. I am now the companion to Mademoiselle Athalie daughter of the Baron de Carjorac. Baron de Carjorac? Do you mean the French Minister of the Interior, the President of the Board of National Defences, Miss Lorne? That enthusiastic old patriot, that rabid old spitfire, whose one dream is the resting back of Alsace-Lorraine, the driving of the hated Germans into the sea? Do you mean that ripping old firebrand? Yes, but you'd not call him that if you were to see him now. If you could see the wreck, the broken and despairing wreck, that six weeks of the Chateau La Rouge, six weeks of that horrible red crawl, have made of him. The red crawl? Good heavens! Then that letter, that appeal for help, came from him, she finished excitedly. It was he who was to have met you here to-night, Mr. Cleek. This house is one he owns. He thought he might with safety risk coming here. But he can't. He can't. He knows now that there is danger for him everywhere, that his every step is tracked, that the snare which is about him has been about him unsuspected for almost a year, that he dare not, absolutely dare not, appeal to the French police and that, if it were known he had appealed to you, he would be a dead man inside of twenty-four hours, and not only dead, but disgraced. Oh, Mr. Cleek! She stretched out two shaking hands and laid them on his arm, lifted a white, imploring face to his. Save him! Save that dear broken old man! Ah! Oh, think! Think! They are our friends! Our dear country's friends, these French people. Their welfare is our welfare. Ours is theirs. Oh, help him, save him, Mr. Cleek, for his own sake, for mine, for France. Save him and win my gratitude for ever. That is a temptation that would carry me to the ends of the earth, Miss Lorne. Tell me what the work is, and I will carry it through. What is this incomprehensible thing of which both you and Baron de Carjorac have spoken, this thing you allude to as the Red Crawl? She gave a little shuddering cry, and fell back a step, covering her face with both hands. Oh, she said with a shiver of repulsion, it is loathly, it is horrible, it is necromancy beyond belief. Why? Oh, why were we ever driven to that horrible Chateau La Rouge? Why could not fate have spared the Villa de Carjorac? It could not have happened then. Villa de Carjorac? That was the name of the Baron's residence, I believe. I remember reading in the newspapers some five or six weeks ago that it was destroyed by fire, which originated, nobody knew how, in the apartments of the late baroness, in the very dead of the night. 
I thought at the time it read suspiciously like the work of an incendiary, although nobody hinted at such a thing. The Chateau La Rouge I also have a distinct memory of, as an old historic property in the neighbourhood of St. Cloud. Speaking from past experience, I know that, although it is in such a state of decay, and supposed to be uninhabitable, it has, in fact, often been occupied, at a period when the police and the public believed it to be quite empty. Gentlemen of the Apache persuasion have frequently made it a place of retreat. There is also an underground passage, executed by those same individuals, which connects with the Paris sewers. That, too, the police are unaware of. What can the ruined Chateau La Rouge possibly have to do with the affairs of the Baron de Cajarac, Miss Lorne, that you connect them like this? They have everything to do with them, everything. The chateau is no longer a ruin, however. It was purchased, rebuilt, refitted by the Comtesse Suzanne de la Tour, Mr. Cleek, and she and her brother live there. So do we. Atelier, Baron de Cajarac, and I. So also does the creature, the thing, the abominable horror known as the Red Crawl. My dear Miss Lorne, what are you saying? The truth, nothing but the truth, she answered hysterically. Oh, let me begin at the beginning. You'll never understand unless I do. I'll tell you in as few words as possible as quickly as I can. It all began last winter, when Atelier and her father were at Monte Carlo. There they met Madame la Comtesse de la Tour and her brother, Monsieur Gaston Merode. The Baron has position, but he has not wealth, Mr. Cleek. Atelier is ambitious. She loves luxury, riches, a life of fashion, all the things that boundless money can give. And when Monsieur Merode who is young, handsome, and said to be fabulously wealthy, showed a distinct preference for her over all the other marriageable girls he met. She was flattered out of her silly wits. Before they left Monte Carlo for Paris, everybody could see that he had only to ask her hand to have it bestowed upon him. For although the Baron never has cared for the man, utterly rules him, and her every caprice is humoured. But for all he was so ardent a lover, Monsieur Maraud was slow in coming to the important point. Perhaps his plans were not matured. At any rate, he did not propose to Atelier at Monte Carlo, and although he and his sister returned to Paris at the same time as the Baron and his daughter, he still deferred the proposal. Has he not made it yet? Yes, Mr. Cleek. He made it six weeks ago, to be exact, two nights before the Villa de Cajarac was fired. You think it was fired, then? I do now, although I had no suspicion of it at the time. Athalie received her proposal on the Saturday, the Baron gave his consent on the Sunday, and on Monday night the Villa was mysteriously burnt, leaving all three of us without an immediate refuge. In the meantime, Madame la Comtesse had purchased the ruin of the Chateau La Rouge, and during the period of her brother's deferred proposal, was engaged in fitting it up as an abode for herself and him. On the very day it was finished, Monsieur Maraud asked for Atelier's hand. Uh huh, said Cleek, with a strong rising inflection. I think I begin to smell the toasting of the cheese. Of course, when the villa was burnt out, Madame la Comtesse insisted that, as the fiancée of her brother, Mademoiselle de Cajorac must make her home at the chateau, until the necessary repairs could be completed, and, of course, the Baron had to go with her. Yes, admitted Elsa. The Baron accepted. Athalie would not have allowed him to decline had he wished to, so we all three went there and have been residing there ever since. On the night after our arrival, an alarming, a horrifying thing occurred. It was while we were at dinner that the conversation turned upon the supernatural, upon houses and places that were reputed to be haunted, 
and then Madame la Comtesse made a remarkable statement. She laughingly asserted that she had just learned that, in purchasing the Chateau La Rouge, she had also become the possessor of a sort of family ghost. She said that she had only just heard, from an outside source, that there was a horrible legend connected with the place. In short, that for centuries it had been reputed to be under a sort of spell of evil, and to be cursed by a dreadful visitant known as the Red Crawl, a hideous and loathsome creature, neither spider nor octopus, but horribly resembling both, which was supposed to appear at intervals in the middle of the night, and, like the fabled giants of fairy tales, carry off lovely maidens and devour them. "'Who is responsible for that ridiculous assertion, I wonder? "'I think I may say that I know as much about the Chateau La Rouge "'and its history as anybody, Miss Lorne, "'but I never heard of this supposed legend before in all my life.' "'So the Baron, too, declared, "'laughing as derisively as any of us over the story, "'although it is well known that he has a natural antipathy "'to all crawling things.' an abhorrence inherited from his mother, and has been known to run like a frightened child from the appearance of a mere garden spider. "'Aho!' said Cleek again. "'I see, I see. The toasted cheese smells stronger, and there's a distinct suggestion of the Rhine about it this time. There's something decidedly German about that fabulous monster and that haunted chateau, Miss Lorne. They are clever and careful schemers, those German Johnnies. Of course, this amazing red crawl was proved to have an absolute foundation in fact, and equally, of course, it appeared to the Baron de Carjorac. Yes, that very night. After we had all gone to bed, the house was roused by his screams. Everybody rushed to his chamber, only to find him lying on the floor in a state of collapse. The thing had been in his room, he said. He had seen it. It had even touched him. A horrible, hideous red reptile, with squirming tentacles, a huge, glowing body, and eyes like flame. It had crept upon him out of the darkness. He knew not from where. It had seized him, resisted all his wild efforts to tear loose from it, and when he finally sank, overcome and fainting, upon the floor, his last conscious recollection was of the loathsome thing settling down upon his breast and running its squirming feelers up and down his body. Of course, of course, that was part of the game. It was after something, something of the utmost importance to German interests. That's why the Chateau La Rouge was refitted, why the Villa de Cajorac was burnt down, and why this Monsieur Gaston Merode became engaged to Mademoiselle Attali. Oh, how could you know that, Mr. Cleek? Nobody ever suspected. The Baron never confessed to any living soul until he did so to me to-day, and then only because he had to tell somebody in order that the appointment with you might be kept. How, then, could you guess? By putting two and two together, Miss Lorne, and discovering that they do not make five. The inference is very clear. Baron de Cajorac is president of the Board of National Defences. Germany, in spite of its public assurances to the contrary, is known by those who are on the inside to harbour a very determined intention of making a secret attack, an unwarned invasion, upon England. France is the key to the situation. If, without the warning that must come through the delay of picking a quarrel and entering into an open war with the Republic, the German army can swoop down in the night, cross the frontier, and gain immediate possession of the ports of France. In five hours' time it can be across the English Channel, and its hordes pouring down upon a sleeping people. To carry out this programme, 
the first step would, of course, be to secure knowledge of the number, location, manner of the secret defences of France, the plans of fortification, the maps of the danger zone, the documentary evidence of her strongest and weakest points, and who so likely to be the guardian of these as the Baron de Cajorac. That is how I know that the Red Crawl was after something of vital importance to German interests, Miss Lorne. That he got it, I know from the fact that the Baron, while hinting at disgrace and speaking of peril to his own life, dared not confide in the French authorities and ask the assistance of the French police. Moreover, if the Red Crawl had failed to secure anything, the Baron, with his congenital loathing of all crawling things, would have left the Chateau La Rouge immediately. Oh, to think that you guessed it so easily, and it was all such a puzzle to me. I could not think, Mr. Cleek, why he did remain, why he would not be persuaded to go, although every night was adding to the horror of the thing, and it seemed clear to me that he was going mad. Of course, Madame la Comtesse and her brother tried to reason him out of what he declared, tried to make him believe that it was all fancy, that he did not really see the fearful thing. It was equally in vain that I myself tried to persuade him to leave the place before his reason became unsettled. Last night— She paused, shuddered, put both hands over her face, and drew in a deep breath. Last night— I, too, saw the Red Crawl, Mr. Cleek. I, too. You, Miss Lorne? Yes. I made up my mind that I would, that, if it existed, I would have absolute proof of it. The Countess and her brother had scoffed so frequently, had promised the Baron so often that they would set a servant on guard in the corridor to watch, and then had said so often to poor— foolish, easily persuaded utterly that it was useless doing anything so silly, as it was absolutely certain that her father only imagined the thing, that I—I I determined to take the step myself, unknown to any of them. After everybody had gone to bed, I threw on a loose dark gown, crept into the corridor, and hid in a niche from which I could see the door of the Baron's room. I waited until after midnight— long after. And then, and then— Calm yourself, Miss Lorne. Then the thing appeared, I suppose. Yes, but not before something equally terrible had happened. I saw the door of the Countess's room open. I saw the Countess herself come out, accompanied by the man who, up till then, I had believed, like everybody else, was her brother. "'And who is not her brother after all?' "'No, he is not. Theirs is a closer tie. I saw her kiss him. I saw her go with him to an angle of the corridor, lift a rug, and raise a trap in the floor.' "'Hello, hello!' ejaculated Cleek. "'Then she, too, knows of the passage which leads to the sewers.' "'Clearly, then, this Countess de la Tour is not what she seems, "'when she knows secrets that are known only to the followers of— "'Well, never mind. "'Go on, Miss Lorne, go on. "'You saw her lift that trap, and what then?' "'Then there came up out of it— "'Oh, the most loathsome-looking creature I ever saw! "'A huge, crawling, red shape! that was like a blood-red spider, with the eyes, the hooked beak, and the writhing tentacles of an octopus. It made no sound, but it seemed to know her, to understand her, for when she waved her hand toward the open door of her own room, it crawled away, and, obeying that gesture, dragged its huge bulk over the threshold, and passed from sight. Then the man she called her brother kissed her again, and as he descended into the darkness below the trap, I heard her say quite distinctly, "'Tell Maurice that I will come as soon as I can, 
but not to delay the revel. If I am compelled to forego it to-night, there shall be a wilder one to-morrow, when Clodoche arrives. Clodoche! By Jupiter! Cleek almost jumped as he spoke. Now I know the lay. No, don't ask me anything yet. Go on with the story, please. What then, Miss Lorne? What then? Then the man below said something which I could not hear, something to which she answered in these words, No, no, there is no danger. I will guard it safely, and it shall go into no hands but Clodoche's. He and Count von Hetzler will be there about midnight to-morrow, to complete the deal and pay over the money. Clodoche will want the fragment, of course, to show to the Count as a proof that it is the right one as an earnest of what the remainder is worth. And you must bring me that remainder without fail, Gaston. You hear me? Without fail. I shall be there at the rendezvous, awaiting you, and the thing must be in our hands when von Hetzler comes. The thing must be finished to-morrow night, even if you and Serpice have to throw all caution to the winds and throttle the old fool. Then, as if answering a further question, she laughingly added, Oh, get that fear out of your head. I'm not a bat to be caught napping. I'll give it to no one but Clodoche, and not even to him, until he gives the secret sign. And then, Mr. Cleek, as she closed the trap, I heard the man call back to her good night, and give her a name I had not heard before. We had always supposed that she had been christened Suzanne, but as that man left, he called her— I know before you tell me. Margot, interjected Cleek, I guessed the identity of this Countess de la Tour from the moment you spoke of Clodoche and that secret trap. Her knowledge of those two betrayed her to me. Clodoche is a renegade Alsatian, a spy in the pay of the German government, and an old habitué of the inn of the Twisted Arm, where the Queen of the Apaches and her pals hold their frequent revels. I can guess the remainder of your story now. You carried this news to the Baron de Cajorac, and he, breaking down, confessed to you that he had lost something. Yes, yes, a dreadful something, Mr. Cleek. The horrible thing that has been making life an agony to him ever since. On the night when that abominable red crawl first overcame him, there was upon his person a most important document, a rough draft of the maps of fortification and the plan of the secret defences of France, the identical document from which was afterwards transcribed the parchment now deposited in the secret archives of the Republic. When Baron de Cajorac recovered his senses, after his horrifying experience, that document was gone. Part of it, Mr. Cleek, thank God, only a part. If it had been the parchment itself, no such merciful thing could possibly have happened. But the paper was old, much folding and handling had worn the creases through, and when in his haste the secret robber grabbed it, whilst that loathsome creature held the old man down, it parted directly down the middle, and he got to only a vertical section of each of its many pages. "'Victoria! And the fool hath said in his heart, "'There is no God,' quoted Cleek. "'So, then, the hirelings of the enemy have only got half what they are after, "'and as no single sentence can be complete upon a paper torn like that, "'nothing can be made of it until the other half is secured, "'and our German friends are still up a gum-tree.' I know now why the Baron stayed on at the Chateau La Rouge, and why the Red Crawl is preparing to pay him another visit to-night. He hoped, poor chap, to find a clue to the whereabouts of the fragment he had lost. And that thing is after the fragment he still retains. Well, it will be a long, long day before either of those two fragments fall into German hands. "'Oh, Mr. Cleek, you think you can get the stolen paper back? "'Do you believe you can outwit those dreadful people "'and save the Baron de Cajorac's honour and his life?' 
Miss Lorne. He took her hand in his, and lifted it to his lips. Miss Lorne, I thank you for giving me the chance. If you will do what I ask you, be where I ask you in two hours' time, so surely as we two stand here this minute, I will put back the German calendar by ten years at least. They drink to the day, those German Johnnies, but by to-morrow morning the English hand you are holding will have given them reason to groan over the night. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding.《Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces by Thomas W. Hanshu. Chapter Eight. It was half past eleven o'clock. Madame la Comtesse, answering a reputed call to the bedside of a dying friend, had departed early and was not to be expected back, she said, until to-morrow noon. The servants, given permission by the gentleman known in the house as Monsieur Gaston Merod, and who had graciously provided a huge charabin for the purpose, had gone in a body to a fair over in the neighbourhood of Sèvres, and darkness and stillness filled the long broad corridor of the Chateau La Rouge. Of a sudden, however, a mere thread of sound wavered through the silence, and from the direction of Miss Lorne's room a figure in black, with feet muffled in thick woollen stockings, padded to an angle of the passage, lifted a trap carefully hidden beneath a huge tiger-skin rug, and almost immediately Cleek's head rose up out of the gap. "'Thank God you managed to do it! I was horribly afraid you would not!' said Ailsa, in a palpitating whisper. "'You need not have been,' he answered. "'I know a dozen places beside the inn of the twisted arm from which one can get into the sewers. I've screwed a bolt and socket on the inner side of this trap in case of an emergency, and I've carried a few things into the passage for afterwards. I suppose that fellow Merode, as he calls himself, is in his room waiting?' "'Yes, and although he pretends to be alone to-night, he—' He has other men with him, hideous, ruffianly-looking creatures, whom I saw him admit after the servants had gone. The Countess has left the house and gone I don't know where. I do, then. Make certain she's at the twisted arm, waiting first for the coming of Clodoche, and second for the arrival of this precious Merode with the remaining half of the document. I've sent Dollops there to carry out his part of the programme, and when once I get the password Margot requires before she will hand over the paper, the game will be in my hands entirely. They are desperate to-night, Miss Lorne, and will stop at nothing, not even murder. There, the rug's replaced. Quick, lead me to the Baron's room. There's not a minute to waste. She took his hand and led him tiptoe through the darkness, and in another moment he was in the Baron de Carcherac's presence. "'Oh, monsieur, God for ever bless you!' exclaimed the broken old man, throwing himself on his knees before Cleek. "'Out with the light! Out with the light!' exclaimed he, ducking down suddenly. "'Were you mad to keep it burning till I came with that?' pointing to a huge bay window opening upon a balcony. "'Uncurtained, and the grounds no doubt alive with spies!' Miss Lorne sprang to the table where the Baron's reading-lamp stood, jerked the cord of the extinguisher, and darkness enveloped the room, darkness tempered only by the faint gleams of the moon streaming over the balcony and through the panes of the uncurtained window. Cleek, on his knees beside the kneeling Baron, whipped a tiny electric torch from his pocket, and, shielding its flare with his scooped hands, flashed it upon the old man's face. "'Simple as rolling off a log, exactly like your pictures,' he commented. "'I'll do you as easily as I do Clodoche, and I could do him in the dark from memory. Quick! 
snicking off the light of the electric torch and rising to his feet. "'Into your dressing-room, Baron. I want that suit of clothes. I want that ribbon, that cross, and I want them at once. You're a bit thicker set than me, but I've got my clodoche rig on underneath this, and it will fill out your coat admirably and make us as like as two peas.' "'Give me five minutes, Miss Lorne, and I promise you a surprise.' He flashed out of sight with the Baron as he ceased speaking, and Ailsa, creeping to the window and peering cautiously out, was startled presently by a voice at her elbow, saying, in a tone of extreme agitation, "'Oh, mademoiselle, I fear, even yet I fear, that this anglais monsieur attempts too much, and that the papier is gone for ever.' "'Oh, no, Baron, no,' she soothed, as she laid a solicitous hand upon his arm. "'Do believe in him. Do have faith in him. Ah, if only you knew!' "'Thanks. I reckon I shall pass muster,' interposed Cleek's voice, and it was only then she realised. "'You'll find the Baron in the other room, Miss Lorne, looking a little grotesque in that grey suit of mine. In with you, quickly.' "'Go with him through the other door and get below before these fellows begin to stir. "'Get out of the house as quietly and as expeditiously as you can. "'With God's help, I'll meet you at the Hôtel du Louvre in the morning, "'and put the missing fragment in the Baron's hands.' "'And may God give you that help,' she answered fervently, "'as she moved towards the dressing-room door. Oh, "'What a man! What a man!' Then, in a twinkling, she was gone, and Cleek stood alone in the silent room. Giving her and the Baron time to get clear of the other one, he went in on tiptoe, locked the door through which they had passed, put the key in his pocket, and returned. Going to the door which led from the main room into the corridor, he took the key from the lock of that, too, replacing it upon the outer side and leaving the door itself slightly ajar. "'Now, then, for you, Mr. The Red Crawl,' he said, as he walked to the Baron's table, and, sinking down into a deep chair beside it, leaned back with his eyes closed as if in sleep, and the faint light of the moon half revealing his face. "'I want that password, and I'll get it if I have to choke it out of your devil's throat. And she said that she would be grateful to me all the rest of her life. Only grateful, I wonder, is nothing else possible. What a good, good thing a real woman is. How long was it that he had been reclining there waiting before his strained ears caught the sound of something like the rustling of silk, shivering through the stillness, and he knew that at last it was coming. It might have been ten minutes, it might have been twenty, he had no means of determining, when he caught that first movement, and, peering through the slit of a partly opened eye, saw the appalling thing drag its huge bulk along the balcony, and, with squirming tentacles writhing, slide over the low sill of the window and settle down in a glowing red heap upon the floor. And, fake though he knew it to be, he could not repress a swift rush and prickle of goose-flesh at sight of it. For a few seconds it lay dormant, then one red feeler shot out, then another and another, and it began to edge its way across the carpet to the chair. Cleek lay still and waited, his heavy breathing sounding regularly, his head thrown back, his limp hands lying loosely, palms upward beside him. And nearer and nearer crept the loathsome red glowing thing. It crawled to his feet, and still he was quiet. It slid first one tentacle, and then another, over his knees and up toward his breast, and still he made no movement. Then, 
as it rose higher, rose until its hideous beaked countenance was close to his own, his hands flashed upward and clamped together like a vice, clamped on a palpitating human throat. And in the twinkling of an eye the tentacles were wrapped about him, and he and the red crawl were rolling over and over on the floor and battling together. Serpice, you low-bred hound, I know you, he whispered as they struggled. You can't utter a cry, you shan't utter a cry to bring help. I'll throttle you, you beastly renegade, that's willing to sell his own country. Throttle you, do you hear, before you shall bring any of your mates to their rescue. Oh, you've not got a weak old man to fight with this time. Do you know me? It's the cracksman. The cracksman who went over to the police. If you doubt it, now that we're in the moonlight, look up and see my face. Oh, you recognise me, I see. Well, you will die looking at me, you dog, if you deny me what I'm after. I'll loosen my grip enough for you to whisper, and no more. Now, what's the password that Clodoche must give to Margot tonight at the Twisted Arm? Tell me what it is. If you want your life, tell me what it is. I'll see you dead first, came in a whisper from beneath the hideous mask. Then, as Cleek's fingers clamped tight again, and the battle began anew, one long, thin arm shot out from amongst the writhing tentacles, one clutching hand gripped the leg of the table, and with a wrench and a twist brought it crashing to the ground, with a sound that a deaf man might have heard. And in an instant there was pandemonium. A door flung open, and clashing heavily against the wall sent an echo reeling along the corridor. Then came a clatter of rushing feet. A voice cried out excitedly, "'Come on! Come on! He's had to kill the old fool to get it!' And Cleek had just time to tear loose from the shape with which he was battling, and dodge out of the way when the man Merode lurched into the room with half a dozen Apaches tumbling in at his heels. "'Serpice!' he cried, rushing forward, as he saw the gasping red shape upon the floor. "'Serpice! Mon Dieu! What is it?' "'The cracksman!' he gulped. "'Cleek! The cracksman who went against us! Catch him! Stop him!' "'The cracksman!' howled out Merode, twisting round in the darkness and reaching blindly for the haft of his dirk. "'Nom de Dieu! Where?' and almost before the last word was uttered, a fist like a sledgehammer shot out, caught him full in the face, and he went down with a whole smithy of sparks flashing and hissing before his eyes. "'There,' answered Cleek, as he bowled him over. "'Gentlemen of the sewers, my compliments. You'll make no shortcut to the twisted arm to-night.' Then, like something shot from a catapult, he sprang to the door, whisked through it, banged it behind him, turned the key, and went racing down the corridor like a hare. "'It must be sheer luck now,' he panted, as he reached the angle, and kicking aside the rug, pulled up the trap. "'They'll have that door down in a brace of shakes, and be after me like a pack of ravening wolves. The race is to the swift this time, gentlemen, and you'll have to take a long way round if you mean to head me off.' Then he passed down into the darkness, closed the trap-door after him, shot into its socket the bolt he had screwed there, flashed up the light of his electric torch, and, without the password, turned toward the sewers, and ran, and ran, and ran. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces by Thomas W. Hanshu. Chapter Nine. It lacked but a minute of the stroke of twelve, and the revels at the twisted arm, wild at all times, but wilder to-night than ever were at their noisiest and most exciting pitch. And why not? 
it was not often that Margot could spend a whole night with her rapscallion crew, and she had been here since early evening, was to remain here until the dawn broke grey over the housetops, and the murmurs of the workaday world awoke anew in the streets of the populous city. It was not often that each man and each abandoned woman present knew to a certainty that he or she would go home through the mists of the grey morning with a fistful of gold that had been won without labour or the taking of any personal risk. And to-night the half of four hundred thousand francs was to be divided among them. No wonder they had made a carnival of it and tricked themselves out in gala attire. No wonder they had brought a paste tiara and crowned Margot. Margot, who was in flaming red to-night, and looked a devil's daughter indeed, with her fire-like sequins and her red ankles twinkling, as she threw herself into the thick of the dance, and kicked and whirled and flung her bare arms about to the lilt of the music and the fluting of her own happy laughter. "'Per Bacco, the devil's in hell to-night!' grinned old Marise, the innkeeper, from her place behind the bar, where the lid of the sewer-trap opened. "'She has not been like it since the cracksman broke with her, Toinette. But that was before your time, ma fille. Mother of the heavens, but there was a man for you. There was a king that was worthy of such a queen. Name of disaster that she could not hold him, that the curse of virtue sapped such a splendid tree, and that she could take up with another after him. Why not? cried Toinette, as she tossed down the last half of her absinthe and twitched her flower-crowned head. A kingdom must have a king, ma mère, and Dieu, but he is handsome, this Monsieur Gaston Merod. And if he carries out his part of the work to-night, he will be worthy of the homage of all. "'If he carries it out, if!' exclaimed Marise, with a lurch of the shoulders and a flirt of her pudgy hand. "'Soul of me, that's where the difference lies. Had it been the cracksman, there would have been no if. It were done as surely as he attempted it. Name of misfortune! I had gone into a nunnery had I lost such a man. But she— The voice of Margot shrilled out and cut into her words. Absent, Marie, absent for them all, and set the score down to me she cried. Drink up, my bonny boys, drink up, my loyal maids, drink, drink till your skins will hold no more. No one pays to-night but me. They broke into a cheer, and bearing down in a body upon Marie's threw her into a fever of haste to serve them. To Margot, they shouted, catching up the glasses and lifting them high. Vive la reine des Apaches! Vive la compagnie! To Margot! To Margot! She swept them a merry bow, threw them a laughing salute, and drank the toast with them. Messieurs, my love, mesdames et mademoiselles, my admiration! she cried with a ripple of joy mad laughter. To the success of the Apaches, to the glory of four hundred thousand francs, and to the quick arrival of Sir Pete and Gaston. Then, her upward glance catching sight of the musicians sipping their absinthe in the little gallery above, she flung her empty glass against the wall behind them, and shook with laughter as they started in alarm and spilled the green poison when they dodged aside. "'Another dance, you dawdlers!' she cried. "'Does Marise pay you to sit there like mourners? "'Strike up, you mummies, or you pay yourselves for what you drink to-night. "'Soul of desire!' "'As the musicians grabbed up their instruments, "'and a leaping, lilting, quick-beating air went rollicking out over the hubbub. "'A quadrille, you angels of inspiration!' "'Partners, gentlemen, partners, ladies, a quadrille, a quadrille!' 
they set up a many-throated cheer and flocked out with her upon the floor, and in one instant feet were flying, skirts were whirling, laughter and jest mingling with waving arms and kicking toes, and the whole place was in one mad riot of delirious joy. And in the midst of this there rolled up suddenly a voice crying as from the bowels of the earth, Hola, hola, la, la, loi! The cry of the Apache to his kind. Mother of delight, it is one of us, and it comes from the sewer passage, from the sewer, shrilled out Marie's, as the dancers halted, and Margot ran with fleet steps towards the bar. Listen, listen, they come to you, Margot, Serpice and Gaston, the work is done. And before even Clodoche or von Hetzler have arrived, she replied excitedly, give them light, give them welcome, be quick. Marie's ducked down, loosened the fastenings of the trap door, flung it back, and, leaning over the gap with a light in her hand, called down into the darkness, Hola, hola, la, la, loi, come on, comrades, come on. The caller obeyed instantly. A hand reached up and gripped the edge of the flooring, and out of the darkness into the light, emerged the figure of a man in a leather cap and the blue blouse of a mechanic, a pale fox-faced, fox-eyed fellow, with lank fair hair, a brush of ragged yellow beard, and with the look and air of the sneak and spy indelibly branded upon him. It was Cleek. Clodoche! exclaimed Marise, falling back in surprise. Clodoche! echoed Margot. Clodoche, and from the sewers? Yes, why not? he answered, his tongue thick bird with the accent of Alsace, his shifting eyes flashing toward the huge window behind the bar, where in the moonlight the narrow passage leading down to the door of the twisted arm gaped evilly between double rows of scowling, thief-sheltering houses. "'Name of the fiend is this a welcome you give the bringer of fortune, Margot?' "'But from the sewer,' she repeated, "'it is incomprehensible, cher ami. "'You were to pilot von Etzler over from the Café du Pain to the square beyond there,' "'pointing to the window. "'To leave him waiting a moment while you came on to see if it was safe for him to enter. "'And now you come from the sewer.' from the opposite direction entirely. Mother of misfortunes, you had done the same yourself, you Lantier, you Clopin, you Cadrousse, any of you had you been in my boots, he made answer. I stole a leaf from your own book earlier in the evening, garroted a fellow with jewels on him in the Rue Noire, near the market-place, and nearly got into the stone bottle for doing it. He was a decoy, set there by the police for some of you fellows, and there was a sergeant de ville after me like a whirlwind. I was not fool enough to turn the chase in this direction, so I doubled and twisted until it was safe to dive into the tavern of Fouchard, and lay in hiding there. Fouchard let his son carry a message to the Count for me, and will guide him to the square. When it grew near the time to come, Fouchard let me down into the sewer passage from there. Get on with your dance. Silence is always suspicious. An absent, Marise. Have Gaston and Serpice arrived yet with the rest of the document, Margot la Reine? Not yet, she answered. But one may expect them at any minute. Where is the fragment we already possess? Here tapping her bodice and laughing. Tenderly shielded, mon ami. And why not? Who would not mother a thing that is to bring one four hundred thousand francs? Let me see it. It must be shown to the Count, remember. He will take no risks, come not one step beyond the square until he is certain that it is the paper his government requires. Let me have it. Let me take it to him, quick. She waved aside airily the hand he stretched toward her, and danced into the thick of the resumed quadrille. 
Ah, no, 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 she laughed as he came after her. The conditions were of your own making, cher ami. We break no rules even among ourselves. Soul of a fool! But if the Count comes to the square, he is due there now, mignon, and I am not there to show him the thing. Margot, for the love of God, let me have the paper. Let me have the sign, the password. Cleek snapped at a desperate chance because there was nothing else to do, because he knew that at any moment now the end might come. When the purse will not open, slit it, he hazarded desperately, choosing on the off chance of its correctness the password of the Apache. It is not the right one. It is by no means the right one, she made reply, backing away from him suddenly, her absinthe brightened eyes deriding him, her absinthe sharpened laughter mocking him. "'Your thoughts are in the bois, cher ami. "'What is the password of the Brotherhood to the cause of Germany, stupid? "'It is not right. No, no, it is not right.' "'The cause of Germany?' "'At the words the truth rushed like a flash of inspiration across Cleek's mind. "'The cause of Germany! What a dolt he was not to have thought of that before!' "'There was but one phrase ever used for that among the Kaiser's people, and that phrase, "'Ha! Ah, to the day!' he said, with a burst of sudden laughter. "'My wits are in the moon to-night, la reine. To the day, of course. To the day!' And even before she replied to him, he knew that he had guessed aright. "'Bravo!' she said, with a little hiccup, for the absinthe of which she had imbibed so freely to-night was beginning to take hold of her. A pretty conspirator, to forget how to open the door he himself locked. It is well I know thee. It is well it was the word of Les Apaches in the beginning, or I had been suspicious, silly. Wait but a moment, putting her hand to her breast and beginning to unfasten her bodice. Wait but a moment, monsieur, twitching fingers, and the thing shall be in your hand. The strain, the relief, were all too great for even such nerves as Cleek's, and if he had not laughed aloud, he knew that he must have cheered. Oh, you grin because one's fingers blunder with eagerness, hiccupped Margot, thinking his laughter was for the trouble she had in getting the fastenings of her bodice undone. Best, monsieur, may not a lady well be modestly careful when— "'Name of the devil! What's that?' It was the note of a whistle, shrilling down the narrow passage without, the passage where Dollops, in Apache garb, had been set on watch. And hearing it, Cleek clamped his jaws together and breathed hard. A single whistle, short and sharp, such as this one was, was the signal agreed upon that the real Clodoche was coming and that he and Count von Hetzler had already appeared in the square beyond. "'Soul of a sloth, will not that hurry you, la reine?' he said excitedly, in reply to Margot's startled question. "'It is the signal Fouchard's son was to give when he and von Hetzler arrived at the place where I am to meet them. Give me the paper, quick, quick! Tear the fastenings if they will not come undone else. One cannot keep a von Hetzler waiting like a lackey for a scrap of ribbon and a bit of lace. Pardieu, they have kept better men than he waiting many an hour before this, she made reply. But you shall have the thing in a twinkling now, there, but one more knot, and then it is in your hands. And had the fates not decreed otherwise, so indeed it would have been. But then— just then, when another second would have brought the paper into view, another moment seen it shut tight in the grip of his itching fingers, disaster came and blotted out his hopes. Without hint or warning, without sign or sound to lessen the shock of it, the trap-door behind the bar flew up and backward, with a crash that sent Marie's and her assistants darting away from it in shrieking alarm. 
a babel of excited voices sounded, a scurry of rushing feet scuffled and flashed along the shaking floor, and Merode and his followers tumbled helter-skelter into the room. Cleek, counting on the bolt which kept them from entering the passage from the corridor of the Chateau La Rouge, forcing them to take a long roundabout journey to the twisted arm, had not counted on their shortening that journey by entering the passage from Fouchard's tavern, doing, in fact, the very thing which he had declared to Margot he himself had done. And, lo, here they were, howling and crowding about him, dirks in their hands and devils in their eyes and hearts, and the paper not his yet. A clamour rose as they poured in, the dancers ceased to dance, the music ceased to play, and Margot, shutting a tight clutch on the loosened part of her half-unfastened bodice, swung away from Cleek's side and flew in a panic to Merode. "'Gaston!' she cried, knowing from his wild look and the string of oaths and curses his followers were blurting out that something had gone amiss. "'Gaston, mon coeur, name of disaster, what is wrong?' "'Everything is wrong!' he flung back excitedly. "'That devil, that renegade, that fury clique, the cracksman is here. "'He came to the rescue, came out of the very skies, and all but killed Serpice. "'Clique!' Fifty shrill voices joined Margot's in that screaming cry. Fifty more dirks flashed into view. "'Clique in France! Clique! Where is he?' "'Which way did he go? Where's the knocker? Where? Where?' "'Here, if anywhere.' "'Here?' "'Yes, unless you've been fooled and let him get away. "'He knows about the paper and is after it, Marco. "'And if anyone has come up from the sewers within the past twenty minutes—' "'They knew. They grasped the situation instantly, "'and a roar of excited voices yelled out, "'Clodoche! Clodoche! Clodoche!' as, snarling and howling like a pack of wolves, they bore down with a rush on the blue-bloused figure that was creeping towards the door. But as they sprang, it sprang also. It was neck or nothing now. Cleek realised it, and, throwing himself headlong over the bar, clutched frantically at the lever which he knew controlled the flow of gas, jammed it down with all his strength, shut off the light, and, grabbing up a chair, sent it crashing through the window. The crowd surged on towards the wrecked bar with a yell, surged from all directions, and then abruptly stopped and huddled together in one. For the sudden flashing down of the darkness within had made more prominent the moonlighted passage without, and there, scuttling away in alarm from this sudden uproar and the outward flying of that hurled chair, a figure which but a moment before had come skulking to the window could now be seen. "'There he goes! There! There!' shrilled out a chorus of excited voices as the yellow-bearded, blue-bloused figure came into view. "'After him! Catch him! Knife him!' In an instant they were at the door, tumbling out into the darkness, pouring up the passage in hot pursuit and it was at that moment the balance changed again. Those who were in the front rank of the pursuers were in time to see a lithe, thin figure, dressed as one of their own kind, spring up in the path of that other figure, jump on it, grip it, clap a huge square of sticky brown paper over the howling mouth of it, and bear it struggling and kicking to the ground. In another second they too were upon it, swarming over it like rats, and digging and hacking at it with their dirks, and so they were still hacking at it, although it had long since ceased to move or to make any sound, when Merode came up and called them to a halt. "'Drag it inside. Let Marco have a thrust at it. It is her right.' "'Pull off the dog's disguise and bring me the plucky one that captured him. "'He shall have absinthe enough to swim in the little king. "'Off with it all, l'enchère. First the plaster, that's right. "'Now the wig and beard, and after that... "'What's that you say? The beard is real? "'The hair is real? They will not come off? "'Name of the devil, what are you saying?' 
"'The truth, mon roi, the truth, mother of disasters. "'It is not the cracksman. "'It is the real Clodoche we have killed.' For one moment a sort of panic held them, swayed them, befogged the brains of them. Then, of a sudden, Merode howled out, "'Get back! Get back! The fellow's in there still!' and led a blind race down the passage to the bar where they had seen Cleek last. It was still in darkness, but an eager hand gripping the lever turned on the gas again, and matches everywhere were lifted to the jets. And when the light flamed out, and the room was again ablaze, they knew that they might as well hope to call back yesterday as dream of finding Cleek again. For there, on the floor, her limp hands turned palms upward, a chloroformed cloth folded over her mouth and nose, lay in a deep stupor the figure of Margot, her bodice torn wide open, and the paper forever gone. It was five minutes later when the Count von Hetzler, crouching back in the shadow of the square and waiting for the return of Clodoche, heard a dull whirring sound that was unmistakably the purr of a motor throb through the stillness, and, leaning forward, saw an automobile whirl up out of the darkness, cut across the square, and dash off westward like a flash. Yet in the brief instant it took to go past the place where he waited, there was time for him to catch the sharp click of a lowered window, see the clear outlines of a man's face looking out, and to hear a voice from within the vehicle speak. "'Herr Count,' it said in clear, incisive tones, "'a positively infallible recipe for the invasion of England. Wait until the channel freezes, and then skate over. Good night.' <laughs> "'One for his knob, that, Governor, my hat yet,' said Dollops, with a shrill laugh as he stuck a red head and a face all shiny with cocoa butter and half-removed grease paint out of the window, and despite the fact that the swift pace of the automobile had already carried it far past the place where the Count had been in hiding, made a fan of his five fingers and his snub nose. "'Oh, mother of a, did you see him, sir? Bunk back in his hole like somebody had given him the hook, and cleared the blessed stage before the eggs began to fly. I don't think them Germans will be sitting on the steps of St. Paul's this year, sir, not them. Cleek laughed, and ordering the boy to shut down the window and get on with the work of changing his clothes, set about doing the same thing himself. I suppose you know, you clever little monkey, that I should have been floating down the Seine with a slit throat and enough lead in me to sink a barrel by this time, if it hadn't been for you, he said as he pushed the outward semblance of Clodoche into the kit-bag, and began to get into ordinary civilian's dress as expeditiously as possible. "'If you had slipped up, if you had been one half-minute late, or if that fellow had had the chance to make one cry before you covered his mouth—' "'Please, sir, don't!' interposed Dollops, with a sort of shiver. "'If anything had happened to you, Governor—' Then stopped short and made a sound as if he were swallowing something, and then grew very, very still. Cleek looked at him out of the corner of his eye, moved in spite of himself, hesitated a moment, and then, obeying an impulse, leaned over and gently tapped him on the shoulder. "'Dollops, shake hands,' he said. "'Sir?' "'Shake hands.' "'Good, Governor!' "'You don't never mean that, sir?' "'Shake hands,' said Cleek, for the third time. "'Do you know, you little monkey, that you are the only soul in all God's world that could ever muster up a tear for me? Thank you, my lad. You're a brick!' Then gripped the grimy hand that was reached out with a sort of awe, wrung it heartily, patted the astonished boy on the shoulder and fell to whistling merrily as he went on with his dressing. "'Sir, you do lick me, you fair do,' said Dollops, laughing unsteadily, and drawing his sleeve across his eyes. 
after what you've been and went through, a sitting there and whistling as merry as can be, like as if life was all beer and skittles and you hadn't a care in the world. I haven't for the minute, my lad, said Cleek, with a laugh of utter happiness. Beer and skittles? Lord, it's all roses, my boy, roses. I've had the good luck to accomplish a thing that's going to give me, well, at least one moment in paradise. And when a man has a prospect like that in view. His voice trailed off. He laughed again, then fell to whistling once more, noisily, joyously, as if some schoolboy sort of madness was in his blood tonight, and was still whistling when the automobile pulled up sharply in front of the Hôtel du Louvre. End of chapter 9chapter 10 of cleek the man of the 40 faces this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by ruth golding cleek the man of the 40 faces by thomas w hanshu chapter 10 by this time he had concluded the alteration in his toilet which was necessary to assure his entrance into the hotel without occasioning comment and as Dollops had followed suit, they readily passed muster when they alighted for an ordinary English gentleman, accompanied by an ordinary English man-servant. "'What was the charge at the garage?' inquired Cleek of Dollops, just previously to alighting. "'I don't know what it runs to in this here rum lingo of Franks and Sue's, sir,' said Dollops, "'but the garage gent, he said it would amount to two pounds ten in English money.' "'so I'll have to leave you to work it out for yourself. "'The shover, he said something about poor boars, "'which I've heard is what you has to give em as a tip to themselves, Governor. "'So I promised him half a crown to stop at t'other end of that passage "'leading up from the twisted arm till he was wanted, sir. "'Made it a good tip because I wanted him to be there, sure. "'It would have been a case of nab for us if he hadn't. "'Wasn't too much, was it, sir?' "'No,' said Cleek and let him see that it wasn't by giving the chauffeur a pourboire of ten francs, and sending him back to the garage with the impression that he had had dealings with a millionaire. Ten minutes later, the hotel register bore the record of the arrival of Mr. Philip Barch and servant, and one attendant was engaged in showing the servant into a neat little bedroom, which was to be his resting place until morning, while another was ushering the master into the suite engaged by the Baron de Cacherac. Three persons were there, the Baron, his daughter, and his daughter's companion, but Cleek saw but one, and that the only one who made no movement, uttered no sound, when he came into the room. Curiously pale and curiously quiet, she stood with one arm resting on the mantelpiece, and the other hanging by her side, looking at him. Looking for him, in fact, but not saying one word, not making one sound. That she left wholly to the Baron and his daughter. They, too, maintained, although with an effort, an appearance of composure, so long as the hotel servant was present. But in the moment the door closed and the man was gone, an overpowering excitement seized and mastered them. "'Monsieur, for the love of God, don't tell me you have failed,' implored the Baron. "'I have died a hundred deaths of torture and suspense since your card was carried up. But if I am to hear bad news, oh, my country!' "'Don't cross bridges, Baron, until you come to them said Cleek composedly. I gave Miss Lorne my promise that I would not leave France until I had done what she asked me to do. And I am returning to England to-morrow by the noon boat. I have had an exciting evening, but it has had its compensation. Here is something for you. I had a bit of a fight for it, Baron. Look out that it doesn't get into the wrong hands again. He had taken a small packet of torn papers from his pocket while he was speaking. 
Now he put it into the baron's hand, not wholly without a certain sense of gratification, however, in the excitement and delight which the act called forth. For no man is utterly devoid of personal vanity, personal pride in his achievements, and this man was no less human than his kind. He let the tumult of excitement and joy wear itself out. He suffered the baron's embraces, even the two rapturous kisses the man planted upon first one and then the other of his cheeks. He endured Mademoiselle Attalie's exuberant hand-clapping and hand-shaking, and the cyclonic and wholly Gallic manner in which she deported herself, when comparison with the fragments which the baron had still retained proved beyond all question that these were indeed the missing portions of the all-important document. And not until these things were over did he so much as look at Ailsa Lorne again. She had taken no part in the general excitement, moved not one foot from where she had been standing from the first. Even when Attalie danced over and hugged her, and showed the important fragments, even when she reproved her, with a wondering, "'Ah, you strange Anglais! You stone-cold Anglais! Is it possible that you can have blood in your veins, and yet take wondrous things like this so calmly?' Even then she merely smiled, and remained standing just as she still was, her pallor not one whit lessened her reserve but the merest shadow less apparent than it had been before. Cleek chose that moment to walk over to her, to lift his eyes to hers, and to stand looking at her questioningly, for now that he was close to her he could see that she was trembling nervously, that her calmness was merely an outward thing, and that under it nerves writhed and a frightened heart was beating thick and fast was even the fancied moment in paradise to be denied him then. That such a woman could not, all in a moment, could not, by just one act of heroism on his part, be won over and lured into complete forgetfulness of such a past as his, he realised to the fullest extent. Always he had been conscious of that. But even so... Ah, well, the meanest may hope, the lowest may at least look up, and even saints and angels were not above saying well done to a soul that had struggled, to a sinner that had done his best. I managed it, you see, Miss Lorne, he said in a slightly lowered voice, while the baron busied himself in looking for his cheque-book and Attali bustled about in quest of ink and a pen. "'It wasn't an easy night's work, and I'm a bit fagged out, so as I leave in the morning it will be good-bye, as well as good-night.' She moved for the first time. The hand that laid upon the shelf of the mantelpiece shook and closed quickly. She lifted up her head and looked at him. Her eyes were misty, and faint clouds of colour were coming and going over her face. "'What is it?' he asked. "'Surely, Miss Lorne, you are not afraid of me?' "'No,' she said, averting her face again. "'Not of you, but of myself. That is, I—' Trying to laugh, but making a parody of it. I was always more or less of a coward, Mr. Cleek, but— She faced round again sharply, and held out her hand to him. Will you let me thank you? Will you let me say that I must be merely a little child in intellect, since it is only now that I have begun to understand how natural it is that a pound of gold should inevitably outweigh an ounce of dirt? And will you please understand that I am trying to thank you, trying to let you know that I am very, very sorry if I ever hurt your feelings? I don't think I meant to. I couldn't see then so clearly as I do now. Please forgive me. He took the hand she held out to him, and so, 
had his moment in paradise, after all. "'Hurt me as often as you like, if it will always end like this,' he said, with a queer little laugh that seemed to come from the very depths of his chest. "'As for that other time, how could I have expected that you would take it in any other way, being what you are, and I what I had been? I am glad I told you. You could never have respected me for an instant if you had found it out in any other way, and I want your respect. I want it very, very earnestly, Miss Lorne. If you can ever give it to me, I'll do my best to be worthy of it. She had withdrawn her hand from his, and was drumming with her fingertips upon the mantel-shelf. A little pucker was between her eyebrows. She was biting her underlip, perplexedly, and appeared to be hesitating. But of a sudden she twitched round her head sharply, and a sweep of red went up over her face. "'Shall I show you how much I do respect you, then?' she said. "'One may ask of a friend things one would not dream of asking of a mere acquaintance. And so, Mr. Cleek, this night of horror has been too much for me. I know now that I can no longer remain in this position in this dreadful city. I have already resigned my post, and will return to England, and, if I am not too late for it, make an effort to secure the post of governess to Lady Chepstow's little son. I shall start in the morning. Will you play the part of friend and guide, and see me safely across the channel? Do you mean that? he asked his face alight, his eyes shining. You will let me have the privilege, the honour. What a queen you are! You give largesse with both hands when a simple coin would have been enough. Shall I secure your tickets? When will you have your luggage ready? Is there anything you will need before you leave? She smiled at his enthusiasm, coloured anew, and again held out her hand. We will talk of all that in the morning, she said. There will be plenty of time. Mademoiselle de Cajerac has promised to look after my effects, and to see that they are shipped on to me in due course. But now it really must be good night. I shall see you again at breakfast. At breakfast? repeated Cleek with a happy laugh. I wonder if you understand that I shall be kicking my heels on my bedside until it is ready that I shan't sleep a wink all night. And, as events proved, he came respectably close to living up to that exuberant assertion, merely napping now and again to wake up suddenly and moon for an hour or so, and, between periodical inspections of his watch, to wonder if God ever made a night so long and slow-dragging as this one. It had its recompense, however for all, or nearly all, the next day was passed in company with her, and more than that he would not have asked of heaven. Long before she rose he had made all arrangements for the journey to Calais, and she was not a little gratified, yes, and touched, if the truth must be told, on arriving at the train, to find that he had made no effort to secure accommodations which would compel her to endure his companionship alone from the Gare du Nord to the steamer, but had considerately reserved seats in a compartment containing other travellers, and had done everything in his power to relieve her of any possible embarrassment, and to ensure her all possible comforts. Even magazines and pictorial papers were not omitted, but were there for her in plenty, lest she might prefer an excuse for not indulging much in conversation and there was also a huge bunch of La France roses, bought at the temporary flower-market beside the Madeleine at daybreak that morning. "'They are beautiful, aren't they?' he said, as he laid them in her lap. "'Will it surprise you to learn that flowers are a passion with me, and that I am a living refutation of the fallacy that there can be nothing very wrong about a man who can cultivate a garden?' She looked up at him and smiled. I think nothing about you will surprise me. You are so many-sided, and— 
if you will pardon me saying it, so different from what one imagines men of, of your calling to be, she said, and laughed a little, colouring divinely until her face was like the roses themselves. You treat me as if I were a queen, and I am not used to court manners. Where, if you please, did you acquire yours? In the vast kingdom of the world, he made answer, with just a momentary change of countenance, a mere suspicion of embarrassment, laughed off before she could be quite sure that it had had any real existence. Please remember that to appear to be what one is not, and to ape manners foreign to one's real self, is part of what you have so nicely, so euphemistically, termed my calling. I am an actor on the world's stage, Miss Lorne. I should be but a very poor one if I could not accommodate myself to many roles. If you play them all so well as you do that of the Preux Chevalier, it is no wonder you are a success, she replied gaily, slipping thus into easy conversation with him. And so it fell out that the magazines and the illustrated papers were not so much of a boon as both had fancied they might be when Cleek brought them to her, for they had not even been opened when the train ran up to the quayside at Calais, and brought them almost abreast of the Channel steamer. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of Cleek, The Man of the Forty Faces this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces by Thomas W. Hanshew. Chapter 11. It was not until they were aboard the boat and the shores of France were slipping off into the distance that Miss Lorne saw anything at all of Dollops. As he had travelled down from Paris to Calais in a separate compartment, there had been no opportunity to do so. He had, too, held himself respectfully aloof, even after they had boarded the steamer, and but that once, when a lurch of the vessel had unexpectedly disturbed Cleek's equilibrium and knocked his hat off, she might not have seen him even then. But the manner in which he pounced upon that hat, the tender care with which he brushed it, and the affectionate interest in both voice and eyes when he handed it back and inquired eagerly, "'Didn't hurt yourself, Governor, did you, sir?' compelled her to take notice of him, and in doing so to understand the position in which they stood to each other. "'You are travelling with a servant?' she inquired. "'More than a servant, a devoted henchman, Miss Lorne. They say you can't purchase fidelity for all the money in the world, but I secured the finest brand of it in the universe by the simple outplay of two half-crowns. It is the boy of that night on Hampstead Heath, the boy who stood at the turning point. The devil didn't get him, you see. He kept his promise, and has been walking the straight road ever since. She turned round and looked at him, realising more of the man's character in that moment than a hundred deeds of bravery, a thousand acts of gentle courtesy, could ever have made her understand. "'And you took him in?' she said slowly. "'You gave him a chance. "'You helped him to redeem himself. "'How good of you!' "'How good for me, you mean?' he laughed. "'It was bred on the waters with a vengeance, Miss Lorne. "'I should have lost my life last night but for that boy.' "'And told her briefly and airily how the thing had come to pass.' "'Don't think it vindictive of me, but I am sorry, I am very, very sorry, you were not able to hand that dreadful woman Margot over to the authorities, Mr. Cleek,' she said, with an expression of great seriousness. "'She is not likely to forget or to forgive what you have done, and some day, perhaps—oh, do be on your guard! It was really foolhardy to have attempted the thing alone.' Surely you might have appealed for assistance to the Paris police, and not only have minimised your personal risk, 
but made sure of the woman's arrest. Not without allowing the authorities to learn exactly what the Baron de Carterac was so anxious to keep them from learning, Miss Lorne. They must have found out what I was after, what really had been lost, if I had applied to them for assistance. I had either to do the thing alone, or drop the case entirely. And drop it I would not, after you had asked me to accept it. And—pardon? No, Miss Lorne, I do not know who the woman Margot really is. Even that name may be fictitious, as was the one of Comtesse de la Tour. I only know of her that she is one of the great figures of the underworld, that money is her game, money alone, money first, last, and all the time that her personal history is as much of a mystery to her closest associates as was—well, no matter. People of that ilk are not fit subjects to discuss with you. All that I know of the woman is that she has travelled pretty well over the world, that some six or eight months ago she was in Ceylon with a, uh, a certain member of her crew, and came within an ace of falling foul of the law. She had put up a plan to loot the depository of the Pearl Fisheries Company, at a period when there were thousands of pounds worth of gems awaiting transport. With her usual luck she slipped out of the net, and left the country before she could be arrested. But she will have found something there that will repay her for the visit, in one way or another. Luck of that kind seems to follow her always and a long time afterward he had reason to remember what he said. For the present, however, he had banished from his mind all things but the happiness which was his to-day, and gave himself up to that happiness with his whole heart. Not once did he again intrude anything that had to do with himself, his exploits, or his future, upon Ailsa's attention, until all the voyage across the Channel and all the journey from Dover up to London had come to an end. And even then, eager though he was to know how matters might shape themselves for her future, he was tactful, considerate, careful not to force her into any embarrassing position, or to claim from her more than the merest acquaintance might. "'You are going to your friend at Hampstead, I suppose,' he said, as he handed her into a taxicab at Charing Cross. "'I shall like to know if you succeed in getting the position with Lady Chepstow, and if you send no word to Mr. Narkom, I shall take silence as an assent, and know that you have.' And afterward, when the days grew in number, and late April merged into early May, and no word came, he knew that she had succeeded, and was comforted, thinking of her safely housed, and perhaps in a position more congenial than the last. At any rate she was in England, she was again in the same land with him, and that of itself was comfort. But other comforts were not wanting. The full glory of tulip-time was here. The yard had no immediate occasion for his services, and time was his to dawdle in the public parks, among the children, the birds, and the flowers. "'And, Lord, how he do love em all, bless his heart!' commented Dollops in confidence to himself, as he bustled about, putting the den in order, watering the plants, and touching lovingly the things that belonged to the master he adored. His daily task, when Cleek was in the park, and had no need for his services. It was a pleasure to the boy, that service. His whole heart was in it. He resented anything that interfered with it, even for an instant. And as at this particular time he was in the very midst of preparing a small surprise against his master's return, he was by no means pleased when a sharp, whirring sound of a telephone bell shrilled out from the adjoining room and called him from his labour of love. "'Oh, blow that thing! A body don't have a minute to call his own since it's been put in!' he blurted out disgustedly, and answered the call. "'Hello! Yes, this is Captain Burbage's. What? No, he aren't in. Don't know when he will be. Don't know where he is. But if there's any message—' "'I say, who wants him? What? 
Oh, so help me. You, is it, Mr. Narkom? Yes, it's me, sir, Dollops. What? No, sir, went out two hours ago. Gone to Kensington Palace Gardens. Tulips is in full bloom, and you couldn't hold him indoors with a chain at tulip time, bless his heart. Yes, sir. Top hat, white spats, same as a cap always wear, sir. Narkom, at the other end of the line, called back, If I miss him, if he comes in without seeing me, tell him to wait. I'll be round before three. Good-bye. Then hung up the receiver, and turned to the gentleman who stood by the window on the other side of the private office, agitatedly twirling the end of his thick, grey-threaded moustache with one hand, while with the other he drummed a nervous tattoo upon the broad oaken sill. "'Not at home, Sir Henry, but fortunately I know where to find him with but little loss of time,' he said, and pressed twice upon an electric button beside his desk. "'My motor will be at the door in a couple of minutes, and with ordinary luck we ought to be able to pick him up inside of the next half-hour.' "'Sir Henry, Sir Henry Wilding, Baronet,' to give him his full name and title, a handsome, well-set-up man of about forty years of age, well-groomed and with the upright bearing which comes of military training, twisted round on his heel at this, and gave the superintendent an almost grateful look. "'I hope so. God knows I hope so, Mr. Narkom," he said agitatedly. "'Time is the one important thing at present.' The suspense and uncertainty are getting on my nerves so horribly that the very minutes seem endless. Remember, there are only three days before the race, and if those rascals, whoever they are, get at Black Riot before then, God help me, that's all. And if this man Cleek can't probe the diabolical mystery, they will get at her too, and put Logan where they put Tolliver, the brutes. You may trust Cleek to see that they don't, Sir Henry. It is just the kind of case he will glory in, and if Black Riot is all that you believe her, you'll carry off the derby in spite of these enterprising gentry, who— Hello, here's the motor. Clap on your hat, Sir Henry, and come along. Mind the step. Kensington Palace Gardens, Leonard, and as fast as you can streak it. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces by Thomas W. Hanshew. Chapter Twelve. The chauffeur proved that he could streak it as close to the margin of the speed limit as the law dared wink at, even in the case of the well-known red limousine and in a little over ten minutes pulled up before the park gates. Narkom jumped out, beckoned Sir Henry to follow him, and together they hurried into the grounds in quest of Cleek. Where the famous tulip-beds made splotches of brilliant colour against the clear emerald of the closely clipped grass, they came upon him, a solitary figure in the garb of the elderly seaman, Captain Burbage of Clarges Street. Seated on one of the garden benches, his hands folded over the knob of his thick walking-stick, and his chin resting upon them, staring fixedly at the gorgeous flowers, and apparently deaf and blind to all else. He was not, however, for as the superintendent approached, he, without altering his gaze or his attitude in the slightest particle, said with the utmost calmness, Soup! Superb, are they not, my friend? What a pity they should be scentless! It is as though heaven had created a butterfly, and deprived it of the secret of flight. Walk on, please, without addressing me. I am quite friendly with that policeman yonder, and I do not wish him to suspect that the elderly gentleman he is so kind to is in any way connected with the yard. Examine the tulips, that's right. You came in your limousine, of course. Where is it? Just outside the gates, at the end of the path on the right, replied Narkom, halting with Sir Henry, and appearing to be wholly absorbed in pointing out the different varieties of tulips. Good, replied Cleek, apparently taking not the slightest notice. 
I'll toddle on presently, and when you return from inspecting the flowers, you'll find me inside the motor, awaiting you. Do, old chap, and please hurry. Time is everything in this case. Let me introduce you to your client. Keep looking at the flowers, please, Sir Henry. I have the honour to make you acquainted with Sir Henry Wilding, Cleek. He needs you, my dear fellow. Delighted in both instances. My compliments, Sir Henry. By any chance that Sir Henry Wilding, whose mare, Black Riot, is the favourite for next Wednesday's derby? Yes, that very man, Mr. Cleek. And if— Don't get excited and don't turn, please. Our friend the policeman is looking this way. What's the case? One of nobbling? Somebody trying to get at the mare? Yes, a desperate somebody who doesn't stop even at murder. A very devil incarnate who seems to possess the power of invisibility and who strikes in the dark. Save me, Mr. Cleek. All I've got in the world is at stake, and if anything happens to Black Riot, I'm a ruined man. Yeah, yawned the elderly sea captain, rising and stretching. I do believe, constable, I've been asleep. Warm weather this for May. A glorious week for Epsom. Shan't see you tomorrow, I'm afraid. Perhaps shan't see you until Thursday. Here, take that, my lad, and have half a crown's worth on Black Riot for the Derby. She'll win it, sure. Thank ye, sir. Good luck to you, sir. Same to you, my lad. Good day. Then the old gentleman in the top hat and white spats moved slowly away, passed down the tree-shaded walk, past the romping children, past the Princess Louise's statue of Queen Victoria, and, after a moment, vanished. Ten minutes later, when Narkom and Sir Henry returned to the waiting motor, they found him seated within it, awaiting them, as he had promised. Giving Leonard orders to drive about slowly in the least frequented quarters while they talked, the superintendent got in with Sir Henry, and opened fire on the case without further delay. "'My dear Cleek,' he said, "'as you appear to know all about Sir Henry and his famous mare, there's no need to go into that part of the subject. So I may as well begin by telling you at once that Sir Henry has come up to town for the express purpose of getting you to go down to his place in Suffolk to-night, in company with him, as his only hope of outwitting a diabolical agency which has set out to get at the horse and put it out of commission before Derby Day, and in the most mysterious, the most inscrutable manner ever heard of, my dear chap. Already one groom who sat up to watch with her has been killed, another hopelessly paralysed, and to-night Logan, the mare's trainer, is to sit up with her in the effort to balk the almost superhuman rascal who is at the bottom of it all. Conceive, if you can, my dear fellow, a power so crafty, so diabolical, that it gets into a locked and guarded stable. Gets in, my dear Cleek, despite four men constantly pacing back and forth before each and every window and door that leads into the place, and with a groom on guard inside, and then gets out again in the same mysterious manner, without having been seen or heard by a living soul. In addition to all the windows being small and covered with a grill of iron, a fact which would make it impossible for anyone to get in or out once the doors were closed and guarded, Sir Henry himself will tell you that the stable has been ransacked from top to bottom, every hole and every corner probed into, and not a living creature of any sort discovered. Yet only last night the groom Tolliver was set upon inside the place, and killed outright in his efforts to protect the horse. Killed, Cleek, with four men patrolling outside, and willing to swear, each and every one of them, that nothing and no one, either man, woman, child, or beast, passed them going in or getting out from sunset until dawn. Hmm, said Cleek, sucking in his lower lip. Mysterious, to say the least. Was there no struggle? Did the men on guard hear no cry? 
"'In the case of the first groom, Murple, the one that was paralysed, no,' said Sir Henry, as the question was addressed to him. "'But in the case of Tolliver, yes. The men heard him cry out, heard him call out help, but by the time they could get the doors open it was all over. He was lying doubled up before the entrance to Black Riot's stall, with his face to the floor, as dead as Julius Caesar, poor fellow, and not a sign of anybody anywhere. And the horse? Did anybody get at that? No, for the best of reasons. As soon as these attacks began, Mr. Cleek, I sent up to London. A gang of twenty-four men came down with steel plates, steel joists, steel posts, and in seven hours' time Black Riot's box was converted into a sort of safe to which I alone hold the key the instant it is locked up for the night. A steel grill about half a foot deep, and so tightly meshed that nothing bigger than a mouse could pass through, runs all round the enclosure, close to the top of the walls, and this supplies ventilation. When the door is closed at night it automatically connects itself with an electric gong in my own bedroom, so that the slightest attempt to open it or even to touch it would hammer out an alarm close to my head. Has it ever done so? Yes, last night, when Tolliver was killed. How killed, Sir Henry? Stabbed or shot? Neither. He appeared to have been strangled, poor fellow, and to have died in most awful agony. Strangled? But, my dear sir, that would hardly have been possible in so short a time. You say your men heard him call out for help, granted that it took them a full minute, and it probably did not take them half one, to open the doors and come to his assistance. He could not be stone dead in so short a time. And he was stone dead when they got in, I believe you said. Yes. God knows what killed him. The coroner will find that out, no doubt but there was no blood shed and no mark upon him that I could see. Hmm. Was there any mark on the door of the steel stall? Yes, a long scratch, somewhat semicircular and sweeping downwards at the lower extremity. It began close to the lock and ended about a foot and a half lower. Undoubtedly, you see, Cleek, put in Narkom. Someone tried to force an entrance to the steel room and get at the mare, but the prompt arrival of the men on guard outside the stable prevented his doing so. Cleek made no response. Just at that moment the limousine was gliding past a building whose courtyard was one blaze of parrot tulips, and his eye caught by the flaming colours he was staring at them, and reflectively rubbing his thumb and forefinger up and down his chin. After a moment, however, "'Tell me something, Sir Henry,' he said abruptly. "'Is anybody interested in your not putting Black Riot into the field on Derby Day? Anybody with whom you have a personal acquaintance, I mean, for of course I know there are other owners who would be glad enough to see him scratched. But is there anybody who would have a particular interest in your failure?' "'Yes, one.' "'Major Lamson Bowles, owner of Minnow. "'Minnow's second favourite, as perhaps you know. "'It would delight Lamson Bowles to see me go under, "'and as I'm so certain of Black Riot "'that I've mortgaged every stick and stone I have in the world to back her, "'I should go under if anything happened to the mare. "'That would suit Lamson Bowles down to the ground.' "'Bad blood between you, then?' "'Yes, very. The fellow's a brute, and I thrashed him once, as he deserved, the bounder. "'It may interest you to know that my only sister was his first wife. "'He led her a dog's life, poor girl, and death was a merciful release to her. Twelve months ago he married a rich American woman, "'widow of a man who made millions in hides and leather.' "'That's when Lamson Bowles took up racing "'and how he got the money to keep a stud. "'Had the beastly bad taste, too, to come down to Suffolk, "'within a gunshot of Wilding Hall, "'take Elmsley Manor, the biggest and grandest place in the neighbourhood, "'and cut a dash under my very nose, as it were. 
Uh, ho, said Cleek. Then the Major is a neighbour, as well as a rival for the Derby Plate. I see, I see. No, you don't altogether, said Sir Henry quickly. Lamson Bowles is a brute and a bounder in many ways. But, well, I don't believe he is low down enough to do this sort of thing, and with murder attached to it, too. Although he did try to bribe poor Tolliver to leave me, offered my trainer double wages, too, to chuck me and take up his horses. Oh, he did that, did he? Sure of it, Sir Henry? Absolutely. Saw the letter he wrote to Logan. Hmm. Feel that you can rely on Logan, do you? To the last gasp. He's as true to me as my own shadow. If you want proof of it, Mr. Cleek, he's going to sit in the stable and keep guard himself tonight, in the face of what happened to Murple and Tolliver. Murple is the groom who was paralysed, is he not? said Cleek, after a moment. Singular thing, that. What paralysed him, do you think? Heaven knows. He might just as well have been killed as poor Tolliver was, for he'll never be any use again, the doctors say. Some injury to the spinal column, and with it a curious affection of the throat and tongue. He can neither swallow nor speak. Nourishment has to be administered by tube, and the tongue is horribly swollen. "'I'm of the opinion, Cleek,' put in Narkom, "'that strangulation is merely part of the procedure of the rascal who makes these diabolical nocturnal visits. In other words, that he is armed with some quick-acting infernal poison, which he forces into the mouths of his victims.' That paralysis of the muscles of the throat is one of the symptoms of prussic acid poisoning, you must remember. I do remember, Mr. Narkom, replied Cleek enigmatically. My memory is much stimulated by these details, I assure you. I gather from them that whatever is administered, Murple did not get quite so much of it as Tolliver, or he too would be dead. "'Sir Henry,' he turned again to the baronet, "'do you trust everybody else connected with your establishment as much as you trust Logan?' "'Yes. There's not a servant connected with the hall that hasn't been in my service for years, and all are loyal to me.' "'May I ask who else is in the house, besides the servants?' "'My wife, Lady Wilding, for one.' her cousin, Mr. Sharpless, who is on a visit to us, for another, and for a third, my uncle, the Reverend Ambrose Smear, the famous revivalist. Mr. Smear does not approve of the racetrack, of course. No, he does not. He is absurdly narrow on some subjects, and sport of all sorts is one of them. But beyond that he is a dear, lovable old fellow, of whom I am amazingly fond. Hmm. And Lady Wilding and Mr. Sharpless, do they too disapprove of racing? Quite to the contrary. Both are enthusiastic upon the subject, and both have the utmost faith in Black Riot's certainty of winning. Lady Wilding is something more than attached to the mare. And as for Mr. Sharpless, he is so upset over these rascally attempts that every morning when the steel room is opened and the animal taken out, although nothing ever happens in the daylight, he won't let her get out of his sight for a single instant until she is groomed and locked up for the night. He is so incensed, so worked up over this diabolical business, that I verily believe if he caught any stranger coming near the mare, he'd shoot him in his tracks. Hmm, said Cleek abstractedly, and then sat silent for a long time, staring at his spats, and moving one thumb slowly round the breadth of the other, his fingers interlaced, and his lower lip pushed upwards over the one above. There, that's the case, Cleek, said Narkom after a time. Do you make anything out of it? 
Yes, he replied. I make a good deal out of it, Mr. Narkom. But, like the language of the man who stepped on the banana skin, it isn't fit for publication. One question more, Sir Henry. Heaven forbid it, of course, but if anything should happen to Logan tonight, whom would you put on guard over the horse tomorrow? Do you think I could persuade anybody if a third man perished? said the baronet, answering one question with another. I don't believe there's a groom in England who'd take the risk, for love or money. There would be nothing for it but to do the watching myself. What's that? Do it? Certainly I'd do it. Everybody that knows me knows that. Ah, I see, said Cleek, and lapsed into silence again. But you'll come, won't you? exclaimed Sir Henry agitatedly. It won't happen if you take up the case. Mr. Narkom tells me he is sure of that. Come with me, Mr. Cleek. My motor is waiting at the garage. Come back with me, for God's sake, for humanity's sake, and get to the bottom of the thing. Yes, said Cleek in reply. Give Leonard the address of the garage, please, and Mr. Narkom. Yes, old chap. Pull up at the first grocer's shop, you see, will you? And buy me a couple of pounds of the best white flour that's milled. And if you can't manage to get me either a sieve or a flour dredger, a tin pepper pot will do. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces by Thomas W. Hanshu. Chapter 13. It was two o'clock when Sir Henry Wilding's motor turned its back upon the outskirts of London, and it was a quarter past seven when it whirled up to the stables of Wilding Hall, and the baronet and his grey headed, bespectacled and white-spatted companion alighted, having taken five hours and a quarter to make a journey which the trains which run daily between Liverpool Street and Darsham make in four. As a matter of fact, however, they really had outstripped the train, but it had been Cleek's pleasure to make two calls on the way, one at Saxmundham, where the paralysed Murple lay in the infirmary of the local practitioner, the other at the mortuary where the body of Tolliver was retained, awaiting the sitting of the coroner. Both the dead and the still living man Cleek had subjected to a critical personal examination, but whether either furnished him with any suggested clue he did not say. Indeed, the only remark he made upon the subject was when Sir Henry, on hearing from Murple's wife that the doctor had said he would probably not last the week out, had inquired if the woman knew where to put her hand on the receipt for the payment of the last premium, so that her claim could be sent into the life assurance company without delay when the end came. "'Tell me something, Sir Henry,' said Cleek when he heard that, and noticed how gratefully the woman looked at the baronet when she replied, "'Yes, Sir Henry, God bless you, sir.' Tell me, if it is not an impertinent question, did you take out an insurance policy on Murple's life and pay the premium on it yourself? I gathered the idea that you did from the manner in which the woman spoke to you. Yes, I did, replied Sir Henry. As a matter of fact, I take out a similar policy, payable to the widow, for every married man I employ in connection with my racing stud. May I ask why? Well, for one thing, they usually are too poor and have too many children to support to be able to take it out for themselves, and exercising racers has a good many risks. Then, for another thing, I'm a firm believer in the policy of life assurance. It's just so much money laid up in safety, and one never knows what may happen. "'Then it is fair,' said Cleek, "'to suppose in that case that you have taken out one on your own life?' "'Yes, rather,' 
and a whacking big one, too. And Lady Wilding is, of course, the beneficiary. Certainly. There are no children, you know. As a matter of fact, we have been married only seven months. Before the date of my wedding, the policy was in my Uncle Ambrose's, the Reverend Mr. Smear's, favour. Ah, I see, said Cleek reflectively, then fell to thinking deeply over the subject, and was still thinking of it when the motor whizzed into the stable-yard at Wilding Hall, and brought him into contact for the first time with the trainer Logan. He didn't much fancy Logan at first blush, and Logan didn't fancy him at all at any time. Er, he said disgustedly, in a stage aside to his master, as Cleek stood on the threshold of the stable, with his head thrown back and his chin at an angle, sniffing the air somewhat after the manner of a bird-dog. Er, if uns the best Scotland Yard could let out to ye, sir, half-baked old softy like that, the rest of em must be a blessed poor lot, I'm thinking. What's un doing now, the noodle, snuffing the air like he did not understand the smell of it? He'd not be expecting a stable to be scented with old de Cologne, would he? What's a name, sir? Cleek. Er, sounds like a golf stick, and I've no doubt he's got a head like one, main thick and with a twist in un. I done a like tack, Sir Henry and I done a like this one a special. Who's to tell us he aren't in with they devils as is after Black Riot? No, I done a like him at all. Meantime, serenely unconscious of the displeasure he had excited in Logan's breast, Cleek went on sniffing the air and poking about, as he phrased it, in all corners of the stable and when, a moment later, Sir Henry went in and joined him, he was standing before the door of the steel room, examining the curving scratch of which the baronet had spoken. "'What do you make of it, Mr. Cleek?' "'Not much in the way of a clue, Sir Henry. A clue to any possible intruder, I mean. If your artistic soul hadn't rebelled against bare steel, which would, of course, have soon rusted in this ammonia-impregnated atmosphere, and led you to put a coat of paint over the metal, there would have been no mark at all, the thing is so slight. I am of the opinion that Tolliver himself caused it, in short that it was made by either a pin or a cuff-button in his wristband when he was attacked and fell. But enlighten me upon a puzzling point, Sir Henry. What do you use coriander and oil of sassafras for in a stable? Coriander? Oil of sassafras? I don't know what the dickens they are. Have you found such things here? No, simply smelt them. The combination is not usual. Indeed, I know of but one race in the world who make any use of it, and they merely for a purpose which, of course, could not possibly exist here, unless— He allowed the rest of the sentence to go by default, and, turning, looked all round the place. For the first time he seemed to notice something unusual for the equipment of a stable, and regarded it with silent interest. It was nothing more nor less than a box covered with sheets of virgin cork, and standing on the floor, just under one of the windows, where the light and air could get to a weird-looking, rubbery-leaved, orchid-like plant, covered with ligulated scarlet blossoms which grew within it. "'Sir Henry,' he said, after a moment, "'may I ask how long it is since you were in South America?' "'I? Never was there in my life, Mr. Cleek, never.' "'Ah!' Then who connected with the hall has been? Oh, I see what you are driving at, said Sir Henry, following the direction of his gaze. That Patagonian plant, eh? That belonged to poor Tolliver. He had a strange fancy for ferns and rock plants and things of that description, 
and as that particular specimen happens to be one that does better in the atmosphere of a stable than elsewhere, he kept it in here. Who told him that it does better in the atmosphere of a stable? Lady Wilding's cousin, Mr. Sharpless. It was he who gave Tolliver the plant. Uh Aho! Then Mr. Sharpless has been to South America, has he? Why, yes. As a matter of fact, he comes from there. So also does Lady Wilding. I should have thought you would have remembered that, Mr. Cleek, when— But perhaps you have never heard. She— They— That is— Stammering confusedly and colouring to the temples. Up to seven months ago, Mr. Cleek, Lady Wilding was on the— uh, Music Hall stage. She and Mr. Sharpless were known as Signor Morando and La Belle Creole. They did a living statue turn together. It was highly artistic. People raved. I, er, uh, fell in love with the lady, and that's all. But it wasn't. For Cleek, reading between the lines, saw that the mad infatuation which had brought the lady a title and an over-generous husband had simmered down, as such things always do sooner or later, and that the marriage was very far from being a happy one. As a matter of fact, he learned later that the county, to a woman, had refused to accept Lady Wilding, that her ladyship, chafing under this ostracism, was for having a number of her old professional friends come down to visit her and make a time of it, and that, on Sir Henry's objecting, a violent quarrel had ensued, and the Reverend Ambrose Smear had come down to the hall in the effort to make peace. And he learned something else that night which gave him food for deep reflection. The Reverend Ambrose Smear, too, had been to South America, and when he met that gentleman, well, in spite of the fact that Sir Henry thought so highly of him, and it was known that his revival meetings had done a world of good, Cleek did not fancy the Reverend Ambrose Smear any more than he fancied the trainer, Logan. But to return to the present. By this time the late falling twilight of May had begun to close in, and presently, as the day was now done and the night approaching, Logan led in Black Riot from the paddock, followed by a slim, sallow-featured, small-moustached man bearing a shotgun, and dressed in grey tweeds. Sir Henry, who it was plain to see had a liking for the man, introduced this newcomer to Cleek as the South American, Mr. Andrew Sharpless. "'That's the English of it, Mr. Cleek,' said the latter jovially, but with an undoubted Spanish twist to the tongue. I wouldn't have you risk breaking your jaw with the Brazilian original. Delighted to meet you, sir. I hope to heaven you will get at the bottom of this diabolical thing. What do you think, Henry? Lamson Bowles jockey was over in this neighbourhood this afternoon, trying to see how Black Riot shapes, of course, the bounder. Fortunately, I saw him skulking along the other side of the hedge and gave him two minutes in which to make himself scarce. If he hadn't, if he had come a step nearer to the mare, I'd have shot him down like a dog. That's right, Logan, put her up for the night, old chap, and I'll get out your bedding. Oi, said Logan through his clamped teeth, and God help man or devil that comes an her this night. God help him, Lunnon mister, that's all I say. Then he passed into the steel room with the mare, attended her for the night, and coming out a minute or two later, locked her up and gave Sir Henry the key. Broke her and trained her, I did, and willing to die for her I am, if I can't pull on through no other way, he said, pausing before Cleek and giving him a black look. A derby winner hers cut out for Lunnon, mister, and a derby winner hers gonna be in spite of all the lamps and bullses and the low-down horse nobblers in Christendom. Then he switched round and walked over to Sharpless, 
who had taken a pillow and a bundle of blankets from a convenient cupboard, and was making a bed of them on the floor at the foot of the locked steel door. "'Thank ye, sir. Obliged to him, sir,' said Logan, as Sharpless hung up the shotgun, and, with a word to the baronet, excused himself, and went in to dress for dinner. Then he faced round again on Cleek, who was once more sniffing the air, and pointed to the rude bed. "'There's where Ted Logan sleeps this night. There,' he went on suddenly. "'And them as tries to get at Black Riot comes to grips with me first, me and the shotgun Mr. Sharpless has left. Ah, and if I shoot, Lunnon, mister, I shoot to kill.' "'Do me a favour, Sir Henry,' said Cleek. "'For reasons of my own, I want to be in this stable alone for the next ten minutes.' and after that let no one come into it until morning. I won't be accountable for this man's life if he stops in here to-night, and for his sake as well as for your own I want you to forbid him to do so. Logan seemed to go nearly mad with rage at this. "'I won't listen to it! I will stop here! I will! I will!' he cried out in a passion. "'Who comes or find I here waiting to come to grips with an—' "'I won't stop out! I won't! Don't unlisten to Lennon, Mr. Sir Henry! For God's sake, don't!' "'I am afraid I must in this instance, Logan. You are far too suspicious, my good fellow. Mr. Cleek doesn't want to get at the mare. He wants to protect her, to keep anybody else from getting at her. So join the guard outside if you are so eager. You must let him have his way.' and in spite of all Logan's pleading, Cleek did have his way. Protesting, swearing, almost weeping, the trainer was turned out and the doors closed, leaving Cleek alone in the stable, and the last Logan and Sir Henry saw of him until he came out and rejoined them, he was standing in the middle of the floor with his hands on both hips, staring fixedly at the impromptu bed in front of the steel-room door. "'Put on the guard now, and see that nobody goes into the place until morning, Sir Henry,' he said, when he came out and rejoined them some minutes later. "'Logan, you silly fellow, you'll do no good fighting against fate. Make the best of it, and stop where you are.'" End of chapter 13「Chapter fourteen of Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces by Thomas W. Hanshew. Chapter fourteen. That night Cleek met Lady Wilding for the first time. He found her what he afterwards termed a splendid animal, beautiful, statuesque, more of Juno than of Venus, and freely endowed with the languorous temperament and the splendid, earthy loveliness which grows nowhere but under tropical skies and in the shadow of palm groves and the flame of cactus flowers. She showed him but scant courtesy, however, for she was but a poor hostess, and after dinner carried her cousin away to the billiard room and left her husband to entertain the Reverend Ambrose and the detective as best he could. Cleek needed but little entertaining, however, for in spite of his serenity he was full of the case on hand, and kept wandering in and out of the house and upstairs and down until eleven o'clock came and bed claimed him with the rest. His last wakeful recollection was of the clock in the lower corridor, striking the first quarter after eleven. Then sleep claimed him, and he knew no more until all the stillness was suddenly shattered by a loud-voiced gong hammering out an alarm, and the sound of people tumbling out of bed and scurrying about in a panic of fright. He jumped out of bed, pulled on his clothing, and rushed out into the hall, only to find it alive with people and at their heads to Henry, with a dressing-gown thrown on over his pyjamas, and a bedroom candle in his shaking hand. "'The stable!' he cried out excitedly. "'Come on! Come on! For God's sake! 
Someone has touched the door of the steel room, and yet the place was left empty, empty. But it was no longer empty, as they found out when they reached it, for the doors had been flung open, the men who had been left on guard outside the stables were now inside it, the electric lights were in full blaze, the shotgun still hanging where Sharpless had left it, the impromptu bed was tumbled and tossed in a man's death agony, and at the foot of the steel door Logan lay, curled up in a heap, and stone dead. He would get in, Sir Henry. He'd have shot one or the other of us if we hadn't let him, said one of the outer guards, as Sir Henry and Cleek appeared. He would lie before the door and watch, sir. He simply would. And God have mercy on him, poor chap. He was faithful to the last. And the last might not have come for years, the fool, if he had only obeyed, said Cleek then lapsed into silence, and stood staring at a dust of white flour on the red-tiled floor, and at a thin, wavering line that broke the even surface of it. It was perhaps two minutes later when the entire household, mistress, guests, and servants alike, came trooping across the open space between the hall and the stables in a state of semi-desabillé, but in that brief space of time friendly hands had reverently lifted the body of the dead man from its place before the steel door, and Sir Henry was nervously fitting the key to the lock in a frantic effort to get in and see if Black Riot was safe. "'Dios! What is it? What has happened?' cried Lady Wilding as she came hurrying in, followed closely by Sharpless and the Reverend Ambrose Smear. Then, catching sight of Logan's body, she gave a little scream and covered her eyes. "'The trainer, Andrew! The trainer now!' she went on half hysterically. "'Another death! Another! Surely they have got the wretch at last!' "'The mare! The mare, Henry! Is she safe?' exclaimed Sharpless excitedly, as he whirled away from his cousin's side and bore down upon the baronet. "'Give me the key! You're too nervous!' and, taking it from him, unlocked the steel room and passed swiftly into it. In another instant Black Riot was led out, uninjured, untouched, in the very pink of condition, and in spite of the tragedy in the dead man's presence, one or two of the guards were so carried away that they essayed a cheer. "'Stop that! Stop it instantly!' rapped out Sir Henry, facing round upon them. "'What's a horse, even the best, beside the loss of an honest life like that?' and flung out a shaking hand in the direction of dead Logan. "'It will be the story of last night over again, of course. You heard his scream, heard his fall, but he was dead when you got to him. Dead, and you found no one here?' "'Not a soul, Sir Henry. The doors were all locked. No grill is missing from any window. No one is in the loft. No one in any of the stalls. No one in any crook or corner of the place.' "'Send for the constable, the justice of the peace, anybody,' chimed in the Reverend Ambrose Smear at this. "'Henry, will you never be warned? Never take these awful lessons to heart. This sinful practice of racing horses for money. Oh, hush, hush! Don't preach me a sermon now, uncle, interposed Sir Henry. My heart's torn, my mind crazed by this abominable thing. Poor old Logan, poor faithful old chap. Oh! He whirled and looked over at Cleek, who still stood inactive staring at the flower-dusted floor. "'And they said that no mystery was too great for you to get to the bottom of it, no riddle too complex for you to find the answer. Can't you do something? Can't you suggest something? Can't you see any glimmer of light at all?' 
Cleek looked up, and that curious smile which Narkom knew so well, and would have known had he been there, was the danger signal, looped up one corner of his mouth. "'I fancy it is all light, Sir Henry,' he said. "'I may be wrong, but I fancy it is merely a question of comparative height. "'Do I puzzle you by that? "'Well, let me explain. "'Lady Wilding there is one height, Mr. Sharpless is another, and I am a third. "'And if they two were to place themselves side by side, and say about four inches apart, "'and I were to stand immediately behind them, the difference would be most apparent. There you are. Do you grasp it? Not in the least. Bothered if I do either, supplemented Sharpless. It all sounds like Tommy Rot to me. Does it? said Cleek. Then let me explain it by illustration. And he walked quietly towards them. "'Lady Wilding, will you oblige me by standing here? "'Thank you very much. "'Now, if you please, Mr. Sharpless, "'will you stand beside her ladyship "'while I take up my place here, immediately behind you both? "'That's it, exactly. "'A little nearer, please, just a little, "'so that your left elbow touches her ladyship's right. "'Now, then.' "'His two hands moved briskly, there was a click-click, and after it, "'There you are. That explains it, my good Mr. and Mrs. Filippo Bucarelli. That explains it completely.' And as he stepped aside on saying this, those who were watching, those who heard Lady Wilding's scream and Mr. Sharpless's snarling oath, and saw them vainly try to spring apart and dart away, saw also that a steel handcuff was on the woman's right wrist, its mate on the man's left one, and that they were firmly chained together. "'In the name of heaven, man!' began Sir Henry, appalled by this, and growing red and white by rapid turns. "'I fancy that heaven has very little to do with this precious pair, Sir Henry,' interposed Cleek. "'You want the two people who are accountable for these diabolical crimes, and there they stand.' "'What? Do you mean to tell me that Sharpless, that my wife—' "'Don't give the lady a title to which she has not and never had any legal right, Sir Henry. "'If it had ever occurred to you to emulate my example to-night and search the lady's effects—' you would have found that she was christened Enrica Dolores Torjado, and that she was married to Signor Filippo Bucarelli here at Valparaiso in Chile three years ago, and that her marriage to you was merely a clever little scheme to get hold of a pot of money and share it with her rascally husband. "'It's a lie!' snarled out the male prisoner. "'It's an infernal policeman's lie! You never found any such thing!' "'Pardon me, but I did,' replied Cleek serenely. "'And what's more, I found the little phial of coriander and oil of sassafras in your room, senor, and I shall finish off the Minga worm in another ten minutes.' Bucarelli and his wife gave a mingled cry, and, chained together though they were, made a wild bolt for the door, only, however, to be met on the threshold by the local constable, to whom Cleek had dispatched a note some hours previously. "'Thank you, Mr. Philpotts. You are very prompt,' he said. "'There are your prisoners, nicely trussed and waiting for you. Take them away. We are quite done with them here.' "'Sir Henry,' he turned to the baronet, if Black Riot is fitted to win the Derby, she will win it, and you need have no more fear for her safety. No one has ever for one moment tried to get at her. You yourself were the one that precious pair were after, and the bait was your life assurance. 
by killing off the watchers over Black Riot one by one, they knew that there would come a time when, being able to get no one else to take the risk of guarding the horse and sleeping on that bed before the steel-room door, you would do it yourself, and when that time came, they would have had you. But how? By what means? By one of the most diabolical imaginable. Among the reptiles of Patagonia, Sir Henry, there is one, a species of black adder, known in the country as the mingo worm, whose bite is more deadly than that of the rattler or the copperhead, and as rapid in its action as prussic acid itself. It has, too, a great velocity of movement, and a peculiar power of springing and hurling itself upon its prey. The Patagonians are a barbarous people in the main, and, like all barbarous people, are vengeful, cunning, and subtle. A favourite revenge of theirs upon unsuspecting enemies is to get within touch of them, and secretly to smear a mixture of coriander and oil of sassafras upon some part of their bodies, and then either to lure or drive them into the forest. For by a peculiar arrangement of Mother Nature, this mixture has a fascination, a maddening effect upon the mingo worm, just as a red rag has on a bull, and, enraged by the scent, it finds the spot smeared with it and delivers its deadly bite. Good heaven! How horrible! And you mean to tell me that they employed one of these deadly reptiles in this case? Yes, Sir Henry. I suspected it the very moment I smelt the odour of the coriander and sassafras. But I suspected that an animal or a reptile of some kind was at the bottom of the mystery at a prior period. That is why I wanted the flower. Look, do you see where I sifted it over this spot near the Patagonian plant? And do you see those serpentine tracks through the middle of it? The mingo worm is there, in that box at the roots of that plant. Now see. He caught up a horse blanket, spread it on the floor, lifted the box and plant, set them down in the middle of it, and with a quick gathering up of the ends of the blanket, converted it into a bag, and tied it round with a hitching strap. Get spades, forks, anything, and dig a hole outside in the paddock, he went on. A deep hole, a yard deep at the least. Then get some straw, some paraffin, turpentine, anything that will burn furiously and quickly, and we will soon finish the little beast. The servants flew to obey, and when the hole was dug, he carried the bag out and lowered it carefully into it, covered it with straw, drenched this with a gallon or more of lamp oil, and rapidly applied a match to it, and sprang back. A moment later, those who were watching saw a small black snake make an ineffectual effort to leap out of the blazing mass, fall back into the flames, and disappear for ever. "'The method of procedure,' said Cleek, answering the baronet's query, as the latter was pouring out what he called a nerve settler prior to following the Reverend Ambrose's example and going to bed. "'Very cunning, and yet very, very simple, Sir Henry. Bucarelli made a practice, as I saw this evening, of helping the chosen watcher to make his bed on the floor in front of the door to the steel room. But during the time he was removing the blankets from the cupboard, his plan was to smear them with the coriander and sassafras, and so arrange the top blanket that, when the watcher lay down, the stuff touched his neck or throat and made that the point of attack for the snake, whose fangs make a small, round spot, not bigger than a knitting-needle, which is easily passed over by those not used to looking for such a thing. There was such a spot on Tolliver's throat, such another at the base of Murple's skull, and there is a third in poor Logan's left temple. No, thank you, no more to-night, Sir Henry. "'Alcohol and I are never more than speaking acquaintances at the best of times. "'But if you really wish to do me a kindness—' "'I don't think there is room to doubt that, Mr. Cleek. 
if I am certain of anything in this world, I am certain of Black Riot's success on Wednesday, and that success I feel I shall owe to you. Money can't offset some debts, you know, and if there is anything in the world I can do, you have only to let me know. Thank you, said Cleek. Then invite me to spend tomorrow here, and give me the freedom of those superb gardens. My senses are drunk already with the scent of your hyacinths, and if I might have a day among them, I should be as near happy as makes no difference. He had his day, breaking it only to phone up to Clarges Street and quiet any possible fears upon Dollops's part, and if ever man was satisfied, that man was he. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces by Thomas W. Hanshew. Chapter 15. It was late on the afternoon of the day following when he turned up at Clarges Street and threw Dollops into a very transport of delight at the bare sight of him. "'Crumbs, Governor, but I am glad to see you, sir,' said the boy, with a look of positive adoration. "'A fish out of water ain't a patch to what I've felt like, Lord, no. Why, sir, it's the first time you've ever been away from me since you took me on, and the dreams I've had is enough to drive a body fair dotty. I've seen parties of sticking knives in your back, and putting poison in your food, and doing the Lord knows what not to you, sir.' and every blessed nerve in my body has been a-doing of a constant shake, like a jellyfish on a cold day. Cleek laughed, and, catching him by the shoulder, whirled him round, looked at him, and then clapped him on the back. "'Look here! Don't you get to worrying and to developing nerves, young man,' he said, "'or I shall have to ship you off somewhere for a long rest, and I'm just beginning to feel as if I couldn't do without you.' What you want is a change, and what I want is the river, so if there is no message from the yard— There isn't, sir. Good. Then phone through to Mr. Narkom, and tell him that you and I are going for a few days up the river as far as Henley, and that we're going to break it on Wednesday to go to the Derby. Governor! God's truth, sir! You aren't never a gonna give me two such treats as that! From now till Thursday with just you! "'Just you, sir. I'll go balmy on the crumpet. I'll get to sticking straws in me blooming air. "'You get to the telephone and send that message to the yard, if you know when you're well off,' said Cleek, laughing. "'And after that, out with the kit-bag, and in with such things as we shall need. And, hello, what's this thing?' "'A necktie and a rosebush, what I took the liberty of buying for you, sir.' "'Bein' as you give me ten shillings for myself, said Dollops sheepishly. "'I've been a-keepin' of my eye on that rose-bush and that necktie for a week, sir. "'I hope you'll take em, Governor, and not think me presuming, sir.' Cleek faced round and looked at him, a long look, without saying anything. Then he screwed round on his heel and walked to the window. "'It is very nice and very thoughtful of you, Dollops,' he said presently, his voice a little thick, his tones a little uneven. "'But don't be silly and waste your money, my lad. Lay it by. You may need it one day. Now toddle on and get things ready for our outing.' But afterwards, when the boy had gone and he was alone in the room, he walked back to the potted rose-bush and touched its buds lovingly and stood leaning over it and saying nothing for a long time. And though the necktie that hung on its branches was a harlequin thing of red and green and violent purple, when he came to dress for that promised outing, he put it on, and adjusted it as tenderly, wore it as proudly, as ever knight of old wore the colours of his lady. "'You look a fair treat in it, sir.' said Dollops delightedly and admiringly, when he came in later and saw that he had it on. 
and if anything had been wanting to make him quite, quite happy, it was wanting no more. Or, if it had been, the night that came down and found them housed in a little old-world inn, with a shining river at its door and the hush and the odorous darkness of the country lanes about it, must of itself have supplied the omission. For when all the house was still and all the lights were out, he crept from his bed and curled up like a dog on the mat before Cleek's door, and would not have changed places with an emperor. They were up and on the river, master and man, almost as soon as the dawn itself, taking their morning plunge under a sky that was but just changing the tints of rose to those of saffron, before they merged into the actual light of day. And to the boy the man seemed almost a god in that dim light, which showed but an ivory shoulder lifting now and again as he struck outwards and deft his way through a yielding yellow-gray waist that leapt in little lilac-hued ripples to his chin, and thence wavered off behind him in dancing lines of light. And once, when he heard him lift up his voice and sing as he swam, he felt sure that he must be a god, that that alone could explain why he had found him so different from other men, and cared for him as he had never cared for any human thing before. From dawn to dark that day was one of unalloyed delight to him. Never before had the starved soul of him fed all his life, when it was fed at all, from the drippings of the flesh-pots and the leavings of the city, found any savour in the insipid offerings of the country. Never before had he known what charms lie on a river's breast, what spells of magic a blossoming hedge and the white candles of a horse-chestnut tree may weave, and never before had a meadow been anything to him but a simple grass-grown field. Today nature through this man who was so essentially bred in the very womb of her, spoke to his understanding, and found her words not lost on air. The dormant things within the boy had awakened. Life spoke, hope sang, and between them all the world was changed. Yesterday he had looked upon this day of idling in the country as a pleasant interlude, as a happy prologue to those greater delights that would come when he at last went to Epsom and really saw the famous race for the Derby. Today he was sorry that anything, even so great a thing as that, must come to disturb such placid happiness as this. And yet, when the wondrous Wednesday came, and he was actually on his way to Epsom Downs at last, ah well! Joy is elastic. Youth is a time of many dreams. And who blames a boy for being delighted that one of them is coming true at last? Cleek did not, at all events. Indeed, Cleek aided and abetted him in all his boisterous outbursts from first to last, and was quite as excited as he when the event of the meeting, the great race for the famous Derby Stakes, was put up at last. Indeed, he was a bit wilder, if anything, than the boy himself, when the flag fell, and the whole field swept by in one thunderous rush, with Minnow in the lead, and Black Riot far and away behind. Nor did his excitement abate when, as the whole cavalcade swung onwards over the green turf, with the yelling thousands waving and shouting about it, Sir Henry Wilding's mare began to lessen that lead, and foot by foot, to creep up towards the head. He shouted then, as wildly as Dollops himself, as wildly as any man present. He jumped up on his seat and waved his hat. He thumped Dollops on the back and cried, She's creeping up! She's creeping up! Stick to it, old chap! Stick to it! Give her a head, you fool! She'll do it! By God, she'll do it! Hurrah! Hurrah! And was shouted down, and even seized and pulled down by others whose view he obstructed, and whose interest and excitement were as great as his. Onwards they flew, horses and riders, the whole pounding, mixing, ever-changing mass of them, 
jackets and caps of every hue flashing here and there, now in a huddled mass, now with this one in the lead and again with that, a vast, ever-moving, ever-altering kaleidoscope that was presently hidden entirely from the main mass of the onlookers by the surging crowd, the mass of drags and carriages of all sorts in the huge square of the central enclosure, and most of all by the people who stood up on seats and wheels and even the tops of the vehicles. Then, for a little time, the roars came from a distance only, from those in the enclosure who alone could see. Then neared and neared and grew in volume as the unseen racers pounded onward and came pelting up the long stretch towards Tattenham Corner, and by and by they swung into view again, still a huddled mass, still so closely packed together that the positions of the individual horses was a matter of uncertainty. But always the roaring sound went on, and always it came nearer and nearer, until a thousand voices took it up at the foot of the grandstand, and other thousands bellowed it up and up from tier to tier to the very roof. For of a sudden that blaze of caps and jackets, that huddle of horses red and horses grey, horses black and horses roan, piebald, white, every colour that a horse may be, had come at last to Tattenham Corner, and burst into the full view of everybody. Yet as they came, a black mare, hugging the railed enclosure on the inner side of the sweep, arrowed forward with a sudden spurt, came like a rocket to the fore, and all the earth and all the sky seemed to ring with the cry, Wilding! Wilding! Black Riot leads! Black Riot leads! She did and kept it to the end. In half a minute her number was up. Yelling thousands were tumbling out upon the field to cheer her, to cheer her rider, to cheer her proud owner, when he came out to lead her to the paddock and the weighing-room, and to feel in that moment the proudest and the happiest man in England. And of those not the least excited and delighted, was Cleek. Carried away by enthusiasm, he had risen again in his seat, and with his hat held aloft upon a walking-stick, was waving and stamping and shouting enthusiastically, Black Riot wins! Black Riot! Black Riot! Bully boy! Bully boy! And so he was still shouting, when he felt a hand touch him, and looking round, saw Mr. Narkom. "'Ripping, wasn't it, old chap?' said the superintendent. "'No wonder you're excited, considering what interest you have. "'Been looking for you, my dear fellow. "'Knew, of course, from your telling me that you would be here today, "'but shouldn't have been able to identify you but for the presence of young Dollops here. "'I say, you're not going to stop now that the great race is over, are you? "'The rest won't amount to anything.' "'No, I shall not stop,' said Cleek. "'Why, do you want me?' "'Yes. Leonard's outside with the limousine. Hop into it, will you, and meet me at the fiddle and horseshoe between Shepherd's Bush and Acton. It's only half-past three, and the limousine can cover the distance in less than no time. Can't go with you. Got to round up my men here first. Join you shortly, however. McTavish has a sixty-horsepower Mercedes, and— He'll rush me over almost on your heels. Let Dollops go home by train, and you'll meet me as I've asked, will you? Yes, said Cleek. And so the joyous holiday came to an unexpected end. Parting from Dollops, and leaving the boy to journey on to Clarges Street alone, he fared forth to find Leonard and the red limousine, and was whirled away in record time to the inn of the fiddle and horseshoe. End of chapter 15。Chapter 16 of Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces by Thomas W. Hanshu. 
Chapter Sixteen. It had but just gone five when Narkom walked into the little bar parlour and found him standing there, looking out on the quaint, old-fashioned bowling green that lay all steeped in sunshine and zoned with the froth of pear and apple blossoms, thick piled above the time-stained bricks of an enclosing wall. "'What a model of punctuality you are, old chap!' the superintendent said, nodding approvingly. "'Wait a moment while I go and order tea, and then we will get down to business in real earnest. Shan't be long.' "'Pray don't hurry yourself on my account, Mr. Narkom,' returned Cleek, coming down to earth out of a mental airship. "'I could do with another hour of that,' nodding toward the view, "'and still wonder where the time had gone. These quaint old inns, which the march of what we are pleased to call progress, is steadily crowding off the face of the land, are always deeply interesting to me. I love them. What a day! What a picture! What a sky! As blue as what Dollops calls the Merry Geranium Sea! I'd give a Jew's eye for a handful of those apple blossoms. They are divine! Narkom hastened from the room without replying. The strain of poetry underlying the character of this strange, inscrutable man, his amazing love of nature, his moments of almost womanish weakness and sentiment, astonished and mystified him. It was as if a hawk had acquired the utterly useless trick of fluting like a nightingale, and being himself wholly without imagination, he could not comprehend it in the smallest degree. When he returned a few minutes later, however, the idealist seemed to have simmered down into the materialist, the extraordinary to have become merged in the ordinary, for he found his famous ally no longer studying the beauties of nature, but giving his whole attention to the sordid commonplaces of man, for he was standing before a glaringly printed bill one of many that were tacked upon the walls, which set forth in amazing pictures and double-leaded type the wonders that were to be seen daily and nightly at Olympia, where, for a month past, Van Zant's Royal Belgian Circus and world-famed menagerie had been holding forth to crowded and delighted audiences. Much was made of two star turns upon this lurid bill. Mademoiselle Marie de Zanoni, the beautiful and peerless bareback equestrienne, the most daring lady rider in the universe, for the one, and for the other, Chevalier Adrian di Roma, king of the animal world, with his great aggregation of savage and ferocious wild beasts, including the famous man-eating African lion Nero the largest and most ferocious animal of its species in captivity. And under this latter announcement there was a picture of a young and handsome man, literally smothered with medals, lying at full length, with his arms crossed, and his head in the wide-open jaws of a snarling, wild-eyed lion. My dear chap! You really do make me believe that there actually is such a thing as instinct, said Narkom as he came in. Fancy your selecting that particular bill out of all the others in the room. What an abnormal individual you are. Why, has it anything to do with the case you have in hand? Anything to do with it? My dear fellow, it is the case. I can't imagine what drew your attention to it. Can't you? said Cleek, with a half-smile. Then he stretched forth his hand and touched the word Nero with the tip of his forefinger. That did. Things awaken a man's memory occasionally, Mr. Narkom, and tell me, isn't that the beast there was such a stir about in the newspapers a fortnight or so ago? the lion that crushed the head of a man in full view of the audience. Yes, replied Narkom with a slight shudder. Awful thing, wasn't it? Gave me the creeps to read about it. 
The chap who was killed, poor beggar, was a mere boy, not twenty, son of the Chevalier de Roma himself. There was a great stir about it. Talk of the authorities forbidding the performance and all that sort of thing. They never did, however, for on investigation— Ah, the tea at last, thank fortune. Come, sit down, my dear fellow, and we'll talk whilst we refresh ourselves. Landlady, see that we are not disturbed, will you, and that nobody is admitted but the parties I mentioned. Clients? queried Cleek, as the door closed and they were alone together. Yes, one— Mademoiselle Zilli, the Chevalier's only daughter, a slack-wire artist, the other Signor Scarmelli, a trapeze performer, who is the lady's fiancé. Ah, then our friend the Chevalier is not so young as the picture on the bill would have us believe he is. No, he is not. As a matter of fact, he's considerably past forty, and is, or rather was up to six months ago, a widower with three children, two sons and a daughter. "'I suppose,' said Cleek, helping himself to a buttered scone, "'I am to infer from what you say that at the period you mentioned, six months ago, the intrepid gentleman showed his courage yet more forcibly by taking a second wife, young or old?' "'Young,' said Narkom in reply. "'Very young.' "'Not yet four-and-twenty, in fact, and very, very beautiful. "'That is she who is featured on the bill "'as the star of the equestrian part of the programme, "'Mademoiselle Marie de Zanoni. "'So far as I've been able to gather, "'the affair was a love-match. "'The lady, it appears, had no end of suitors "'both in and out of the profession.' It has even been hinted that she could, had she been so minded, have married an impressionable young Austrian nobleman of independent means who was madly in love with her, but she appears to have considered it preferable to become an old man's darling, so to speak, and to have selected the middle-aged chevalier rather than someone whose age is nearer her own. "'Nothing new in that, Mr. Narkom. "'Young women before Mademoiselle Marie de Zanoni's day "'have been known to love elderly men sincerely. "'Young Mrs. Baudry in the case of the nine-fingered skeleton "'is an example of that. "'Still, such marriages are not common, I admit, "'so when they occur one naturally looks to see "'if there may not be other considerations "'at the bottom of the attachment. "'Is the Chevalier well-to-do? "'Has he expectations of any kind?' "'To the contrary. "'He has nothing but the salary he earns, "'which is by no means so large as the public imagines. "'And as he comes of a long line of circus performers, "'all of whom died early and poor, "'expectations, as you put it, "'do not enter into the affair at all. "'Apparently the lady did marry him for love of him, "'as she professes and as he imagines. "'Although, if what I hear is true, "'it would appear that she has lately outgrown that love. "'In short, that a Romeo more suitable to her age "'has recently joined the show, "'in the person of a rider called Signor Antonio Martinelli, "'that he has fallen desperately in love with her, and that—' "'He bit off his words short and rose to his feet, the door had opened suddenly to admit a young man and a young woman, who entered in a state of nervous excitement. "'Ah, my dear Mr. Scarmelli, you and Miss Zelie are most welcome,' continued the superintendent. "'My friend and I were this moment talking about you.' Cleek glanced across the room, and, as was customary with him, made up his mind instantly. The girl, despite her association with the arena, was a modest, unaffected little thing of about eighteen. The man was a straight-looking, clear-eyed, boyish-faced young fellow of about eight-and-twenty, well, but by no means flashily, dressed, and carrying himself with the air of one who respects himself and demands the respect of others. He was evidently an Englishman, despite his Italian nom de théâtre, 
and Cleek decided out of hand that he liked him. "'We can shelve George Headland in this instance, Mr. Narkom,' he said, as the superintendent led forward the pair for the purpose of introducing them, and suffered himself to be presented in the name of Cleek. The effect of this was electrical, would, in fact, had he been a vain man, have been sufficient to gratify him to the fullest, for the girl, with a little, oh, of amazement, drew back, and stood looking at him with a sort of awe that rounded her eyes and parted her lips, while the man leaned heavily upon the back of a convenient chair, and looked and acted as one utterly overcome. Cleek, he repeated, after a moment's despairful silence. You, sir, are that great man? This is a misfortune indeed. A misfortune, my friend? Why a misfortune, pray? Do you think the riddle you have brought is beyond my powers? Oh, no, not that, never that, he made reply. If there is any one man in the world who could get at the bottom of it, could solve the mystery of the lion's change, the lion's smile, you are that man, sir, you. That is the misfortune, that you could do it, and yet I cannot expect it, cannot avail myself of this great opportunity. Look, I am doing it all on my own initiative, sir, all for the sake of Zelie and that dear, lovable old chap, her father. I have saved fifty-eight pounds, Mr. Cleek. I had hoped that that might tempt a clever detective to take up the case. "'But what is such a sum to such a man as you?' "'If that is all that stands in the way, don't let it worry you, my good fellow,' said Cleek, with a smile. "'Put your fifty-eight pounds in your pocket against your wedding day, and good luck to you. I'll take the case for nothing. Now then, what is it? What the dickens did you mean just now when you spoke about the lion's change and the lion's smile?' "'What lion, Nero? "'Here, sit down and tell me all about it.' "'There is little enough to tell, heaven knows,' said young Scarmelli, with a sigh, accepting the invitation after he had gratefully wrung Cleek's hand, and his fiancée, with a burst of happy tears, had caught it up as it slipped from his, and had covered it with thankful kisses. "'That, Mr. Cleek, is where the greatest difficulty lies.' There is so little to explain that has any bearing upon the matter at all. It is only that the lion, Nero, that is, the chevalier's special pride and special pet, seems to have undergone some great and inexplicable change, as though he is at times under some evil spell, which lasts but a moment and yet makes that moment a tragical one. It began, no one knows why nor how, two weeks ago, when, without hint or warning, he killed the person he loved best in all the world, the Chevalier's eldest son. Doubtless you have heard of that. Yes, said Cleek, but what you are now telling me sheds a new light upon the matter. Am I to understand, then, that all that talk on the bills and in the newspapers about the lion being a savage and a dangerous one is not true, and that he really is attached to his owner and his owner's family? That is the truth, replied Scarmelli. Nero is, in fact, the gentlest, most docile, most intelligent beast of his kind living. In short, sir, there's not a bite in him and added to that he is over thirty years old. Zelie, Miss de Roma, will tell you that he was born in captivity, that from his earliest moment he has been the pet of her family, that he was, so to speak, raised with her and her brothers, that as children they often slept with him, that he will follow those he loves like any dog, fight for them, protect them, let them tweak his ears and pull his tail without showing the slightest resentment, even though they may actually hurt him. Indeed, he is so general a favourite, Mr. Cleek, that there isn't an attendant connected with the show who would not, and indeed has not at some time,
put his head in the beast's mouth, just as the chevalier does in public, certain that no harm could possibly come of the act. You may judge, then, sir, what a shock, what a horrible surprise it was, when the tragedy of two weeks ago occurred. Often, to add zest to the performance, the chevalier varies it by allowing his children to put their heads into Nero's mouth, instead of doing so himself, merely making a fake of it that he has the lion under such control that he will respect any command given by him. That is what happened on that night. Young Henri was chosen to put his head into Nero's mouth, and did so without fear or hesitation. He took the beast's jaws and pulled them apart, and laid his head within them, as he had done a hundred times before. But of a sudden, an appalling, an uncanny thing happened. It was as though some supernatural power laid hold of the beast, and made a thing of horror of what a moment before had been a noble-looking animal. For suddenly a strange hissing noise issued from its jaws, its lips curled upward until it smiled, smiled, Mr. Cleek. Oh, the ghastliest, most awful, most blood-curdling smile imaginable, and then, with a sort of mingled snarl and bark, it clamped its jaws together and crushed the boy's head as though it were an eggshell. He put up his hands and covered his eyes as if to shut out some appalling vision, and for a moment or two nothing was heard but the low sobbing of the victim's sister. "'As suddenly as that change had come over the beast, Mr. Cleek,' Scarmelli went on presently, "'just so suddenly it passed, and it was the docile, affectionate animal it had been for years. It seemed to understand that some harm had befallen its favourite, for Henri was its favourite, and curling itself up beside his body it licked his hands, and moaned disconsolately in a manner almost human. That's all there is to tell, sir, save that at times the horrid change, the appalling smile, repeat themselves when either the chevalier or his son bend to put a head within its jaws, and but for their watchfulness and quickness the tragedy of that other awful night would surely be repeated. Sir, it is not natural. I know now— as surely as if the lion itself had spoken, that some one is at the bottom of this ghastly thing, that some human agency is at work, some unknown enemy of the Chevalier's is doing something, God alone knows what or why, to bring about his death as his son's was brought about. And here, for the first time, the Chevalier's daughter spoke. "'I tell him all, Jim,' "'Tell him all,' she said, in her pretty broken English. "'Monsieur, may the good God in heaven forgive me if I wrong her. "'But, but, ah, Monsieur Cleek, sometimes I feel that she, my stepmother, and that man, that rider, "'who knows not how to ride as the artist should, monsieur, I cannot help it, "'but I feel that they are at the bottom of it.' "'Yes, but why?' queried Cleek. I have heard of your father's second marriage, mademoiselle, and of this Signor Antonio Martinelli, to whom you allude. Mr. Narkom has told me. But why should you connect these two persons with this inexplicable thing? Does your father do so, too? Oh, no! Oh, no! she answered excitedly. He does not even know that we suspect Jim and I. He loves her, monsieur, it would kill him to doubt her. Then why should you? Because I cannot help it, monsieur. God knows I would if I could, for I care for her dearly. I am grateful to her for making my father happy. My brothers, too, cared for her. We believed she loved him. We believed it was because of that she married him. And yet, and yet... Ah, monsieur, how can I fail to feel as I do when this change in the lion came with that man's coming? And she, 
Ah, monsieur, she is always with him. Why does she carry favour of him and his rich friend? He has a rich friend, then? Yes, monsieur. The company was in difficulties. Monsieur Van Zandt, the proprietor, could not make it pay, and it was upon the point of disbanding. But suddenly this indifferent performer, this rider, who is, after all, but a poor amateur, and not fit to appear with a company of trained artists, suddenly this Signor Martinelli comes to Monsieur Van Zandt to say that if he will engage him, he has a rich friend, one Signor Sperati, a Brazilian coffee planter, who will back the show with his money and buy a partnership in it. Of course, Monsieur Van Zandt accepted, and since then, this Signor Sperati has travelled everywhere with us, has had the entree like one of us, and his friend, the bad rider, has fairly bewitched my stepmother, for she is ever with him, ever with them both, and, and, ah, oh, mon Dieu, the lion smiles, and my people die. Why does it smile for no others? Why is it only they, my father, my brother, they alone? Is that a fact? said Cleek, turning to young Scarmelli. You say that all connected with the circus have so little fear of the beast that even attendants sometimes do this foolhardy trick. Does the lion never smile for any of those? Never, Mr. Cleek, never under any circumstances. Nor does it always smile for the chevalier and his son. That is the mystery of it. One never knows when it is going to happen. One never knows why it does happen. But if you could see that uncanny smile— I should like to, interposed Cleek. That is, if it might happen without any tragical result. Hmm. Nobody but the chevalier and the chevalier's son. And when does it happen in their case? During the course of the show, or when there is nobody about but those connected with it? Oh, always during the course of the entertainment, sir. Indeed, it has never happened at any other time. Never at all. Aha, uh -huh, said Cleek. Then it is only when they are dressed and made up for the performance, eh? Hmm, I see. Then he relapsed into silence for a moment, and sat tracing circles on the floor with the toe of his boot. But of a sudden— "'You came here directly after the matinee, I suppose?' he queried, glancing up at young Scarmelli. "'Yes. In fact, before it was wholly over.' "'I see. Then it is just possible that all the performers have not yet got into their civilian clothes. Couldn't manage to take me round behind the scenes, so to speak, if Mr. Narkom will lend us his motor to hurry us there. Could, eh? That's good. I think I'd like to have a look at that lion, and, if you don't mind, an introduction to the parties concerned. No, don't fear. We won't startle anybody by revealing my identity or the cause of the visit. Let us say that I am a vet to whom you have appealed for an opinion regarding Nero's queer conduct. All ready, Mr. Narkom? Thanks. Then let's be off. Two minutes later the red limousine was at the door, and stepping into it with his two companions he was whizzed away to Olympia, and the first step towards the solution of the riddle. End of chapter 16 Chapter Seventeen of Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces by Thomas W. Hanshu. Chapter Seventeen. As it is the custom of those connected with the world of the circus to eat, sleep, have their whole being, as it were, within the environment of the show to the total exclusion of hotels, boarding-houses, or outside lodgings of any sort, 
he found on his arrival at his destination the entire company assembled in what was known as the living tent, chatting, laughing, reading, playing games, and killing time generally, whilst waiting for the call to the dining tent, and this gave him an opportunity to meet all the persons connected with the case, from the chevalier himself to the Brazilian coffee-planter who was backing the show. He found this latter individual a somewhat sullen and taciturn man of middle age, who had more the appearance of an Austrian than a Brazilian, and with a swinging gait and an uprightness of bearing which were not to be misunderstood. Hmm, known military training, was Cleek's mental comment as soon as he saw the man walk got it in Germany, too. I know that peculiar swing. What's his little game, I wonder? And what's a Brazilian doing in the army of the Kaiser? And having been in it, what's he doing dropping into this line, backing a circus, and travelling with it like a bohemian? But although these thoughts interested him, he did not put them into words, nor take anybody into his confidence regarding them. As for the other members of the company, he found the indifferent rider, known as Signor Antonio Martinelli, an undoubted Irishman of about thirty years of age, extremely handsome, but with a certain shiftiness of the eye, which was far from inspiring confidence and with a trick of the tongue which suggested that his baptismal certificate probably bore the name of Antony Martin. He found, too, that all he had heard regarding the use and beauty of the chevalier's second wife was quite correct, and although she devoted herself a great deal to the Brazilian coffee-planter and the Irish-Italian Martinelli, she had a way of looking over at her middle-aged spouse without his knowledge, that left no doubt in Cleek's mind regarding the real state of her feelings towards the man. And last, but not least by any means, he found the Chevalier himself a frank, open-minded, open-hearted, lovable man, who ought not, in the natural order of things, to have an enemy in the world. Despite his highfalutin nom de théâtre, he was Belgian, a big, soft-hearted, easy-going, unsuspicious fellow, who worshipped his wife, adored his children, and loved every creature of the animal world. How well that love was returned, Cleek saw when he went with him to that part of the building where his animals were kept, and watched them nose his hand or lick his cheek whenever the opportunity offered. But Nero the lion was perhaps the greatest surprise of all, for so tame, so docile, so little feared was the animal that its cage door was open, and they found one of the attendants squatting cross-legged inside and playing with it as though it were a kitten. "'There he is, doctor,' said the chevalier, waving his hand towards the beast. "'Ah!' I will not believe that it was anything but an accident, sir. He loved my boy. He would hurt no one that is kind to him. Fetch him out, Tom, and let the doctor see him at close quarters. Despite all these assurances of the animal's docility, Cleek could not but remember what the creature had done, and, in consequence, did not feel quite at ease when it came lumbering out of the cage with the attendant and ranged up alongside of him, rubbing its huge head against the chevalier's arm after the manner of an affectionate cat. "'Don't be frightened, sir,' said Tom, noticing this. "'Nothing more than a big dog, sir. I had the care of him for eight years, I have, haven't I, chevalier? And never a growl or scratch out of him.' No smile for your old Tom, is there, Nero boy, eh? No fear. Ain't a thing as anybody does with him, sir, that I wouldn't do off-hand and feel quite safe. Even to putting your head in his mouth? queried Cleek. 
"'Lord, yes,' returned the man with a laugh. "'That's nothing. Done it many a day. Look here.' With that he pulled the massive jaws apart, and, bending down, laid his head within them. The lion stood perfectly passive, and did not offer to close his mouth until it was again empty. It was then that Cleek remembered and glanced round at young Scarmelli. He never smiles for any but the Chevalier and his son, I believe you said, he remarked. I wonder if the Chevalier himself would be as safe if he were to make a feint of doing that. For the Chevalier, like most of the other performers, had not changed his dress after the matinee, since the evening performance was soon to begin. And if, as Cleek had an idea, that the matter of costume and make-up had anything to do with the mystery of the thing, here surely was a chance to learn. "'Make a feint of it. Certainly I will, doctor,' the chevalier replied. "'But why a feint? Why not the actual thing?' "'No, please. At least, not until I have seen how the beast is likely to take it. Just put your head down close to his muzzle, chevalier. Go slow, please, and keep your head at a safe distance. The chevalier obeyed. Bringing his head down until it was on a level with the animal's own, he opened the ponderous jaws. The beast was as passive as before, and finding no trace of the coming of the mysterious and dreaded smile, he laid his face between the double row of gleaming teeth, held it there a moment, and then withdrew it uninjured. Cleek took his chin between his thumb and forefinger, and pinched it hard. What he had just witnessed would seem to refute the idea of either costume or make-up having any bearing upon the case. "'Did you do that today at the matinee performance, Chevalier?' he hazarded, after a moment's thoughtfulness. "'Oh, yes,' he replied. It was not my plan to do so, however. I alter my performance constantly to give variety. Today I had arranged for my little son to do the trick, but somehow— Ah, I am a foolish man, monsieur. I have odd fancies, odd whims, sometimes odd fears, since— since that awful night. Something came over me at the last moment— just as my boy came into the cage to perform the trick, I changed my mind. I would not let him do it. I thrust him aside and did the trick myself. Aho, uh -huh, said Cleek. Will the boy do it tonight, then, Chevalier? Perhaps, he made reply. He is still dressed for it. Look, here he comes now, monsieur, and my wife, and some of our good friends with him. Ah, they are so interested, they are anxious to hear what report you make upon Nero's condition. Cleek glanced round. Several members of the company were advancing towards them from the living tent. In the lead was the boy, a little fellow of about twelve years of age, fancifully dressed in tights and tunic. By his side was his stepmother, looking pale and anxious. But although both Signor Martinelli and the Brazilian coffee-planter came to the edge of the tent and looked out, it was observable that they immediately withdrew, and allowed the rest of the party to proceed without them. "'Dearest, I have just heard from Tom that you and the doctor are experimenting with Nero,' said the chevalier's wife, as she came up with the others and joined him. "'Oh, do be careful, do!' "'Much as I like the animal, Doctor, I shall never feel safe "'until my husband parts with it or gives up that ghastly trick.' "'My dearest, my dearest, how absurdly you talk!' interrupted her husband. "'You know well that without that my act would be commonplace, "'that no manager would want either it or me, "'and how pray should we live if that were to happen?' "'There would always be my salary. We could make that do.' "'as if I would consent to live upon your earnings, "'and add nothing myself. "'No, no, I shall never do that, never. "'It is not as though that foolish dream of long ago had come true, "'and I might hope one day to retire. "'I am of the circus, and of it I shall always remain.' 
I wish you might not. I wish the dream might come true even yet, she made reply. Why shouldn't it? Wilder ones have come true for other people. Why should they not for you? Before her husband could make any response to this, the whole trend of the conversation was altered by the boy. Father, he said, am I to do the trick tonight? Senor Sperati says it is silly of me to sit about or dress and ready if I am to do nothing, like a little super, instead of a performer and an artist. Oh, but that is not kind of the senor to say that, his father replied, soothing his ruffled feelings. You are an artist, of course. Never super, no, never. But if you shall do the trick or not, I cannot say. It will depend, as it did at the matinee. If I feel it is right, you shall do it. But if I feel it is wrong, then it must be no. You see, doctor, catching Cleek's eye, what a little enthusiast he is, and with how little fear. Yes, I do see, Chevalier, but I wonder if he would be willing to humour me in something. As he is not afraid, I've an odd fancy to see how he'd go about the thing. Would you mind letting him make the feint you yourself made a few minutes ago? Only I must insist that in this instant it be nothing more than a feint, Chevalier. Don't let him go too near at the time of doing it. Don't let him open the lion's jaws with his own hands. You do that. Do you mind? Of a certainty not, monsieur. Gustave, show the good doctor how you go about it when papa lets you do the trick. But you are not really to do it just yet. Only to bend the head near to Nero's mouth. Now then, come, see. As he spoke, he divided the lion's jaws and signalled the child to bend. He obeyed. Very slowly, the little head drooped nearer to the gaping, full-fanged mouth, very slowly and very carefully, for Cleek's hand was on the boy's shoulder, Cleek's eyes were on the lion's face. The huge brute was as meek and as undisturbed as before, and there was actual kindness in its fixed eyes. But of a sudden, when the child's head was on a level with those gaping jaws, the lips curled backward in a ghastly parody of a smile. A weird, uncanny sound whizzed through the bared teeth. The passive body bulked as with a shock, and Cleek had just time to snatch the boy back when the great jaws struck together with a snap that would have splintered a skull of iron had they closed upon it. The hideous and mysterious smile had come again, and brief though it was, its passing found the boy's sister lying on the ground in a dead faint, the boy's stepmother cowering back with covered eyes and shrill affrighted screams, and the boy's father leaning, shaken and white, against the empty case and nursing a bleeding hand. In an instant the whole place was in an uproar. It smiled again! It smiled again! Ran in broken gasps from lip to lip. But through it all, Cleek stood there, clutching the frightened child close to him, but not saying one word, not making one sound. Across the dark arena came a rush of running footsteps, and presently Signor Sperati came panting up, breathless and pale with excitement. "'What's the matter? What's wrong?' he cried. "'Is it the lion again? Is the boy killed? Speak up!' "'No,' said Cleek, very quietly. "'Nor will he be. The father will do the trick to-night, not the son. We've had a fright and a lesson, that's all.' And putting the sobbing child from him, he caught young Scarmelli's arm and hurried him away. "'Take me somewhere that we can talk in safety,' he said. "'We are on the threshold of the end, Scarmelli, and I want your help.' "'Oh, Mr. Cleek, 
Have you any idea, any clue? Yes, more than a clue. I know how, but I have not yet discovered why. Now, if you know, tell me, what did the Chevalier mean? What did his wife mean when they spoke of a dream that might have come true but didn't? Do you know? Have you any idea? Or, if you have not, do you think your fiancé has? Why, yes, he made reply. Zelie has told me about it often. It is of a fortune that was promised and never materialised. Oh, such a long time ago, when he was quite a young man, the Chevalier saved the life of a very great man, a Prussian nobleman of great wealth. He was profuse in his thanks and his promises, that nobleman, swore that he would make him independent for life, and all that sort of thing. And didn't? No, he didn't. After a dozen letters promising the Chevalier things that almost turned his head, the man dropped him entirely. In the midst of his dreams of wealth, a letter came from the old skinflint steward, enclosing him the sum of six hundred marks, and telling him that as his master had come to the conclusion that wealth would be more of a curse than a blessing to a man of his class and station, he had thought better of his rash promise. He begged to tender the enclosed as a proper and sufficient reward for the service rendered, and should not trouble the young man any further. Of course the Chevalier didn't reply, who would, after having been promised wealth, education, everything one had confessed that one most desired. Being young, high-spirited, and bitterly, bitterly disappointed, the Chevalier bundled the six hundred marks back without a single word, and that was the last he ever heard of the Baron von Steinheit from that day to this. "'The Baron von Steinheit!' repeated Cleek, pulling himself up as though he had trodden upon something. "'Do you mean to say that the man whose life he saved... Scarmelli, tell me something. Does it happen by any chance that the Chevalier de Roma's real name is Peter Janssen Pullen?' "'Yes,' said Scarmelli in reply. "'That is his name. Why?' "'Nothing but that it solves the riddle.' and the lion has smiled for the last time. No, don't ask me any questions. There isn't time to explain. Get me as quickly as you can to the place where we left Mr. Narkom's motor. Will this way lead me out? Thanks. Get back to the others and look for me again in two hours' time. And Scarmelli. Yes, sir? One last word. Don't let that boy get out of your sight for one instant and don't, no matter at what cost, let the Chevalier do his turn to-night before I get back. Good-bye for a time. I'm off. Then he moved like a fleetly passing shadow round the angle of the building, and two minutes later he was with Narkom in the red limousine. "'To the German embassy as fast as we can fly,' he said, as he scrambled in. "'I've something to tell you about that lion's smile, Mr. Narkom.' and I'll tell you it while we're on the wing. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces by Thomas W. Hanshu Chapter 18 it was nine o'clock and after. The great show at Olympia was at its height. The packed house was roaring with delight over the daring equestrianship of Mademoiselle Marie de Zanoni, and the sound of the cheers rolled in to the huge dressing tent where the artists awaited their several turns, and the chevalier, in spangled trunks and tights, all ready for his call, sat hugging his child and shivering like a man with the ague. "'Come, come, buck up, man, and don't funk it like this,' said Signor Sperati, who had graciously consented to assist him with his dressing because of the injury to his hand. 
the idea of you losing your nerve, you of all men, and because of a little affair like that, you know very well that Nero is as safe as a kitten to-night, that he never has two smiling turns in the same week, much less the same day. You're at the next on the programme. Buck up and go at it like a man. I can't, Seigneur, I can't, almost wailed the Chevalier. My nerve is gone. Never, if I live to be a thousand, shall I forget that awful moment, that appalling smile. I tell you, there is wizardry in the thing. The beast is bewitched. My work in the arena is done, done for ever, Seigneur. I shall never have courage to look into the beast's jaws again. Rot! You're not going to ruin the show, are you, and after all the money I've put into it? If you have no care for yourself, it's your duty to think about me. You can at least try. I tell you, you must try. Here. Take a sip of brandy and see if that won't put a bit of courage into you. Hello! As a burst of applause and the thud of a horse's hoofs down the passage to the stables came rolling in. There's your wife's turn over at last. And there, listen, the ringmaster is announcing yours. Get up, man, get up and go out. I can't, senor. I can't, I can't. "'But I tell you, you must.' And just here an interruption came. "'Bad advice, my dear captain,' said a voice, Cleek's voice, from the other end of the tent. And with a twist and a snarl, the seigneur screwed round on his heel, in time to see that other intruders were putting in an appearance, as well as this unwelcome one. "'Who oh, the deuce asked you for your opinion?' rapped out the seigneur savagely. "'And what are you doing in here, anyhow? "'If we want the service of a vet, we're quite capable of getting one for ourselves, "'without having him shove his presence upon us unasked.' "'You are quite capable of doing a great many things, my dear captain, "'even making lions smile,' said Cleek serenely. It would appear that the gallant Captain von Gossler, nephew and, in the absence of one who has a better claim, heir to the late Baron von Steinheit. That's it. Nab the beggar. Played, sir, played. Hustle him out and into the cab with his precious confederate, the Irish-Italian Signor, and make a clean sweep of the pair of them. "'You'll find it a neck-stretching game, Captain, I'm afraid, "'when the jury comes to hear of that poor boy's death "'and your beastly part in it.' "'By this time the tent was in an uproar, "'for the Chevalier's wife had come hurrying in, "'the Chevalier's daughter was on the verge of hysterics, "'and the Chevalier's prospective son-in-law "'was alternately hugging the great beast-tamer, and then shaking his hand and generally deporting himself like a respectable young man who had suddenly gone daft. Governor, he cried, half laughing, half sobbing. Bully old governor, it's over, it's over. Never any more danger, never any more hard times, never any more lion smiles. No, never, said Cleek. Come here, Madame Poulain, and hear the good news with the rest. You married for love, and you've proved a brick. The dreams come true, and the life of ease and of luxury is yours at last, Mr. Pullain. But, sir, I, I do not understand, stammered the chevalier. What has happened? Why have you arrested the Signor Sperati? What has he done? I cannot comprehend. Can't you? Well, it so happened, Chevalier, that the Baron von Steinheit died something like two months ago, leaving the sum of sixty thousand pounds sterling to one Peter Janssen Poulain and the heirs of his body, and that a certain Captain von Gossler, 
son of the baron's only sister, meant to make sure that there was no Peter Janssen Poulen, and no heirs of his body to inherit one farthing of it. Sir, dear God, can this be true? Perfectly true, Chevalier. The late Baron's solicitors have been advertising for some time for news regarding the whereabouts of Peter Janssen Poulen, and if you had not so successfully hidden your real name under that of your professional one, no doubt some of your colleagues would have put you in the way of finding it out long ago. The Baron did not go back on his word, and did not act ungratefully. His will, dated twenty-nine years ago, was never altered in a single particular. I rather suspect that that letter and that gift of money which came to you in the name of his steward, and was supposed to close the affair entirely, was the work of his nephew, the gentleman whose exit has just been made. A crafty individual, that Chevalier, and he laid his plans cleverly and well. Who would be likely to connect him with the death of a beast-tamer in a circus, who had perished in what would appear an accident of his calling? Ah, yes, the lion's smile was a clever idea. He was a sharp rascal to think of it. Sir, you, you do not mean to tell me that he caused that? He never went near the beast, never, even once. Not necessary, Chevalier. He kept near you and your children. That was all that he needed to do to carry out his plan. The lion was as much his victim as anybody else, you or your children. What it did, it could not help doing. The very simplicity of the plan was its passport to success. All that was required was the unsuspected sifting of snuff on the hair of the person whose head was to be put in the beast's mouth. The lion's smile was not, properly speaking, a smile at all, Chevalier. It was the torture which came of snuff getting into its nostrils, and when the beast made that uncanny noise and snapped its jaws together, it was simply the outcome of a sneeze. The thing would be farcical if it were not that tragedy hangs on the thread of it, and that a life, a useful human life, was destroyed by means of it. Yes, it was clever, it was diabolically clever. But you know what Bobby Burns says about the best-laid schemes of mice and men? There's always a power, higher up, that works the ruin of them. With that he walked by, and, going to young Scarmelli, put out his hand. "'You're a good chap, and you've got a good girl, so I expect you will be happy,' he said, and then lowered his voice so that the rest might not reach the chevalier's ears. "'You were wrong to suspect the little stepmother,' he added. "'She's true blue, Scarmelli.' She was only playing up to those fellows because she was afraid the seigneur would drop out and close the show if she didn't, and that she and her husband and the children would be thrown out of work. She loves her husband, that's certain, and she's a good little woman. And Scarmelli? Yes, Mr. Cleek? There's nothing better than a good woman on this earth, my lad. Always remember that. I think you, too, have found one. I hope you have. I hope you'll be happy. What's that? Oh, me! Not a rat, my boy! Or, if you feel that you must give me something, give me your prayers for equal luck, and send me a slice of the wedding cake. Good night. And twisted round on his heel, and walked out, making his way out to the streets, and facing the journey to Clarges Street afoot. For to be absolutely without envy of any sort is not given to anything born of woman, and the sight of this man's happiness, the knowledge of this man's reward, brought upon him a bitter recollection of how far he still was from his own. 
Would he ever get that reward, he wondered? Would he ever be nearer to it than he was to-night? It hurt, yes. It hurt horribly sometimes, this stone-cold silence, this walking always in shadowed paths without a ray of light, without the certainty of arriving anywhere, though he plod onward for a lifetime and the old feeling of savage resentment, the old sense of self-pity, the surest thing on God's earth to blaze a trail for the oncoming of the worst that is in a man, bit at the soul of him, and touched him on the raw again. He knew what that boded, and he also knew the antidote. "'Dollops, they broke into our holiday. They did us out of a part of it, didn't they, old chap?' he said, when he reached home at last, and found the boy anxiously awaiting him. "'Well, we'll have a day for every hour they deprived us of. A whole day, bonny boy. Pack up again, and we'll be off to the land as God made it, and where God's things still live. And we'll have a fortnight of it, a whole blessed fortnight, my boy, with the river and the fields and the flowers.' and the dreams that hide in trees. Dollops made no reply. He simply bolted for the kit-bag and began to pack at once. And the morrow, when it came, found these two, the servant who was still a boy, and the master who had discovered the way back to boyhood's secrets, forging up the shining river and seeking the land of nightingales again. End of chapter 18、chapter 19 of Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. Cleek, the Man of the Forty Faces by Thomas W. Hanshu. Chapter 19 the spring had blossomed itself out, and the summer had bloomed itself in. The holiday up the river was a thing of the past. The dreams of the dreamer had given place to those sterner phases of life which must be coped with by the realist, and Cleek was back in harness again. A half-dozen more or less important cases had occupied his time since his return— but although he had carried these to a successful issue and had again been lauded to the skies by the daily papers, the one word of praise from the one quarter whence he so earnestly desired to hear was never forthcoming. Of Ailsa Lorne he had heard not a solitary thing, either directly or indirectly, since that day when he had put her into the taxicab at Charing Cross Station and saw her safely on her way to Hampstead before he went his own. True, her silence was, as he had agreed, an admission that all was well with her, and that she had secured the position in question. True it was also that it was not for her to take the initiative and break that silence. That he fully realised how impossible, for a girl born and bred as she had been, to voluntarily open up a correspondence with a man who was, as yet, little more than a mere acquaintance. But, all the same, he chafed under that silence, and spent many a wakeful hour at night brooding on it. In his heart he knew that if any advance was to be made, that advance was the man's duty, not the woman's but the fear that she would think he was thrusting himself upon her, the dread that even yet the white soul of her could not but shrink from a closer association with him, kept him from taking one step towards breaking the silence he deplored. The French have a proverb which says, It is always the unexpected that happens. And it was the unexpected that happened in this case. In the midst of his dejection, in the very depths of returning despair, there came to him this note from Mr. Narkom. "'My dear Cleek, kindly refrain from going out this evening. 
I shall call about nine o'clock, bringing with me Miss Ailsa Lorne, whom you doubtless remember, and her present patron, Angela, Countess Chepstow, the young widow of that ripping old war-horse, who, as you may recall, quelled that dangerous and fanatical rising of the Singalese at Trincomalee. These ladies wish to see you with reference to a most extraordinary case, an inexplicable mystery, which both they and I believe no man but yourself can satisfactorily probe. Yours in haste, Maverick Narkom. So, then, he was to see her again, to touch her hand, hear her voice, look into the eyes that had lighted him back from the path to destruction. Cleek's heart began to hammer and his pulses to drum. Needless to say, he took extraordinary care with his toilet that evening, with the result that when the ladies arrived there was nothing even vaguely suggestive of the detective about him. "'Oh, Mr. Cleek, do help us, please do,' implored Elsa, after the first greetings were over. "'Lady Chepstow is almost beside herself with dread and anxiety over the inexplicable thing, and I have persuaded her that if anybody on earth can solve the mystery of it, avert the new and appalling danger of it, it is you. Oh, say that you will take the case, say that you will save little Lord Chepstow, and put an end to this maddening mystery. Little Lord Chepstow, repeated Cleek, glancing over at the Countess, who stood a very Niobe in her grief and despair, holding out two imploring hands in silent supplication. "'That is your ladyship's son, is it not?' "'Yes,' she answered, with a sort of wail. "'My only son, my only child, all that I have to love, all that I have to live for in this world.' "'And you think the little fellow is in peril?' Yes, in deadly peril. From what source? From whose hand? I don't know, I don't know, she answered distractedly. Sometimes I am wild enough to suspect even Captain Hawksley, unjust and unkind as it seems. Captain Hawksley, who is he? My late husband's cousin heir after my little son to the title and estates. He is very poor, deeply in debt, and the inheritance would put an end to all his difficulties. But he is fond of my son. They seem almost to worship each other. I, too, am fond of him. But for all that I have to remember that he, and he alone, would benefit by Cedric's death. And, and, wicked as it seems, Oh, Mr. Cleek, help me, direct me. Sometimes I doubt him. Sometimes I doubt everybody. Sometimes I think of those other days, that other mystery, that land which reeks of them. And then, and then, oh, that horrible Ceylon. I wish I had never set foot in it in all my life. Her agitation and distress were so great as to make her utterances only half coherent, and Ailsa, realising that this sort of thing must only perplex Cleek and leave him in the dark regarding the matter upon which they had come to consult him, gently interposed. "'Do try to calm yourself, and to tell the story as briefly as possible, dear Lady Chepstow,' she advised. Then taking the initiative, added quietly, "'It begins, Mr. Cleek, at a period when his little lordship, whose governess I have the honour to be, was but two years old, and at Trincomalee, where his late father was stationed with his regiment, four years ago. Somebody, for some absurd reason, had set afoot a ridiculous rumour that the English had received orders from the throne to stamp out every religion but their own. In short, if the British were not exterminated, dreadful desecrations would occur, as they were determined— To loot all the temples erected to Buddha, 
destroy the images, and make a bonfire of all the sacred relics,' finished Cleek himself. "'I rarely forget history, Miss Lorne, especially when it is such recent history as that memorable Buddhist rising at Trincomalee. It began upon an utterly unfounded ridiculous rumour. It terminated, if my memory serves me correctly, in something akin to the very thing it was supposed to avert. That is to say, during the outburst of fanaticism, that most sacred of all relics, the holy tooth of Buddha, disappeared mysteriously from the temple of Dambool, and in spite of the fact that many lakhs of rupees were offered for its recovery, it has never, I believe, been found, or even traced, to this day, although a huge fortune awaits the restorer, and, with it, overpowering honours from the native princes. Those must have been trying times, Lady Chepstow, for the Commandant's wife, the mother of the Commandant's only child. Horrible! horrible she answered with a shudder forgetting for an instant the dangers of the present in the recollection of the tragical past for a period our lives were not safe murder hid behind every bush skulked in the shadow of every rock and tree and we knew not at what minute the little garrison might be rushed under cover of the darkness and every soul slaughtered before the relief force could come to our assistance I died a hundred deaths in a day in my anxiety for husband and child, and once the very zealousness of our comrades almost brought about the horror I feared. Oh! With a shudder of horrified recollection and a covering of the eyes, as if to shut out the memory of it. Oh, that night! That horrible night! Unknown to any of us, my baby, rising from the bed where i had left him sleeping whilst i went outside to stand by lord chepstow wandered beyond the line of defence and before anybody realised it was out in the open alone and unprotected ferrell the cook saw him first saw too the crouching figure of a native armed with a gun in the shadow of the undergrowth without hesitation the brave fellow rushed out fell upon the native before he could dart away, wrenched the gun from him, and brained him with the butt. A cry of the utmost horror rang out upon the air, and uttering it, another native bounded out from a hiding-place close to where the first had been killed, and flew zigzagging across the open where Cedric was. Evidently he had no intention of molesting the little fellow, for he fled straight on past him, still shrieking after the accident occurred, but to Ferralt it seemed as if his intention were to murder the boy, and, clapping the gun to his shoulder, in a panic of excitement he fired. If it had been one of the soldiers, someone, anyone, who understood marksmanship, and was not likely to be in a nervous quake over the circumstances, the thing could not have happened although the fugitive was careering along in a direct line with my precious little one. But with Ferald, oh, Mr. Cleek, can you imagine my horror, when I saw the flash of that shot, heard a shrill cry of pain, and saw my child drop to the ground? Good heaven! exclaimed Cleek, agitated in spite of himself. Then the blunderer shot the child instead of the native? Yes, and was so horrified by the mishap that, without waiting to learn the result, he rushed blindly to the brink of a deep ravine and threw himself headlong to death. But the injury to Cedric was only a trifling one after all. The bullet seemed merely to have grazed him in passing, and beyond a ragged gash in the fleshy part of the thigh, he was not harmed at all. That I myself dressed and bandaged, and in a couple of weeks it was quite healed. But it taught me a lesson that night of horror, and I never let my baby out of my sight for one instant from that time until the rising was entirely quelled. As suddenly as it had started, the trouble subsided. 
native priests came under a flag of truce to Lord Chepster, and confessed their error, acknowledged that they had never any right to suspect the British of any design upon their gods, for the loot of the temple had actually taken place in the midst of the rising, and they knew that it could not have come from the hands of the soldiers, for they had had them under surveillance all the time, and not one person of the race had ventured within a mile of the temple. Yet the tooth of Buddha had been taken, the sacred tooth which is more holy to Buddhists than the statue of Gautama Buddha itself. Their remorse was very real, and after that, to the day of his death from fever, eighteen months afterward, they could never show enough honour to Lord Chepstow. And even then their favour continued. They transferred to the little son the homage they had done the father, but in a far, far greater degree. If he had been a king's son, they could have shown him no greater honour. Native princes showered him with rich gifts. If he walked out, his path was strewn with flowers by bowing maidens. If he went into the market-place, the people prostrated themselves before him. When I questioned Buddhist women of this amazing homage to Cedric, they gave me a full explanation. My son was sacred, they said. Buddha had withdrawn his favour from his people because of the evil they had done in suspecting the father and of the innocent life, Ferrots, which had been sacrificed, and they had been commanded of the priests to do homage to the child and thereby appease the offended god who doubtless had himself spirited away the holy tooth, and would not restore it until full recompense was made to the sacred son of the sacred dead. When it became known that I had decided to return to England with my boy, native princes offered me fabulous sums to remain, and when they found that I could not be tempted to stay, the populace turned out in every town and village through which we passed on our way to the ship, and bowing multitudes followed us to the very last. Nor did it cease with that, for in all the years that have followed, even here in London, the homage and worship have continued. My son can go nowhere but that he is followed by Singalese, can see no man or woman of the race, but he or she prostrates herself before him, and murmurs, Holy, most holy. And daily, almost hourly, rich gifts are showered upon him from unknown hands, and he is watched over and guarded constantly. I tell you all this, Mr. Cleek, that you may the better understand how appalling is the horror which now assails us, how frightful is the knowledge that someone now seeks his life and is using every means to take it. In other words, my dear Cleek, put in Narkom, as her ladyship, overcome with emotion, broke down suddenly, there appears to be a sudden and inexplicable change of front on the part of these fanatics, and they now seem as anxious to bring evil to his little lordship as they formerly were to protect and cherish him. At any rate, someone of their order has, upon three separate occasions within the last month, endeavoured to kidnap him, and in one instance even attempted to murder him. "'Is that a fact?' queried Cleek sharply, glancing over at Miss Lorne. "'You are certain it is not a fancy, but an absolute fact?' "'Yes,' "'Oh, yes!' she made answer agitatedly. "'Twice, when I have gone into the park with him, "'attempts have been made to separate us, "'to get him away from me. "'And once they did get him away, "'so swiftly, so adroitly, "'that he had vanished before I could turn round. "'But although a bag had been thrown over his head "'to stifle his cries, "'he managed to make a very little one. "'I plunged, screaming, into the undergrowth "'from which that cry had come.' and was just in time to save him. He was lying on the ground all bundled up in a bag, and his assailant, who must have heard me coming, had gone as if by magic. 
His little lordship, however, was able to tell me that the man was a Singalese, and that he had tried to cut him with a knife. Cut him with a knife? repeated Cleek in a reflective tone, and blew out a long, low whistle. Oh, but that is not the worst, Mr. Cleek, went on Ailsa. Three days ago a woman, a very beautiful and distinguished-looking woman, called to see Lady Chepstow regarding the reference of a former servant, one Jane Catherboys, who used to be her ladyship's maid. After the caller left, a box of sugared violets was found lying temptingly open on a table in the main hall. Little Cedric is passionately fond of sugared violets, and had he happened to pass that way before the box was discovered, he surely would have yielded to the temptation and eaten some. In removing the box, the parlour-maid accidentally upset it, and before she could gather all the violets up, her ladyship's little Pomeranian dog snapped up one and ate it. It was dead in six minutes' time. The sweets were simply loaded with prussic acid. When we came to inquire into the matter in the hope of tracing the mysterious caller, we found that Jane Catherboys was no longer in need of a position, that she had been married for eight months, that she knew nothing whatever of the woman, and had sent no one to inquire into her references. "'All of which shows, my dear Cleek,' put in Narkom significantly, "'that whatever hand is directing these attempts, it belongs to one who knows more than a mere outsider possibly could.' in short, to one who is aware of his little lordship's excessive fondness for sugared violets, and is aware that Lady Chepstow once did have a maid named Jane Catherboys. "'If,' said Cleek, "'you mean to suggest by that that this points suspiciously in Captain Hawksley's direction, Mr. Narkom, permit me to say that it does not necessarily follow.' The clever people of the underworld do nothing by halves, nor without careful inquiry beforehand. That is what makes the difference between the common pickpocket and the brilliant swindler. He turned to Ailsa. Is that all, Miss Lorne, or am I right in supposing that there is even worse to come? Oh, much worse, much, Mr. Cleek. The knowledge that these would-be murderers, whoever they are, whatever may be their mysterious motive, have grown desperate enough to invade the house itself, has driven Lady Chepstow well nigh frantic. Of course, orders were immediately given to the servants that no stranger, no matter how well-dressed, how well-seeming, nor what the plea, was from that moment to be allowed past the threshold. We felt secure in that, knowing that no servant of the household would betray his or her trust, and that all would be on the constant watch for any further attempt. The unknown enemy must have found out about these precautions, for no stranger came again to the door. But last night a thing we had never counted upon happened. In the dead of the night the unknown broke into the house, into the very nursery itself, and but that Lady Chepstow, impelled she does not know by what, only that she was nervous and wakeful, and felt the need of some companionship, rose and carried the sleeping child into her own bed, he would assuredly have been murdered. The nurse, awakened by a horrible suffocating sensation, opened her eyes to find a man bending over her with a chloroform-soaked cloth, which he was about to lay over her face. She shrieked and fainted, but not before she saw the man spring to the little bed on the other side of her own, hack furiously at it with a long, murderous knife, then dart to the window and vanish. In the darkness he had not, of course, been able to see that that little bed was empty, for its position kept it in deep shadow, and hearing the household stir at the sound of the nurse's shriek, he struck out blindly and flew to save himself from detection. The nurse states that he was undoubtedly a foreigner, a dark-skinned Asiatic, 
and her description of him tallies with that his little lordship gave of the man who attempted to kill him that day in the park. There, Mr. Cleek, she concluded, that's the whole story. Can't you do something to help us? Something to lift this constant state of dread, and to remove this terrible danger from little Lord Chepstow's life? I'll try, Miss Lorne, but it is a most extraordinary case. Where is the boy now? At home, closely guarded. We appealed to Mr. Narkom, and he generously appointed two detective officers to sit with his little lordship and keep constant watch over him whilst we are away. And in the meantime, added Mr. Narkom, I've issued orders for a general rounding up of all the Singalese who can be traced or are known to be in town. Petrie and Hammond have that part of the job in hand, and if they hit upon any Asiatic who answers to the description of this murderous rascal— I don't believe they will, interposed Cleek. Or, if they do, I don't for a moment believe he will turn out to be the guilty party. In other words, I have an idea that the fellow will prove to be a European. But, my dear fellow, both his little lordship and the nurse saw the man, and, as you have heard, they both agree that he was dark-skinned and quite oriental in appearance. One of the easiest possible disguises, Mr. Narkom. A wig, a stick of grease paint, a threepenny twist of crape hair, and there you are. No, I do not believe that the man is a Singalese at all, and far from his having any connection with what you were pleased to term just now a change of front on the part of the Buddhists, who have so long held the little chap as something sacred, I don't believe that they know anything about him. I base that upon the fact that the child is still treated with homage whenever he goes out, according to what Miss Lorne says, and that, with the single exception of that one woman who tried to poison him, nobody but just one man, this particular one man, has ever made any attempt to harm the boy. Fanatics, like those Singalese, cleave to an idea to the end, Mr. Narkom. They don't cast it aside and go off at another tangent. You have heard what Lady Chepstow says the native women told her. The boy was sacred. Their priests had commanded them to appease Buddha by doing homage to him until the tooth was found, and the tooth has not been found up to the present day. That means that nothing on earth could change their attitude toward him that not one of the Buddhist sect would harm a solitary hair of his head for a king's ransom. So you may eliminate the Singalese from the case entirely, so far as the attempts upon the child's life are concerned. Whoever is making the attempts is doing so without their knowledge, and for a purely personal reason. Then, in that case, this Captain Hawksley— I'll have a look at that gentleman before I tumble into bed tonight, and you shall have my views upon that point tomorrow morning, Mr. Narkom. Frankly, things point rather suspiciously in the captain's direction, since he is apparently the only person likely to be benefited by the boy's death. And if a motive cannot be traced to some other person— He stopped abruptly and held up his hand. Outside, in the dim halls of the house, a sudden noise had sprung into being, the noise of someone running upstairs in great haste, and stepping quickly to the door, Cleek drew it sharply open. As he did so, Dollops came puffing up out of the lower gloom, a sheep's trotter in one hand and a letter in the other. "'Lo, Governor!' groaned he from midway on the staircase. "'I don't believe as I'm ever going to be let get a square tuck in this side of the burying ground. "'Just finished what was left of that there steak and kidney pudding, sir, "'and started on me second trotter, when I sees a pair of legs "'nip past the area railings to the front door, "'and then nip off again like greased lightning. "'And when I ups and does a flying leap up the kitchen stairs, 
there was this here envelope in the letter box, and them there blessed legs no ways in sight. I say, sir, agitatedly, look what's wrote on the envelope, will you? And us always keeping of it so dark. Cleek plucked the letter from his extended hand, glanced at it, and puckered up his lips. Then, with a gesture, he sent Dollops back below stairs, and, returning to the room, closed the door behind him. "'The enemy evidently knows all Lady Chepstow's movements, Mr. Narkom,' he said. "'I expect she and Miss Lorne have been under surveillance all day and have been followed here. Look at that!' He flung the letter down on a table as he spoke, and Narkom, glancing at it, saw printed in rude, illiterate letters upon the envelope the one word, Cleek. The identity of Captain Burbage was known to someone, and the secret of the house in Clarges Street was a secret no longer. Purposely disguised, you see. No one, not even a little child, would make such a botch of copying the alphabet as that. Cleek said, as he took the letter up and opened it. The sheet it contained was lettered in the same uncouth manner, and bore these words. Cleek, take a fool's advice, and don't accept the Chepstow case. Be warned. If you interfere, somebody you care about will pay the price. You'll find it more satisfactory to buy a wedding bouquet than a funeral wreath. Oh! oh! shuddered the two ladies in one breath. How horrible! How cowardly! And then, feeling that her last hope had gone, Lady Chepstow broke into a fit of violent weeping and laid her head on Elsa's shoulder. Oh, my baby! "'My darling baby boy!' she sobbed. "'And now they're threatening somebody that you too love. "'Of course, Mr. Cleek, I can't expect you to risk the sacrifice of your own dear ones "'for the sake of me and mine. "'And so, and so. "'Oh, take me away, Miss Lord. "'Let me go back to my baby and have him while I may.' "'Good night, Mr. Cleek.' said Ailsa, stretching out a shaking hand to him. Thank you so much for, for what you would have done but for this. And you were our last hope, too. Why give it up, then, Miss Lorne? he said, holding her hand and looking into her eyes. Why not go on letting me be your last hope, your only hope? Yes, but they, they spoke of a funeral wreath. "'And they also spoke of a wedding bouquet. "'I am going to take the case, Miss Lorne. "'Take it and solve it as I'm a living man.' "'Thank you.' "'As her brimming eyes uplifted in deep thankfulness "'and her shaking hand returned the pressure of his. "'Now, just give me five minutes' time in the next room. "'It's my laboratory, Lady Chepstow.' and I'll tell you whether I shall begin with Captain Hawksley or eliminate him from the case entirely. You might go in ahead, Mr. Narkom, and get the acid bath and the powder ready for me. We'll see what the fingerprints of our gentle correspondent have to tell, and if they are not in the records of Scotland Yard or down in my own private little book, we'll get a sample of Captain Hawksley's in the morning. Then, excusing himself to the ladies, he passed into the inner room in company with Narkom, and carried the letter with him. When he returned, it was still in his hand, but there were greyish smudges all over it. "'There's not a fingerprint in the lot that is worth anything as a means of identification, Miss Lorne,' he said. "'But you and Lady Chepstow may accept my assurance "'that Captain Hawksley is not the man. "'The writer of this letter belongs to the criminal classes. "'He is on his guard against the danger of fingerprints, "'and he wore rubber gloves when he penned this message. "'When I find him, 
"'Rest assured I shall find a man who has had dealings with the police before, "'and whose fingerprints are on their records. "'I don't know what his game is, nor what he's after, yet, "'but I will inside of a week. "'I've an idea, but it's so wild a thing "'I'm almost afraid to trust myself to believe it possible "'until I stumble over something that points the same way.' "'Now, go home with Lady Chepstow, and begin the work of helping me.' "'Helping you? Oh, Mr. Cleek, can we? Is there anything we can do to help?' "'Yes. When you leave the house, act as though you are in the utmost state of dejection, and keep that up indefinitely. Make it appear, for I am certain you will be followed and spied upon, as if I had declined the case. But don't have any fear about the boy. The two constables will sleep in the room with him tonight, and every night, until the thing is cleared up and the danger past. Tomorrow, about dusk, however, you personally take him for a walk near the park, and if, among the other Singalese you may meet, you should see one dressed as an Englishman, and wearing a scarlet flower in his buttonhole. Take no notice of how often you see him, nor of what he may do. It will be you, Mr. Cleek? Yes. Now go, please, and don't forget to act as if you and her ladyship were utterly broken-hearted. Also, his voice dropped lower, his hand met her hand, and in the darkness of the hall, a little silver-plated revolver was slipped into her palm. Also, take this. Keep it always with you. Never be without it night or day. And if any living creature offers you violence, shoot him down as you would a mad dog. Good night, and remember. And long after she and Lady Chepstow had gone down and passed out into the night, he stood there, looking the situation straight in the face, and thinking his own troubled thoughts. A wedding bouquet. A threat against her and the mention of a wedding bouquet, he said, as he went back into the room and sat down to figure the puzzle out. Only one creature in the world knows of my feelings in that direction, and only one creature in the world would be capable of that threat. Margot! But what interest could she or any of her tribe have in the death of Lady Chepstow's little son? Her game is always money. If she were after a ransom, she would try to abduct the child, not to kill him, and if a sudden thought came and wrenched away his voice, he sat a moment twisting his fingers one through the other and frowning at the floor. Then, of a sudden, he gave a cry and jumped to his feet. Five lakhs of rupees! A fortune! By George, I've got it! He fairly shouted. The wild guess was a correct one. I'll stake my life. Let's put it to the test. End of chapter 19